cast of characters of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org cast of characters narrated by k hand oliver twist read by rachel agnes read by newgate novelist surgeon read by joseph tabler mrs thingamy read by caitlin mrs mann read by miss bocradera mr bumble read by ed humple mr limpkins read by dylan mcfarlane gentleman in a white waistcoat read by algie pug another gentleman played by doug fajardo master of the workhouse read by david purdy mr ganfield read by mike justice magistrate one read by michael c johnson magistrate two read by david purdy sowerberry read by brad philippone mrs sowerberry read by afnea noah claypole read by aaron m lebowitz charlotte read by maggie travers old man read by algie pug old woman read by newgate novelist pauper read by mike justice dick read by asher gravy the artful dodger read by esteban Samanades. tom chitling read by mike harris fagan read by adam charlie bates read by christine g mr brownlow Read by John Burlinson. Citizen 1. Read by Zames Curran. Citizen 2. Read by Lian Yao. Citizen 3. Read by David Purdy. Officer 1. Read by Anton. Officer number 2. Played by Doug Fajardo. Mr. Fang. Read by Peter Yearsley. Clark. Read by Mike Harris. The bookstall keeper read by paul huxley mrs bedwin read by michelle eaton dr losburn read by peter yearsley bill sykes read by algy pug bet read by daniel sean nancy read by del de Pignoles. criminal read by david purdy servant girl read by daniel sean Mr. Grimwig, read by Rob Board. Barney, read by Thomas Peter. Woman 1, read by Lydia. Woman 2, read by Newgate Novelist. A Looker On, read by Charlotte Duckett. Carpenter, read by David Purdy. Cart Driver, read by David Purdy. Public House Owner, read by Beth Thomas. Becky, read by by anna vince toby crackett read by paul huxley mrs corney later mrs bumble read by maria casper martha read by newgate novelist annie read by lydia apothecary's apprentice read by david purdy lively read by anton monks played by doug fajardo the tinker Read by Aaron Michael Lebowitz. Giles. Read by Brad Philippone. Bristles. Played by Jonas Houston. Cook. Read by Caitlin. Rose Maley. Read by Beth Thomas. Mrs. Maley. Read by Lisa Dittman. Constable. Read by David Purdy. Blethers. Read by Sonia. Duff read by thomas peter hunchback read by david purdy medical practitioner read by david purdy harry maley read by asher gravy the watchman read by zames curran lady read by anna vince joe read by david purdy the cook at the hotel read by burger chalet Housemaid 1, read by Charlotte Duckett. Housemaid 2, read by Twinkle. Housemaid 3, read by Rachel. 
Housemaid Four, read by Lydia. Jailer, read by Adrian Strowett. Countryman, read by Doug Fajardo. Peddler, read by Gabby. Guard, read by Ananda. Gamekeeper, read by David Purdy. Gentleman, read by Mike Justice. Coachman, read by Rachel. Office Keeper, read by Willie. Kegs, read by Mike Justice. End of cast of characters. Chapter One of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter One treats of the place Oliver was born, and of the circumstances attending his birth. Among other public buildings in a certain town, which for many reasons it will be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name, there is one anciently common to most towns, great or small, to wit, a workhouse. And in this workhouse was born, on a day and date which I need not trouble myself to repeat, inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader, in this stage of the business at all events, the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. For a long time after it was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear any name at all, in which case it is somewhat more than probable that these memoirs would never have appeared, or, if they had, that being comprised within a couple pages, they would have possessed the inestimable merit of being the most concise and faithful specimen of biography, extant in the literature of any age or country. Although I am not disposed to maintain that the being born in a workhouse is in itself the most fortunate and enviable circumstance that can possibly befall a human being, I do mean to say that in this particular instance it was the best thing for Oliver Twist that could by possibility have occurred. The fact is that there was considerable difficulty in inducing Oliver to take upon himself the office of respiration, a troublesome practice but one which custom has rendered necessary to our easy existence. And for some time he lay gasping on a little flock mattress, rather unequally poised between this world and the next, the balance being decidedly in the favor of the latter. Now if, during this brief period, Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses, and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman, who was rendered rather misty by an unwanted allowance of beer, and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract, Oliver and nature fought out the point between them. The result was that after a few struggles Oliver breathed, sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish, by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for a much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. As Oliver gave this first proof of the free and proper action of his lungs, the patchwork coverlet which was carelessly flung over the iron bedstead rustled, the pale face of a young woman was raised feebly from the pillow, and a faint voice imperfectly articulated the words, Let me see the child, and die. The surgeon had been sitting with his face turned towards the fire, giving the palms of his hands a warm and a rub alternately. As the young woman spoke, he rose, and advancing to the bed's head, said, with more kindness than might have been expected of him, Oh, you must not talk about dying yet. Lord bless her dear heart, no, interposed the nurse, hastily depositing in her pocket a green glass bottle, the contents of which she had been tasting in a corner with evident satisfaction. Lord bless her dear heart, when she has lived as long as I have, sir, and had thirteen children off her own, and all on him dead except two, and them in the workers with me. She'll know better than to take on in that way, bless her dear heart. Think what it is to be a mother, 
there's a dear lamb do apparently this consolatory perspective of a mother's prospects failed in producing its due effect the patient shook her head and stretched out her hand towards the child the surgeon deposited it in her arms she imprinted her cold white lips passionately on its forehead pressed her hands over her face gazed wildly round shuddered fell back and died they chafed her breast hands and temples but the blood had stopped forever they talked of hope and comfort they had been strangers too long it's all over mrs thingamy said the surgeon at last ah poor dear so it is said the nurse picking up the cork of the green bottle which had fallen out on the pillow as she stooped to take up the child poor oh, dear you needn't mind sending up to me if the child cries nurse said the surgeon putting on his gloves with great deliberation it's very likely it will be troublesome give it a little gruel if it is he put on his hat and pausing by the bedside on his way to the door added she was a good-looking girl too where did she come from she was brought here last night replied the old woman by the overseer's order she was found lying in the street she had walked some distance for her shoes were worn to pieces but where she came from or where she was going to nobody knows the surgeon leaned over the body and raised the left hand the old story he said shaking his head no wedding ring i see ah good night the medical gentleman walked away to dinner and the nurse having once more applied herself to the green bottle sat down on a low chair before the fire and proceeded to dress the infant what an excellent example of the power of dress young oliver twist was wrapped in the blanket which had hitherto formed his only covering he might have been the child of a nobleman or a beggar it would have been hard for the haughtiest stranger to have assigned him his proper station in society but now that he was enveloped in the old calico robes which had grown yellow in the same service he was badged and ticketed and fell into his place at once a parish child the orphan of a workhouse the humble half-starved drudge to be cuffed and buffeted through the world despised by all and pitied by none oliver cried lustily if he could have known that he was an orphan left to the tender mercies of church wardens and overseers perhaps he would have cried the louder end of chapter one chapter two of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 2 Treats of Oliver Twist's Growth, Education, and Board For the next eight or ten months, Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need. The workhouse authorities replied with humility that there was not. Upon this, the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that Oliver should be farmed, or, in other words, that he should be dispatched to a branch workhouse some three miles off, where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day, without the inconvenience of too much food or too much clothing, under the parental superintendence of an elderly female, who received the culprits at and for the consideration of sevenpence halfpenny per small head per week. Seven pence half pennies worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for seven pence half penny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. So she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use, and consigned the rising parochial generation to an even shorter allowance than was originally provided for them. 
thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating and who demonstrated it so well that he had got his own horse down to a straw a day and would unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal on nothing at all if he had not died four and twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care oliver twist was delivered over a similar result usually attended the operation of her system for at the very moment when the child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten either that it sickened from want and cold or fell into the fire from neglect or got half smothered by accident in any one of which cases the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world and there gathered to the fathers it had never known in this occasionally when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead or inadvertently scalded to death when there happened to be a washing though the latter accident was very scarce anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm the jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance but these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beetle the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside which was very probable indeed and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted which was very self-devotional besides the board made periodical pilgrimages to the farm and always sent the beetle the day before to say they were going the children were neat and clean to behold when they went and what more would the people have it cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop oliver twist's ninth birthday found him a pale thin child somewhat diminutive in stature and decidedly small in circumference but nature or inheritance had implanted a good sturdy spirit in oliver's breast it had had plenty of room to expand thanks to the spare diet of the establishment and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any ninth birthday at all be this as it may however it was his ninth birthday and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with a select party of two other young gentlemen who after participating with him in a sound thrashing had been locked up for atrociously presuming to be hungry when mrs mann the good lady of the house was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of mr bumble the beetle striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate goodness gracious is that you mr bumble sir said mrs mann thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy susan take oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash them directly my heart alive mr bumble how glad i am to see you surely now mr bumble was a fat man and a choleric so instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake and then bestowed upon it a kick which could have emanated from no leg but a beetle's lord only think said mrs mann running out for the three boys had been removed by this time only think of that that i should have forgotten the gate was bolted on the inside on account of them dear children walk in sir walk in pray mr bumble do sir although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsey that might have softened the heart of a churchwarden it by no means mollified the beetle do you think this respectful or proper conduct mrs mann inquired mr bumble grasping his cane to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate when they come here upon parochial business with the parochial orphans are you aware mrs mann that you are as i may say a parochial delegate and a stipendiary i'm sure mr bumble that i was only a tellin one or two of the dear children as is so fond of you that it was you a coming replied mrs mann with great humility mr bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance he had displayed the one and vindicated the other he relaxed well well mrs mann he replied in a calmer tone 
It may be as you say. It may be. Lead the way in, Mrs. Mann, for I come on business and have something to say. Mrs. Mann ushered the beetle into a small parlor with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beetles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. Now don't you be offended at what I'm a-going to say, observed Mrs. Mann with captivating sweetness. You've had a long walk, you know, or I wouldn't mention it. Now will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble? not a drop not a drop said mr bumble waving his right hand in a dignified but placid manner well, i think you will said mrs mann who had noticed the tone of the refusal and the gesture that had accompanied it just a little drop with a little cold water and a lump of sugar mr bumble coughed now just a little drop said mrs mann persuasively what is it inquired the beetle why it's what i'm obliged to keep a little of in the house to put into the blessed infants daffy when they ain't well mr bumble replied mrs mann as she opened a corner cupboard and took down a bottle and a glass it's gin i'll not deceive you mr b it's gin do you give the children daffy mrs mann inquired bumble following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing ah oh, bless them that i do dear as it is replied the nurse i couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes you know sir no said mr bumble approvingly no you could not you are a humane woman mrs mann here she set down the glass i shall take an early opportunity of mentioning it to the board mrs mann he drew it towards him you feel as a mother mrs mann he stirred the gin and water I, I drink to your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann. And he swallowed half of it. And now, about business, said the beetle, taking out a leathern pocket-book. The child that was half-baptized, Oliver Twist, is nine year old to-day. Bless him, interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with the corner of her apron. And notwithstanding an offered reward of ten pound, which was afterwards increased to twenty pound, notwithstanding the most superlative and, I may say, supernatural exertions on the part of this parish, said Bumble, we have never been able to discover who is his father, or what was his mother's settlement, name, or condition. Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added, after a moment's reflection, How comes he to have any name at all, then? The beetle drew himself up with great pride and said, I invented it. You, Mr. Bumble. I, Mrs. Mann, we name our fondlings in alphabetical order. The last was an S. Swubble, I named him. This was a T. Twist, I named him. The next one comes will be Unwin, and the next Vilkins. I have got names ready-made to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through it again, when we come to Z. Why, you're quite a literary character, sir, said Mrs. Mann. Well, well, said the beetle, evidently gratified with the compliment. Perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann. He finished the gin and water and added, Oliver being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back into the house. I have come out myself to take him there so let me see him at once i'll fetch him directly said mrs mann leaving the room for that purpose oliver having had by this time as much of the outer coat of dirt which encrusted his face and hands removed as could be scrubbed off in one washing was led into the room by his benevolent protectress make a bow to the gentleman oliver said mrs mann oliver made a bow which was divided between the beetle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table will you go along with me oliver said mr bumble in a majestic voice 
oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness when glancing upward he caught sight of mrs mann who had got behind the beetle's chair and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance he took the hint at once for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection will she go with me inquired poor oliver no she can't replied mr bumble but she'll come and see you sometimes this was no very great consolation to the child young as he was however he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away it was no very difficult matter for the boy to call tears into his eyes hunger and recent ill usage are great assistance if you want to cry and oliver cried very naturally indeed mrs mann gave him a thousand embraces and what oliver wanted a great deal more a piece of bread and butter lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse with a slice of bread in his hand and the little brown cloth parish cap on his head oliver was then led away by mr bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years and yet he burst into an agony of childish grief as the cottage gate closed after him wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind they were the only friends he had ever known and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time mr bumble walked on with long strides little oliver firmly grasping his gold-laced cuff trotted beside him inquiring at the end of every quarter of a mile whether they were nearly there to these interrogations mr bumble returned very brief and snappish replies for the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated and he was once again a beetle oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread when mr bumble who had handed him over to the care of an old woman returned and telling him it was a board night informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry he had no time to think about the matter however for mr bumble gave him a tap on the head with his cane to wake him up and another on the back to make him lively and bidding him to follow conducted him into a large whitewashed room where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table at the top of the table seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest was a particularly fat gentleman with a very round red face bow to the board said bumble oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes and seeing no board but the table fortunately bowed to that what's your name boy said the gentleman in the high chair oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen which made him tremble and the beetle gave him another tap behind which made him cry these two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease boy said the gentleman in the high chair listen to me you know you're an orphan i suppose what's that sir inquired poor oliver the boy is a fool i thought he was said the gentleman in the white waistcoat hush said the gentleman who had spoken first you know you've got no father or mother and that you're brought up by the parish don't you <laughs> yes sir replied oliver weeping bitterly what are you crying for inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat and to be sure it was very extraordinary what could the boy be crying for i hope you say your prayers every night said another gentleman in a gruff voice and pray for the people who feed you and take care of you like a christian y yes sir stammered the boy the gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right it would have been very like a christian and a marvellously good christian too if oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him but he hadn't because nobody had taught him well you have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair so you begin to pick oakum to-morrow morning at six o'clock added the surly one in the white waistcoat for the combination of both these blessings in the one simple process of picking oakum oliver bowed low by the direction of the beetle and was then hurried away to a large ward where on a rough hard bed he sobbed himself to sleep what novel illustration of the tender laws of england they let the paupers go to sleep poor oliver 
he little thought as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes but they had and this was it the members of this board were very sage deep philosophical men and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered the poor people liked it it was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes a tavern where there was nothing to pay a public breakfast dinner tea and supper all the year round a brick and mortar elysium where it was all play and no work oh ho said the board looking very knowing we are the fellows to set this to rights we'll stop it all in no time so they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative for they would compel nobody not them of being starved by a gradual process in the house or by a quick one out of it with this view they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal and issued three meals of thin gruel a day with an onion twice a week and half a roll of sundays they made a great many rather wise and humane regulations having reference to the ladies which it is not necessary to repeat kindly undertook to divorce poor married people in consequence of the great expense of a suit in doctor's commons and instead of compelling a man to support his family as they had theretofore done took his family away from him and made him a bachelor there is no saying how many applicants for relief under these last two heads might have started up in all classes of society if it had not been coupled with the workhouse but the board were long-headed men and had provided for this difficulty the relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel and that frightened people for the first six months after oliver twist was removed the system was in full operation it was rather expensive at first in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers which fluttered loosely on their wasted shrunken forms after a week or two's gruel but the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers and the board were in ecstasies the room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall with a copper at one end out of which the master dressed in an apron for the purpose and assisted by one or two women ladled the gruel at meal times of this festive composition each boy had one porringer and no more except on occasions of great public rejoicing when he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides the bowls never wanted washing the boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again and when they had performed this operation which never took very long the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls they would sit staring at the copper with such eager eyes as if they could have devoured the very bricks of which it was composed employing themselves meanwhile in sucking their fingers most assiduously with the view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon boys have generally excellent appetites oliver twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months at last they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing for his father had kept a small cook shop hinted darkly to his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age he had a wild hungry eye and they implicitly believed him a council was held lots were cast who should walk up to the master after supper that evening and ask for more and it fell to oliver twist the evening arrived the boys took their places the master in his cook's uniform stationed himself at the copper his pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him the gruel was served out and a long grace was said over the short commons the gruel disappeared the boys whispered each other and winked at oliver while his next neighbors nudged him child as he was he was desperate with hunger and reckless with misery he rose from the table and advancing to the master basin and spoon in hand said somewhat alarmed at his own temerity please sir i want some more the master was a fat healthy man but he turned very pale he gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds and then clung for support to the copper the assistants were paralyzed with wonder the boys with fear what said the master at length in a faint voice please sir replied oliver i, I want some more 
the master aimed a blow at oliver's head with the ladle pinioned him in his arm and shrieked aloud for the beetle the board were sitting in solemn conclave when mr bumble rushed into the room in great excitement and addressing the gentleman in the high chair said mr limkins i beg your pardon sir oliver twist has asked for more there was a general start horror was depicted on every countenance for more said mr limkins compose yourself bumble and answer me distinctly do i understand that he asked for more after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary he did sir replied bumble that boy will be hung said the gentleman in the white waistcoat i know that boy will be hung nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion an animated discussion took place oliver was ordered into instant confinement and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take oliver twist off the hands of the parish in other words five pounds and oliver twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade business or calling i never was more convinced of anything in my life said the gentleman in the white waistcoat as he knocked at the gate and read the bill the next morning i never was more convinced of anything in my life than i am that that boy will come to be hung as i purpose to show in the sequel whether the white waistcoated gentleman was right or not i should perhaps mar the interest of this narrative supposing it to possess any at all if i ventured to hint just yet whether the life of oliver twist had this violent termination or no End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Oliver Twist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 3 Relates how Oliver Twist was very near getting a place which would not have been a sinecure for a week after the commission of the impious and profane offence of asking for more oliver remained a close prisoner in the dark and solitary room to which he had been consigned by the wisdom and mercy of the board it appears at first sight not unreasonable to suppose that if he had entertained a becoming feeling of respect for the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat he would have established that sage individual's prophetic character once and forever by tying one end of his pocket handkerchief to a hook in the wall and attaching himself to the other to the performance of this feat however there was one obstacle namely that pocket handkerchiefs being decided articles of luxury had been for all future times and ages removed from the noses of paupers by the express order of the board in council assembled solemnly given and pronounced under their hands and seals there was a still greater obstacle in oliver's youth and childishness he only cried bitterly all day and when the long dismal night came on spread his little hands before his eyes to shut out the darkness and crouching in the corner tried to sleep ever and anon waking with a start and tremble and drawing himself closer and closer to the wall as if to feel even its cold hard surface were a protection in the gloom and loneliness which surrounded him let it not be supposed by the enemies of the system that during the period of his solitary incarceration oliver was denied the benefit of exercise the pleasure of society or the advantages of religious consolation as for exercise it was nice cold weather and he was allowed to perform his ablutions every morning under the pump in a stone yard in the presence of mr bumble who prevented his catching cold and caused a tingling sensation to pervade his frame by repeated applications of the cane as for society he was carried every other day into the hall where the boys dined and there sociably flogged as a public warning and example and so far from being denied the advantages of religious consolation he was kicked into the same apartment every evening at prayer time and there permitted to listen to and console his mind with a general supplication of the boys containing a special clause therein inserted by authority of the board in which they entreated to be made good virtuous contented and obedient and to be guarded from the sins and vices of oliver twist whom the supplication distinctly set forth to be under the exclusive patronage and protection of the powers of wickedness and an article direct from the manufactory of the very devil himself 
it chanced one morning while oliver's affairs were in this auspicious and comfortable state that mr gamfield chimney-sweep went his way down the high street deeply cogitating in his mind his ways and means of paying certain arrears of rent for which his landlord had become rather pressing mr gamfield's most sanguine estimate of his finances could not raise them within full five pounds of the desired amount and in a species of arithmetical desperation he was alternately cudgelling his brains and his donkey when passing the workhouse his eyes encountered the bill on the gate whoa said mr gamfield to the donkey the donkey was in a state of profound abstraction wondering probably whether he was destined to be regaled with a cabbage stalk or two when he had disposed of the two sacks of soot with which the little cart was laden so without noticing the word of command he jogged onward mr gamfield growled a fierce imprecation on the donkey generally but more particularly on his eyes and running after him bestowed a blow on his head which would inevitably have beaten in any skull but a donkey's then catching hold of the bridle he gave his jaw a sharp wrench by way of gentle reminder that he was not his own master and by these means he turned him round he then gave him another blow on the head just to stun him till he came back again having completed these arrangements he walked up to the gate to read the bill the gentleman with the white waistcoat was standing at the gate with his hands behind him after having delivered himself of some profound sentiments in the board-room having witnessed the little dispute between mr gamfield and the donkey he smiled joyously when that person came up to read the bill for he saw at once that mr gamfield was exactly the sort of master oliver twist wanted mr gamfield smiled too as he perused the document for five pounds was just the sum he had been wishing for and as to the boy with which it was encumbered mr gamfield knowing what the dietary of the workhouse was well knew he would be a nice small pattern the very thing for register stoves so he spelt the bill through again from beginning to end and then touching his fur cap in token of humility accosted the gentleman in the white waistcoat this here boy sir what the pairs wants to prentice said mr gamfield hey my man said the gentleman in the white waistcoat with a condescending smile what of him if the pairs would like him to learn a right pleasant trade in a good spectable chimney sweeping business said mr gamfield i want a prentice and i am ready to take him walk in said the gentleman in the white waistcoat mr gamfield having lingered behind to give the donkey another blow on the head and another wrench of the jaw as a caution not to run away in his absence followed the gentleman with the white waistcoat into the room where oliver had first seen him it's a nasty trade said mr limpkins when gamfield had again stated his wish young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now said another gentleman that's a cause they damped in the straw for they lit it in the chimney to make em come down again said gamfield that's all smoke and no blaze yes yeah, smoke ain't o no use at all in making a boy come down for it only sends him to sleep and that's what he likes boys is very obstinate and very lazy gentlemen and there's nothing like a good hot blaze to make em come down with a run it's humane too gentlemen because even if they've stuck in the chimney roasting their feet makes em struggle to extricate themselves the gentleman in the white waistcoat appeared very much amused by this explanation but his mirth was speedily checked by a look from mr limpkins the board then proceeded to converse among themselves for a few minutes but in so low a tone that the words saving of expenditures looked well in the accounts have a printed report published were alone audible these only chanced to be heard indeed on account of their being very frequently repeated with great emphasis at length the whispering ceased and the members of the board having resumed their seats and their solemnity mr limpkins said we have considered your proposition and we don't approve of it not at all said the gentleman in the white waistcoat decidedly not added the other members as mr gamfield did happen to labor under the slight imputation of having bruised three or four boys to death already it occurred to him that the board had perhaps in some unaccountable freak taken it into their heads that this extraneous circumstance ought to influence their proceedings it was very unlike their general mode of doing business if they had but still as he had no particular wish to revive the rumor he twisted his cap in his hands and walked slowly from the table so you won't let me have em gentlemen said mr gamfield pausing near the door no replied mr limpkins at least 
as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered. Mr. Gamfield's countenance brightened, as with a quick step he returned to the table and said, What do you give, gentlemen? Come, don't be too hard on a poor man. What do you give? I should say three pound ten was plenty, said Mr. Limpkins. Ten shillings too much, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Come, said Gamfield. Say four pound, gentlemen. Say four pound, and you've got rid of em for good and all. There. Three pound ten, repeated Mr. Limpkins firmly. Come, I'll split the difference, gentlemen, urged Gamfield. Three pound fifteen. Not a farthing more, was the firm reply of Mr. Limpkins. You're desperate hard upon me, gentlemen, said Gamfield, wavering. Pooh, pooh, nonsense, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. He'd be cheap with nothing at all as a premium. Take him, you silly fellow. He's just the boy for you. He wants the stick, now and then. It'll do him good, and his board needn't come very expensive, for he hasn't been overfed since he was born. <laughs> Mr. Gamfield gave an arch look at the faces round the table, and observing a smile on all of them, gradually broke into a smile himself. The bargain was made. Mr. Bumble was at once instructed that Oliver Twist and his indentures were to be conveyed before the magistrate for signature and approval that very afternoon. In pursuance of this determination, little Oliver, to his excessive astonishment, was released from bondage and ordered to put himself into a clean shirt. He had hardly achieved this very unusual gymnastic performance when Mr. Bumble brought him, with his own hands, a basin of gruel and the holiday allowance of two ounces and a quarter of bread. At this tremendous sight, Oliver began to cry very piteously, thinking, not unnaturally, that the board must have determined to kill him for some useful purpose, where they never would have begun to fatten him up in that way. "'Don't make your eyes red, Oliver, but eat your food and be thankful,' said Mr. Bumble, in a tone of impressive pomposity. "'You're going to be made apprentice of, Oliver.' A "'Apprentice, sir,' said the child, trembling. "'Yes, Oliver,' said Mr. Bumble. The kind and blessed gentleman, which is so many parents to you, Oliver, when you have none of your own, are a-going to prentice you, and to set you up in life, and make a man of you, although the expense to the parish is three pound ten. Three pound ten, Oliver, seventy shillings, one hundred and forty-six pences, and all for a naughty orphan which nobody can't love. As Mr. Bumble paused to take breath, after delivering this address in an awful voice, the tears rolled down the poor child's face, and he sobbed bitterly. "'Come,' said Mr. Bumble, somewhat less pompously, for it was gratifying to his feelings to observe the effect his eloquence had produced. "'Come, Oliver, wipe your eyes with the cuffs of your jacket, and don't cry into your gruel. That's a very foolish action, Oliver.' "'It certainly was, for there was quite enough water in it already.' On their way to the magistrate, Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver that all he would have to do would be to look very happy, and say, when the gentleman asked him if he wanted to be apprenticed, that he should like it very much indeed, both of which injunctions Oliver promised to obey, the rather, as Mr. Bumble threw in a gentle hint, that if he failed in either particular there was no telling what would be done to him. When they arrived at the office he was shut up in a little room by himself, and admonished by Mr. Bumble to stay there until he came back to fetch him. There the boy remained, with a palpitating heart, for half an hour, at the expiration of which time Mr. Bumble thrust in his head, unadorned with the cocked hat, and said aloud, "'Now, Oliver, my dear, come to the gentleman.' As Mr. Bumble said this he put on a grim and threatening look, and added, in a low voice, "'Mind what I told you, you young rascal!' Oliver stared innocently in Mr. Bumble's face at this somewhat contradictory style of address, but that gentleman prevented his offering any remark thereupon by leading him at once into an adjoining room, the door of which was open. It was a large room, with a great window. Behind a desk sat two old gentlemen with powdered heads, one of whom was reading the newspaper, while the other was perusing, with the aid of a pair of tortoise-shell spectacles, a small piece of parchment which lay before him. Mr. Limpkins was standing in front of the desk on one side, and Mr. Gamfield, with a partially washed face, on the other, while two or three bluff-looking men in top-boots were lounging about. 
the old gentleman with the spectacles gradually dozed off over the little bit of parchment and there was a short pause after oliver had been stationed by mr bumble in front of the desk this is the boy your worship said mr bumble the old gentleman who was reading the newspaper raised his head for a moment and pulled the other old gentleman by the sleeve whereupon the last mentioned old gentleman woke up oh is this the boy said the old gentleman this is him sir replied mr bumble bow to the magistrate my dear oliver roused himself and made his best obeisance he had been wondering with his eyes fixed on the magistrate's powder whether all boards were born with that white stuff on their heads and were boards from thenceforth on that account well said the old gentleman i suppose he's fond of chimney sweeping he dotes on it your worship replied bumble giving oliver a sly pinch to intimate that he had better not say he didn't and he will be a sweep will he inquired the old gentleman if we was to bind him to any other trade to-morrow he'd run away simultaneous your worship replied bumble and this man that's to be his master you sir you'll treat him well and feed him and do all that sort of thing will you said the old gentleman when i says i will i means i will replied mr gamfield doggedly you're a rough speaker my friend but you look an honest open-hearted man said the old gentleman turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate for oliver's premium whose villainous countenance was a regular stamped receipt for cruelty but the magistrate was half blind and half childish so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did i hope i am sir said mr gamfield with an ugly leer i have no doubt you are my friend replied the old gentleman fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose and looking about him for the inkstand it was the crucial moment of oliver's fate if the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was he would have dipped his pen into it and signed the indentures and oliver would have been straightway hurried off but as it chanced to be immediately under his nose it followed as a matter of course that he looked all over his desk for it without finding it and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of oliver twist who despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of bumble was regarding the repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear too palpable to be mistaken even by a half-blind magistrate the old gentleman stopped laid down his pen and looked from oliver to mr limpkins who attempted to take snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect my boy said the old gentleman you look pale and alarmed what is the matter stand a little away from him beetle said the other magistrate laying aside the paper and leaning forward with an expression of interest now boy tell us what's the matter don't be afraid oliver fell on his knees and clasping his hands together prayed that they would order him back to the dark room that they would starve him beat him kill him if they pleased rather than send him away with that dreadful man well said mr bumble raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemnity well of all the artful and designing orphans that ever i see oliver you are one of the most barefacedest hold your tongue beetle said the second old gentleman when mr bumble had given vent to this compound adjective i beg your worship's pardon said mr bumble incredulous of having heard aright did your worship speak to me yes hold your tongue mr bumble was stupefied with astonishment a beetle ordered to hold his tongue a moral revolution the old gentleman in the tortoise-shell spectacles looked at his companion he nodded significantly we refuse to sanction these indentures said the old gentleman tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke i hope stammered mr limpkins i hope the magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unsupported testimony of a child the magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion on the matter said the second old gentleman sharply take the boy back to the workhouse and treat him kindly he seems to want it that same evening the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed not only that oliver would be hung but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain mr bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery and said he wished he might come to good whereunto mr gamfield replied that he wished he might come to him which although he agreed with the beetle in most matters would seem to be a wish of a totally opposite description the next morning the public were once informed 
that oliver twist was again to let and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him end of chapter three chapter four of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter four oliver being offered another place makes his first entry into public life in great families when an advantageous place cannot be obtained either in possession reversion remainder or expectancy for the young man who is growing up it is a very general custom to send him to sea the board in imitation of so wise and salutary an example took counsel together on the expediency of shipping off oliver twist in some small trading vessel bound to a good unhealthy port this suggested itself as the very best thing that could possibly be done with him the probability being that the skipper would flog him to death in a playful mood some day after dinner or would knock his brains out with an iron bar both pastimes being as is pretty generally known very favorite and common recreations among gentlemen of that class the more the case presented itself to the board in this point of view the more manifold the advantages of the step appeared so they came to the conclusion that the only way of providing for oliver effectually was to send him to sea without delay mr bumble had been dispatched to make various preliminary inquiries with the view of finding out some captain or other who wanted a cabin boy without any friends and was returning to the workhouse to communicate the result of his mission when he encountered at the gate no less a person than mr sowerberry the parochial undertaker mr sowerberry was a tall gaunt large-jointed man attired in a suit of threadbare black with darned cotton stockings of the same color and shoes to answer his features were not naturally intended to wear a smiling aspect but he was in general rather given to professional jocosity his step was elastic and his face betokened inward pleasantry as he advanced to mr bumble and shook him cordially by the hand i have taken the measure of the two women that died last night mr bumble said the undertaker you'll make your fortune mr sowerberry said the beetle as he thrust his thumb and forefinger into the proffered snuff-box of the undertaker which was an ingenious little model of a patent coffin i say you'll make your fortune mr sowerberry repeated mr bumble tapping the undertaker on the shoulder in a friendly manner with his cane think so said the undertaker in a tone which half admitted and half disputed the probability of the event the prices allowed by the board are very small mr bumble so are the coffins replied the beetle with precisely as near an approach to a laugh as a great official ought to indulge in mr sowerberry was much tickled at this as of course he ought to be and laughed a long time without cessation well well mr bumble he said at length there's no denying that since the new system of feeding has come in the coffins are something narrower and more shallow than they used to be but we must have some profit mr bumble well-seasoned timber is an expensive article sir and all the iron handles come by canal from birmingham well well said mr bumble every trade has its drawbacks a fair profit is of course allowable of course of course replied the undertaker and if i don't get a profit upon this or that particular article why i make it up in the long run you see <laughs> just so said mr bumble though i must say continued the undertaker resuming the current of observations which the beetle had interrupted though i must say mr bumble that i have to contend against one very great disadvantage which is that all the stout people go off the quickest the people who have been better off and have paid rates for many years are the first to sink when they come into the house and let me tell you mr bumble that three or four inches over one's calculation makes a great hole in one's profits especially when one has a family to provide for sir 
as mr sowerberry said this with the becoming indignation of an ill-used man and as mr bumble felt that it rather tended to convey a reflection on the honour of the parish the latter gentleman thought it advisable to change the subject oliver twist being uppermost in his mind he made him his theme by the by said mr bumble you don't know anybody who wants a boy do you a parochial prentice who is at present a dead weight a millstone as i may say round the parochial throat liberal terms mr sowerberry liberal terms as mr bumble spoke he raised his cane to the bill above him and gave three distinct raps upon the words five pounds which were printed thereon in roman capitals of gigantic size gad so said the undertaker taking mr bumble by the gilt-edged lapel of his official coat that's just the very thing i wanted to speak to you about you know dear me what a very elegant button this is mr bumble i never noticed it before yes i think it rather pretty said the beetle glancing proudly downwards at the large brass buttons which embellished his coat the die is the same as the parochial seal the good samaritan healing the sick and bruised man the board presented it to me on new year's morning mr sowerberry i put it on i remember for the first time to attend the inquest on that reduced tradesman who died in a doorway at midnight i recollect said the undertaker the jury brought it in died from exposure to the cold and want of the common necessaries of life didn't they mr bumble nodded and they made it a special verdict i think said the undertaker by adding some words to the effect that if the relieving officer had tush foolery interposed the beadle if the board attended to all the nonsense that ignorant jurymen talk they'd have enough to do very true said the undertaker they would indeed juries said mr bumble grasping his cane tightly as was his wont when working into a passion juries is ineducated vulgar grovelling wretches so they are said the undertaker they haven't no more philosophy nor political economy about them than that said the beetle snapping his fingers contemptuously no more they have acquiesced the undertaker i despise em said the beetle growing very red in the face so do i rejoined the undertaker and i only wish we'd a jury of the independent sort in the house for a week or two said the beetle the rules and regulations of the board would soon bring their spirit down for em let em alone for that replied the undertaker so saying he smiled approvingly to calm the rising wrath of the indignant parish officer Mr. Bumble lifted off his cocked hat, took a handkerchief from the inside of the crown, wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his rage had engendered, fixed the cocked hat on again, and, turning to the undertaker, said in a calmer voice, "'Well, what about the boy?' "'Oh,' replied the undertaker, "'why, you know, Mr. Bumble, I pay a good deal towards the poor's rate.' Hmm. said Mr. Bumble. "'Well?' "'Well?' replied the undertaker i was thinking that if i pay so much towards him i've a right to get out as much out of him as i can mr bumble and so i think i'll take the boy myself mr bumble grasped the undertaker by the arm and led him into the building mr sowerberry was closeted with the board for five minutes and it was arranged that oliver should go to him that evening upon liking a phrase which means in the case of a parish apprentice that if the master find upon a short trial that he can get enough work out of a boy without putting too much food into him he shall have him for a term of years to do what he likes with when little oliver was taken before the gentleman that evening and informed that he was to go that night as general house lad to a coffin makers and that if he complained of his situation or ever came back to the parish again he would be sent to sea there to be drowned or knocked on the head as the case may be he evinced so little emotion that they by common consent pronounced him a hardened young rascal and ordered mr bumble to remove him forthwith now 
although it was very natural that the board of all the people in the world should feel in a great state of virtuous astonishment and horror at the smallest tokens of want of feeling on the part of anybody they were rather out in this particular instance the simple fact was that oliver instead of possessing too little feeling possessed rather too much and was in a fair way of being reduced for life to a state of brutal stupidity and sullenness by the ill usage he had received he heard the news of his destination in perfect silence and having had his luggage put into his hand which was not very difficult to carry inasmuch as it was all comprised within the limits of a brown paper parcel about half a foot square by three inches deep he pulled his cap over his eyes and once more attaching himself to mr bumble's coat cuff was led away by that dignitary to a new scene of suffering for some time mr bumble drew oliver along without notice or remark for the beetle carried his head very erect as a beetle always should and it being a windy day little oliver was completely enshrouded by the skirts of mr bumble's coat as they blew open and disclosed to great advantage his flapped waistcoat and drab plush knee breeches as they drew near to their destination however mr bumble thought it expedient to look down and see that the boy was in good order for inspection by his new master which he accordingly did with a fit and becoming air of gracious patronage oliver said mr bumble yes sir replied oliver in a low tremulous voice pull that cap off your eyes and hold up your head sir although oliver did as he was desired at once and passed the back of his unoccupied hand briskly across his eyes he left a tear in them when he looked up at his conductor as mr bumble gazed sternly upon him it rolled down his cheek it was followed by another and another the child made a strong effort but it was an unsuccessful one withdrawing his other hand from mr bumble's he covered his face with both and wept until the tears sprung out from between his chin and bony fingers well exclaimed mr bumble stopping short and darting at his little charge a look of intense malignity of all the ungratefulest and worst disposed boys as ever i see oliver you are the no no sir sobbed oliver clinging to the hand which held the well-known cane no no sir i will be good indeed 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 i will sir i'm a very little boy sir and it is so 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 what inquired mr bumble in amazement so lonely sir so very lonely cried the child everybody hates me oh sir sir don't don't pray be cross to me the child beat his hand upon his heart and looked in his companion's face with tears of real agony mr bumble regarded oliver's piteous and helpless look with some astonishment for a few seconds hemmed three or four times in a husky manner and after muttering something about that troublesome cough bade oliver dry his eyes and be a good boy then once more taking his hand he walked on with him in silence the undertaker who had just put up the shutters of his shop was making some entries in his day-book by the light of a most appropriate dismal candle when mr bumble entered aha said the undertaker looking up from the book and pausing in the middle of a word is that you bumble no one else mr sowerberry replied the beetle here i've brought the boy oliver made a bow oh that's the boy is it said the undertaker raising the candle above his head to get a better view of oliver mrs sowerberry will you have the goodness to come here a moment my dear mrs sowerberry emerged from a little room behind the shop and presented the form of a short then squeezed up woman with a vixenish countenance my dear said mr sowerberry deferentially this is the boy from the workhouse that i told you of oliver bowed again dear me said the undertaker's wife he's very small why he is rather small replied mr bumble looking at oliver as if it were his fault that he was no bigger he is small there's no denying it but he'll grow mrs sowerberry he'll grow ah oh, i dare say he will replied the lady pettishly on our victuals and our drink i see no saving in parish children not i for they always cost more to keep than they're worth however men always think they know best there get downstairs little bag of bones with this the undertaker's wife opened a side door and pushed oliver down a steep flight of stairs into a stone cell damp and dark 
forming the anteroom to the coal cellar and denominated kitchen wherein sat a slatternly girl in shoes down at heel and blue worsted stockings very much out of repair here charlotte said mr sowerberry who had followed oliver down give this boy some of the cold bits that were put by for trip he hasn't come home since this morning so he may go without em i dare say the boy isn't too dainty to eat em are you boy oliver whose eyes had glistened at the mention of meat and who was trembling with eagerness to devour it replied in the negative and a plate full of coarse broken victuals was set before him i wish some well-fed philosopher whose meat and drink turn to gall within him whose blood is ice whose heart is iron could have seen oliver twist clutching at the dainty viands that the dog had neglected i wish he could have witnessed the horrible avidity with which oliver tore the bits asunder with all the ferocity of famine there is only one thing i should like better and that would be to see the philosopher making the same sort of meal himself with the same relish well said the undertaker's wife when oliver had finished his supper which she had regarded in silent horror and with fearful auguries of his future appetite have you done there being nothing eatable within his reach oliver replied in the affirmative then come with me said mrs sowerberry taking up a dim and dirty lamp and leading the way upstairs your bed's under the counter you don't mind sleeping among the coffins i suppose but it doesn't much matter whether you do or don't for you can't sleep anywhere else come don't keep me here all night oliver lingered no longer but meekly followed his new mistress end of chapter four chapter five of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. oliver twist by charles dickens chapter five oliver mingles with new associates going to a funeral for the first time he forms an unfavorable notion of his master's business oliver being left to himself in the undertaker's shop set the lamp down on a workman's bench and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread which many people a good deal older than he will be at no loss to understand an unfinished coffin on black trestles which stood in the middle of the shop looked so gloomy and death-like that a cold tremble came over him every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror against the wall were ranged in regular array a long row of elm boards cut in the same shape looking in the dim light like high-shouldered ghosts with their hands in their breeches pockets coffin plates elm chips bright-headed nails and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor and the wall behind the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloths on duty at a large private door with a hearse drawn by four black steeds approaching in the distance the shop was close and hot the atmosphere seemed tainted with the smell of coffins the recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed oliver he was alone in a strange place and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation the boy had no friends to care for or to care for him the regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind the absence of no loved and well-remembered face sank heavily into his heart but his heart was heavy notwithstanding and he wished as he crept into his narrow bed that that were his coffin and that he could be lain in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground with the tall grass waving gently above his head and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep oliver was wakened in the morning by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door which before he could huddle on his clothes was repeated in an angry and impetuous manner about twenty-five times when he began to undo the chain the legs desisted and a voice began open the door will yer cried the voice which belonged to the legs which had kicked at the door i will directly sir replied oliver undoing the chain and turning the key i suppose you're the new boy ain't you said a voice through the keyhole yes sir replied oliver how old are you inquired the voice ten sir replied oliver 
Then I'll whop you when I get in, said the voice. You see if I don't, that's all my work is, brat. And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable just recorded bears reference, to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge most honorably. He drew back the bolts with a trembling hand and opened the door. For a second or two, Oliver glanced up the street, and down the street, and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown, who had addressed him through the keyhole, had walked a few paces off to warm himself, for nobody did he see but a big charity boy sitting on a post in front of the house, eating a slice of bread and butter, which he cut into wedges, the size of his mouth, with a clasp-knife, and then consumed with great dexterity. "'I beg your pardon, sir.' said oliver at length seeing that no other visitor made his appearance did you knock i kicked replied the charity boy did you want a coffin sir inquired oliver innocently at this the charity boy looked monstrous fierce and said that oliver would want one before long if he cut jokes with his superiors in that way you don't know who i am i suppose workus said the charity boy in continuation descending from the top of the post meanwhile with edifying gravity no sir rejoined oliver i'm mr noah claypole said the charity boy and you're under me take down the shutters you idle young ruffian with this mr claypole administered a kick to oliver and entered the shop with a dignified air which did him great credit it is difficult for a large-headed small-eyed youth of lumbering make and heavy countenance to look dignified under any circumstances but it is more especially so when superadded to these personal attractions are a red nose and yellow smalls. Oliver, having taken down the shutters and a broken pane of glass in his effort to stagger away beneath the weight of the first one to a small court at the side of the house in which they were kept during the day, was graciously assisted by Noah, who, having consoled him with the assurance that he'd catch it, condescended to help him. Mr. Sowerberry came down soon after. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Sowerberry appeared. Oliver, having caught it in fulfillment of Noah's prediction, followed that young gentleman down the stairs to breakfast. "'Come near the fire, Noah,' said Charlotte. "'I saved a nice little bit of bacon for you from Master's breakfast. Oliver, shut that door at Mr. Noah's back, and then take them bits that I've put out on the cover of the bread-pan. There's your tea. Take it away to that box and drink it there. Make haste, for they'll want you to mind the shop. Do you hear?' Do you hear, Workus? said Noah Claypole. Lo, Noah, said Charlotte. What a rum creature you are! Why don't you let the boy alone? Let him alone, said Noah. Why, everybody lets him alone enough for the matter of that. Neither his father nor his mother will ever interfere with him. All his relations let him have his own pretty well. Eh, Charlotte? <laughs> oh, you queer soul, said Charlotte, bursting into a hearty laugh, in which she was joined by Noah after which they both looked scornfully at poor Oliver Twist as he sat shivering on the box in the coldest corner of the room and ate the stale pieces which had been specially reserved for him. Noah was a charity boy, but not a workhouse orphan. No chance child was he, for he could trace his genealogy all the way back to his parents, who lived hard by, his mother being a washerwoman and his father a drunken sailor, discharged with a wooden leg and a diurnal pension of two pence halfpenny and an unstatable fraction. The shop boys in the neighborhood had long been in the habit of branding Noah in the public streets with the ignominious epithets of leathers, charity, and the like, and Noah had borne them without reply. But now that fortune had cast in his way a nameless orphan, at whom even the meanest could point the finger of scorn, he retorted on him with interest. This affords charming food for contemplation. It shows us what a beautiful thing human nature may be made to be, and how impartially the same amiable qualities are developed in the finest lord and the dirtiest charity boy. Oliver had been sojourning at the undertaker's some three weeks or a month. Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, the shop being shut up, were taking their supper in the little back parlor, when— Mr. Sowerberry, after several deferential glances at his wife, said, "'My dear,' he was going to say more, but Mrs. Sowerberry looking up, with a peculiarly unpropitious aspect, he stopped short. "'Well?' said Mrs. Sowerberry, sharply. "'Nothing, my dear, nothing,' said Mr. Sowerberry. "'Ugh, you brute!' 
said mrs sowerberry not at all my dear said mr sowerberry humbly i thought you didn't want to hear my dear i was only going to say oh don't tell me what you were going to say interposed mrs sowerberry i am nobody don't consult me pray i don't want to intrude upon your secrets as mrs sowerberry said this she gave an hysterical laugh which threatened violent consequences but my dear said sowerberry i want to ask your advice no no don't ask mine replied mrs sowerberry in an affecting manner ask somebody else's here there was another hysterical laugh which frightened mr sowerberry very much this is a very common and much approved matrimonial course of treatment which is often very effective it at once reduced mr sowerberry to begging as a special favor to be allowed to say what mrs sowerberry was most curious to hear after a short duration the permission was most graciously conceded it's only about young twist my dear said mr sowerberry a very good-looking boy that my dear he need be for he it's enough observed the lady there's an expression of melancholy in his face my dear resumed mr sowerberry which is very interesting he would make a delightful mute my love mrs sowerberry looked up with an expression of considerable wonderment mr sowerberry remarked it and without allowing time for any observation on the good lady's part proceeded i don't mean a regular mute to attend grown-up people my dear but only for children's practice it would be very new to have a mute in proportion my dear you may depend upon it it would have a superb effect mrs sowerberry who had a good deal of taste in the undertaking way was much struck by the novelty of this idea but as it would have been compromising her dignity to have said so under existing circumstances she merely inquired with much sharpness why such an obvious suggestion had not presented itself to her husband's mind before mr sowerberry rightly construed this as an acquiescence in his proposition it was speedily determined therefore that oliver should be at once initiated into the mysteries of the trade and with this view that he should accompany his master on the very next occasion of his services being required the occasion was not long in coming half an hour after breakfast next morning mr bumble entered the shop and supporting his cane against the counter drew forth his large leathern pocket-book from which he selected a small scrap of paper which he handed over to sowerberry aha said the undertaker glancing over it with a lively countenance an order for a coffin eh for a coffin first and a parochial funeral afterwards replied mr bumble fastening the strap of the leathern pocket-book which like himself was very corpulent Beaten said the undertaker looking from the scrap of paper to mr bumble i never heard the name before bumble shook his head as he replied obstinate people mr sowerberry very obstinate proud too i'm afraid sir proud eh exclaimed mr sowerberry with a sneer come that's too much oh it's sickening replied the beetle antimonial mr sowerberry so it is acquiesced the undertaker we only heard of the family the night before last said the beetle and we shouldn't have known anything about them then only a woman who lodges at the same house made an application to the parochial committee for them to send the parochial surgeon to see a woman as was very bad he had gone out to dinner but his prentice which is a very clever lad sent him some medicine in a blacking bottle off-hand ah there's promptness said the undertaker promptness indeed replied the beetle but what's the consequence what's the ungrateful behavior of these rebels sir why the husband sends back word that the medicine won't suit his wife's complaint and so she shan't take it says she shan't take it sir good strong wholesome medicine as was given with great success to two irish laborers and a coal heaver only a week before sent em for nothing with a blackened bottle in and he sends back word that she shan't take it sir as the atrocity presented itself to mr bumble's mind in full force he struck the counter sharply with his cane and became flushed with indignation well said the undertaker i never did 
never did sir ejaculated the beetle no nor nobody never did but now she's dead we've got to bury her and that's the direction and the sooner it's done the better thus saying mr bumble put on his cocked hat wrong side first in a fever of parochial excitement and flounced out of the shop why he was so angry oliver that he forgot even to ask after you said mr sowerberry looking after the beetle as he strode down the street yes sir replied oliver who had carefully kept himself out of sight during the interview and who was shaking from head to foot at the mere recollection of the sound of mr bumble's voice he needn't have taken the trouble to shrink from Mr. Bumble's glance, however, for that functionary, on whom the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat had made a very strong impression, thought that now the undertaker had got Oliver upon trial the subject was better avoided, until such time as he should be firmly bound for seven years, and all danger of his being returned upon the hands of the parish should be thus effectually and legally overcome. Well, said Mr. Sowerberry, taking up his hat. The sooner this job is done, the better. Noah, look after the shop. Oliver, put on your cap and come with me. Oliver obeyed and followed his master on his professional mission. They walked on for some time through the most crowded and densely inhabited part of the town, and then, striking down a narrow street more dirty and miserable than any they had yet passed through, paused to look for the house which was the object of their search. The houses on either side were high and large, but very old, and tenanted by people of the poorest class, as their neglected appearance would have sufficiently denoted, without the concurrent testimony afforded by the squalid looks of the few men and women who, with folded arms and bodies half-doubled, occasionally skulked along. A great many of the tenements had shop-fronts, but these were fast-closed and mouldering away, only the upper rooms being inhabited. Some houses, which had become insecure from age and decay, were prevented from falling into the street by huge beams of wood reared against the walls and firmly planted in the road. But even these crazy dens seemed to have been selected as the nightly haunts of some houseless wretches, for many of the rough boards which supplied the place of door and window were wrenched from their positions to afford an aperture wide enough for the passage of a human body. The kennel was stagnant and filthy. The very rats, which here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness, were hideous with famine. There was neither knocker nor bell-handle at the open door where Oliver and his master stopped. So groping his way cautiously through the dark passage, and bidding Oliver keep close to him and not be afraid, the undertaker mounted to the top of the first flight of stairs. Stumbling against a door on the landing, he rapped at it with his knuckles. It was opened by a young girl of thirteen or fourteen. The undertaker at once saw enough of what the room contained to know it was the apartment to which he had been directed. He stepped in. Oliver followed him. There was no fire in the room, but a man crouching mechanically over the empty stove. An old woman, too, had drawn a low stool to the cold hearth and was sitting beside him. There were some ragged children in another corner, and in a small recess, opposite the door, there lay upon the ground something covered with an old blanket. Oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes toward the place, and crept involuntarily closer to his master, for though it was covered up, the boy felt that it was a corpse. The man's face was thin and very pale, his hair and beard were grisly, his eyes were bloodshot. The old woman's face was wrinkled, her two remaining teeth protruded over her under lip, and her eyes were bright and piercing. Oliver was afraid to look at either her or the man. They seemed so like the rats he had seen outside. "'Nobody shall go near her,' said the man, starting fiercely up, as the undertaker approached the recess. "'Keep back! Damn you! Keep back, if you have a life to lose!' "'Nonsense, my good man,' said the undertaker, who was pretty well used to misery in all its shapes. "'Nonsense!' "'I tell you,' said the man, clenching his hands and stamping furiously on the floor. I tell you, I won't have her put into the ground. She couldn't rest there. The worms would worry her, not eat her. She is so worn away. The undertaker offered no reply to this raving, but producing a tape from his pocket, knelt down for a moment by the side of the body. said the man, bursting into tears, and sinking on his knees at the feet of the dead woman. 
Kneel down, kneel down. Kneel round her, every one of you, and mark my words. I say, she was starved to death. I never knew how bad she was till the fever came upon her, and then her bones were starting through the skin. There was neither fire nor candle. She died in the dark, in the dark. She couldn't even see her children's faces, though we heard her gasping out their names. I begged for her in the streets, and they sent me to prison. When I came back, she was dying, and all the blood in my heart has dried up. For they starved her to death. I swear it before the God that saw it. They starved her. He twined his hands in his hair and, with a loud scream, rolled groveling upon the floor, his eyes fixed and the foam covering his lips. The terrified children cried bitterly, but the old woman, who had hitherto remained as quiet as if she had been wholly deaf to all that passed, menaced them into silence. Having unloosened the cravat of the man who still remained extended on the ground, she tottered towards the undertaker. "'She was my daughter,' said the old woman, nodding her head in the direction of the corpse, and speaking with an idiotic leer, more ghastly than even the presence of death in such a place. "'Lord, Lord, well it is strange that I who gave birth to her, and was a woman then, should be alive and merry now and she lying there so cold and stiff lord lord to think of it it's as good as a play as good as a play <laughs> as the wretched creature mumbled and chuckled in her hideous merriment the undertaker turned to go away stop stop said the old woman in a loud whisper will she be buried to-morrow or next day or to-night I laid her out, and I must walk, you know. Send me a large cloak, a good warm one, for it is bitter cold. We should have cake and wine, too, before we go. Never mind. Send some bread, only a loaf of bread and a cup of water. Shall we have some bread, dear? She said eagerly, catching at the undertaker's coat, as he once more moved towards the door. Yes, yes, said the undertaker of course anything you like he disengaged himself from the old woman's grasp and drawing oliver after him hurried away the next day the family having been meanwhile relieved with a half quartern loaf and a piece of cheese left with them by mr bumble himself oliver and his master returned to the miserable abode where mr bumble had already arrived accompanied by four men from the workhouse who were to act as bearers an old black coke had been thrown over the rags of the old woman and the man and the bare coffin, having been screwed down, was hoisted on the shoulders of the bearers and carried into the street. "'Now you must put your best leg foremost, old lady,' whispered Sowerberry in the old woman's ear. "'We are rather late, and it won't do to keep the clergyman waiting. Move on, my men, as quick as you like.' Thus directed, the bearers trotted on under their light burden, and the two mourners kept as near them as they could. Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry walked at a good, smart pace in front, and Oliver, whose legs were not so long as his master's, ran by the side. There was not so great a necessity for hurrying as Mr. Sowerberry had anticipated, however, for when they reached the obscure corner of the churchyard in which the nettles grew, and where the parish graves were made, the clergyman had not arrived, and the clerk, who was sitting by the vestry-room fire, seemed to think it by no means improbable that it might be an hour or so before he came. So they put the beer on the brink of the grave, and the two mourners waited patiently in the damp clay, with a cold rain drizzling down, while the ragged boys whom the spectacle had attracted into the churchyard played a noisy game at hide-and-seek among the tombstones, or varied their amusements by jumping backwards and forwards over the coffin. Mr. Sowerberry and Bumble, being personal friends of the clerk, sat by the fire with him and read the paper. At length, after a lapse of something more than an hour, Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry and the clerk were seen running towards the grave. Immediately afterward the clergyman appeared, putting on his surplice as he came along. 
Mr. Bumble then thrashed a boy or two to keep up appearances, and the reverend gentleman, having read as much of the burial service as could be compressed into four minutes, gave his surplice to the clerk and walked away again. "'Now build,' said Sowerberry to the grave-digger. "'Fill up.' It was no very difficult task, for the grave was so full that the uppermost coffin was within a few feet of the surface. The grave-digger shoveled in the earth, stamped it loosely down with his feet, shouldered his spade, and walked off, followed by the boys, who murmured very loud complaints at the fun being over so soon. "'Come, my good fellow,' said Bumble, tapping the man on the back. "'They want to shut up the yard.' The man, who had never once moved, since he had taken his station by the graveside, started, raised his head, stared at the person who had addressed him, walked forward for a few paces, and fell down in a swoon. The crazy old woman was much too occupied in bewailing the loss of her cloak, which the undertaker had taken off, to pay him any attention, so they threw a can of cold water over him, and when he came to, saw him safely out of the churchyard, locked the gate, and departed on their different ways. "'Well, Oliver,' said Sowerberry, as they walked home, "'how do you like it?' "'Pretty well, thank you, sir.' replied oliver with considerable hesitation not very much sir ah you'll get used to it in time oliver said sowerberry nothing when you are used to it my boy oliver wondered in his own mind whether it had taken a very long time to get mr sowerberry used to it but he thought it better not to ask the question and walked back to the shop thinking over all he had seen and heard End of chapter five Chapter Six of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Six. Oliver, being goaded by the taunts of Noah, rouses into action and rather astonishes him. The month's trial over, Oliver was formally apprenticed. It was a nice sickly season just at this time in commercial phrase coffins were looking up and in the course of a few weeks oliver acquired a great deal of experience the success of mr sowerberry's ingenious speculation exceeded even his most sanguine hopes the oldest inhabitants recollected no period at which measles had been so prevalent or so fatal to infant existence and many were the mournful processions which little oliver headed in a hat-band reaching down to his knees to the indescribable admiration and emotion of all the mothers in the town as oliver accompanied his master in most of his adult expeditions too in order that he might acquire the equanimity of demeanor and full command of nerve which was essential to a finished undertaker he had many opportunities of observing the beautiful resignation and fortitude with which some strong-minded people bear their trials and losses for instance when sowerberry had an order for the burial of some rich old lady or gentleman who was surrounded by a great number of nieces and nephews who had been perfectly inconsolable during the previous illness and whose grief had been wholly irrepressible even on the most public occasions they would be as happy among themselves as need be quite cheerful and contented conversing together with as much freedom and gaiety as if nothing whatever had happened to disturb them husbands too bore the loss of their wives with the most heroic calmness wives again put on weeds for their husband as if so far from grieving in the garb of sorrow they had made up their minds to render it as becoming and attractive as possible it was observable too that ladies and gentlemen who were in passions of anguish during the ceremony of interment recovered almost as soon as they reached home and became quite composed before the tea-drinking was over all this was very pleasant and improving to see and oliver beheld it with great admiration that oliver twist was moved to resignation by the example of these good people i cannot although i am his biographer undertake to affirm with any degree of confidence but i can most distinctly say that for many months he continued meekly to submit to the domination and ill treatment of noah claypole who used him far worse than before now that his jealousy was roused by seeing the new boy promoted to the black stick and hat band while he the old one remained stationary in the muffin cap and leathers charlotte treated him ill because noah did and mrs sowerberry was his decided enemy because mr sowerberry was disposed to be his friend 
so between these three on one side and a glut of funerals on the other oliver was not altogether as comfortable as the hungry pig was when he was shut up by mistake in the grain department of a brewery and now i come to a very important passage in oliver's history for i have to record an act slight and unimportant perhaps in appearance but which indirectly produced a material change in all his future prospects and proceedings one day oliver and noah had descended into the kitchen at the usual dinner hour to banquet upon a small joint of mutton a pound and a half of the worst end of the neck when charlotte being called out of the way there ensued a brief interval of time which noah claypole being hungry and vicious considered he could not possibly devote to a worthier purpose than aggravating and tantalizing young oliver twist intent upon this innocent amusement noah put his feet on the tablecloth and pulled oliver's hair and twitched his ears and expressed his opinion that he was a sneak and furthermore announced his intention of coming to see him hanged whenever that desirable event should take place and entered upon various topics of petty annoyance like a malicious and ill-conditioned charity boy as he was but making oliver cry noah attempted to be more facetious still and in his attempt did what many sometimes do to this day when they want to be funny he got rather personal how's your mother workus said noah she's dead replied oliver don't you say anything about her to me oliver's color rose as he said this he breathed quickly and there was a curious working of the mouth and nostrils which mr claypole thought must be the immediate precursor of a violent fit of crying under this impression he returned to the charge what did ye die of workus said noah of a broken heart some of our old nurses told me replied oliver more as if he were talking to himself than answering noah i think i know what it must be to die of that told the roll low low right old larry workus said noah as a tear rolled down oliver's cheek what set you is snivelling now not you replied oliver sharply there that's enough don't say anything more to me about her you'd better not better not exclaimed noah well better not workus don't be impudent your mother too she's a nice son she was oh lor and here noah nodded his head expressively and curled up as much of his small red nose as muscular action could collect together for the occasion you know workus continued noah emboldened by oliver's silence and speaking in a jeering tone of affected pity of all tones the most annoying you know workus it can't be helped now and of course you couldn't help it then and i am very sorry for it and i'm sure we all are and pity you very much but you must know workus your mother was a regular right down pattern what did you say inquired oliver looking up very quickly a regular right down pattern workus replied noah coolly and it's a great deal better workus that she died when she did or else she'd have been hard laboring in bridewell or transported or hung which is more likely than either isn't it crimson with fury oliver started up overthrew the chair and table seized noah by the throat shook him in the violence of his rage till his teeth chattered in his head and collecting his whole force into one heavy blow felled him to the ground a minute ago the boy had looked the quiet child mild dejected creature that harsh treatment had made him but his spirit was roused at last the cruel insult to his dead mother had set his blood on fire his breast heaved his attitude was erect his eye bright and vivid his whole person changed as he stood glaring over the cowardly tormentor who now lay crouching at his feet and defied him with an energy he had never known before he'll murder me blubbered noah charlotte missus here's the new boy murdering on me help help oliver's gone mad charlotte noah's shouts were responded to by a loud scream from charlotte and a louder from mrs sowerberry the former of whom rushed into the kitchen by a side door while the latter paused on the staircase till she was quite certain that it was consistent with the preservation of human life to come further down oh you little wretch screamed charlotte seizing oliver with her utmost force which was about equal to that of a moderately strong man in particularly good training oh you little on great full murderous horrid villain and between every syllable 
charlotte gave oliver a blow with all her might accompanying it with a scream for the benefit of society charlotte's fist was by no means a light one but lest it should not be effectual in calming oliver's wrath mrs sowerberry plunged into the kitchen and assisted to hold him with one hand while she scratched his face with the other at this favorable position of affairs noah rose from the ground and pummeled him from behind this was rather too violent exercise to last long when they were all wearied out and could tear and beat no longer they dragged oliver struggling and shouting but nothing daunted into the dust cellar and there locked him up this being done mrs sowerberry sunk into a chair and burst into tears bless her she's gone off said charlotte a glass of water noah dear make haste oh charlotte said mrs sowerberry speaking as well as she could through a deficiency of breath and a sufficiency of cold water which noah had poured over her head and shoulders oh charlotte what a mercy we have not all been murdered in our beds ah mercy indeed ma'am was the reply i only hope this'll teach master not to have any more of these dreadful creatures that are born to be murderers and robbers from the very cradle poor noah he was all but killed ma'am when i come in poor fellow said mrs sowerberry looking piteously on the charity boy noah whose top waistcoat button might have been somewhere on a level with the crown of oliver's head rubbed his eyes with the inside of his wrists while this commiseration was bestowed upon him and performed some affecting tears and sniffs what's to be done exclaimed mrs sowerberry the master's not at home there's not a man in the house and he'll kick that door down in ten minutes oliver's vigorous plunges against the bit of timber in question rendered this occurrence highly probable dear dear i don't know ma'am said charlotte lest we send for the police officers or the military suggested mr claypole no no said mrs sowerberry bethinking herself of oliver's old friend run to mr bumble noah and tell him to come here directly and not to lose a minute never mind your cap make haste you can hold a knife to that black eye as you run along it'll keep the swelling down noah stopped to make no reply but started off at his fullest speed and very much it astonished the people who were out walking to see a charity boy tearing through the streets pell-mell with no cap on his head and a clasp knife at his eye End of chapter six chapter seven of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 7 Oliver Continues Refractory. Noah Claypole ran along the streets at his swiftest pace and paused not once for breath until he reached the workhouse gate. Having rested here for a minute or so to collect a good burst of sobs and an imposing show of tears and terror, he knocked loudly at the wicket and presented such a rueful face to the aged pauper who opened it that even he, who saw nothing but rueful faces about him at the best of times, startled back in astonishment. "'Why, what's the matter with the boy?' said the old pauper mr bumble mr bumble cried noah with well-affected dismay and in tones so loud and agitated that they not only caught the ear of mr bumble himself who happened to be hard by but alarmed him so much that he rushed into the yard without his cocked hat which is a very curious and remarkable circumstance as showing that even a beetle acted upon a sudden and powerful impulse may be afflicted with a momentary visitation of loss of self-possession and forgetfulness of personal dignity oh mr bumble sir said noah oliver sir oliver has what what interposed mr bumble with a gleam of pleasure in his metallic eyes not run away he hasn't run away has he noah no sir no not run away sir but these stern wishes replied noah he tried to murder me sir and he tried to murder charlotte and then missus oh what dreadful pain it is such agony please sir 
and here noah writhed and twisted his body into an extensive variety of eel-like positions thereby giving mr bumble to understand that from the violent and sanguinary onset of oliver twist he had sustained severe internal injury and damage from which he was at that moment suffering the acutest torture when noah saw that the intelligence he communicated perfectly paralyzed mr bumble he imported additional effect thereunto by bewailing his dreadful wounds ten times louder than before and when he observed a gentleman in a white waistcoat crossing the yard he was more tragic in his lamentations than ever rightly conceiving it highly expedient to attract the notice and rouse the indignation of the gentleman aforesaid the gentleman's notice was very soon attracted for he had not walked three paces when he turned angrily round and inquired what the young curl was howling for and why mr bumble did not favor him with something which would render the series of vocular exclamations so designated an involuntary process it's a poor boy from the free school sir replied mr bumble who has been nearly murdered all but murdered sir by young twist by jove exclaimed the gentleman in the white waistcoat stopping short i knew it i felt the strange presentiment from the very first that that audacious young savage would come to be hung he has likewise attempted sir to murder the female servant said mr bumble with a face of ashy paleness and his missus interposed mr claypole and his master too i think you said noah added mr bumble no he's outry would have murdered him replied noah he said he wanted to ah oh, said he wanted to did he my boy inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat yes sir replied noah and please sir mrs wants to know whether mr bumble can spare time to step up there directly and flog him cause master's out certainly my boy certainly said the gentleman in the white waistcoat smiling benignly and patting noah's head which was about three inches higher than his own you're a good boy a very good boy here's a penny for you bumble just step up to sowbury's with your cane and see what's best to be done don't spare him bumble no i will not sir replied the beetle and the cocked hat and cane having been by this time adjusted to their owner's satisfaction mr bumble and noah claypole betook themselves with all speed to the undertaker's shop here the position of affairs had not at all improved sourberry had not yet returned and oliver continued to kick with undiminished vigor at the cellar door the accounts of his ferocity as related by mrs sowerberry and charlotte were of so startling a nature that mr bumble judged it prudent to parley before opening the door with this view he gave a kick at the outside by way of prelude and then applying his mouth to the keyhole said in a deep and impressive tone oliver come you let me out replied oliver from the inside do you know this here voice oliver said mr bumble yes replied oliver ain't you afraid of it sir ain't you a trembling while i speak sir said mr bumble no replied oliver boldly an answer so different from the one he had expected to elicit and was in the habit of receiving staggered mr bumble not a little he stepped back from the keyhole drew himself up to his full height and looked from one to another of the three bystanders in mute astonishment oh you know mr bumble he must be mad said mrs sowerberry no boy in half his senses could venture to speak so to you it's not madness ma'am replied mr bumble after a few moments of deep meditation it's meat what exclaimed mrs sowerberry meat ma'am meat replied bumble with stern emphasis you've overfed him ma'am you've raised an artificial soul and spirit in him ma'am unbecoming a person of his condition as the board mrs sowerberry who are practical philosophers will tell you what have paupers to do with soul or spirit it's quite enough that we let em have live bodies if you had kept the boy on gruel ma'am this would never have happened dear dear ejaculated mrs sowerberry piously raising her eyes to the kitchen ceiling this comes of being liberal 
the liberality of mrs sowerberry to oliver had consisted of a profuse bestowal upon him of all the dirty odds and ends which nobody else would eat so there was a great deal of meekness and self-devotion to her voluntarily remaining under mr bumble's heavy accusation of which to do her justice she was wholly innocent in thought word or deed ah uh, said mr bumble when the lady brought her eyes down to earth again the only thing that can be done now that i know of is to leave him in the cellar for a day or so till he's a little starved down and then to take him out and keep him on gruel all through the apprenticeship he comes of a bad family excitable natures mrs sowerberry both the nurse and the doctor said that that mother of his made her way here against difficulties and pain that would have killed any well-disposed woman weeks before at this point of mr bumble's discourse oliver just hearing enough to know that some allusion was being made to his mother recommenced kicking with a violence that rendered every other sound inaudible sowerberry returned at this juncture Oliver's offence, having been explained to him, with such exaggerations as the lady thought best, calculated to rouse his ire, he unlocked the cellar door in a twinkling, and dragged his rebellious apprentice out, by the collar. Oliver's clothes had been torn in the beating he had received, his face was bruised and scratched, and his hair scattered over his forehead. The angry flush had not disappeared, however, and when he was pulled out of his prison, he scowled boldly on Noah, and looked quite undismayed. "'Now you are a nice young fellow, ain't you?' said sowerberry giving oliver a shake and a box on the ear he called my mother names replied oliver well and what if he did you little ungrateful wretch said mrs sowerberry she deserved what he said and worse she didn't said oliver she did said mrs sowerberry it's a lie said oliver mrs sowerberry burst into a flood of tears this flood of tears left mr sowerberry no alternative if he had hesitated for one instant to punish oliver most severely it must be quite clear to every experienced reader that he would have been according to all precedents in disputes of matrimony established a brute an unnatural husband an insulting creature a base imitation of a man and various other agreeable characters too numerous for recital within the limits of this chapter to do him justice he was as far as his power went it was not very extensive kindly disposed towards the boy perhaps it because it was his interest to be so perhaps because his wife disliked him the flood of tears however left him no resource so he at once gave him a drubbing which satisfied even mrs sowerberry herself and rendered mr bumble's subsequent application of the parochial cane rather unnecessary for the rest of the day he was shut up in the back kitchen in company with a pump and a slice of bread and at night mrs sowerberry after making various remarks outside the door by no means complimentary to the memory of his mother looked into the room and amidst the jeers and pointing of noah and charlotte ordered him upstairs to his dismal bed it was not until he was left alone in the silence and stillness of the gloomy workshop of the undertaker that oliver gave way to the feelings which the day's treatment may be supposed likely to have awakened in a mere child he had listened to their taunts with a look of contempt he had borne the lash without a cry for he felt that pride swelling in his heart which would have kept down a shriek to the last though they had roasted him alive but now when there were none to see or hear him he fell upon his knees on the floor and hiding his face in his hands wept such tears as god send for the credit of our nature few so young may ever have cause to pour out before him for a long time oliver remained motionless in this attitude the candle was burning low in the socket when he rose to his feet having gazed cautiously round him and listened intently he gently undid the fastenings of the door and looked abroad it was a cold dark night the stars seemed to the boy's eyes farther from the earth than he had ever seen them before there was no wind and the somber shadows thrown by the trees upon the ground looked sepulchral and death-like from being so still he softly reclosed the door having availed himself of the expiring light of the candle to tie up in a handkerchief the few articles of wearing apparel he had sat himself down upon a bench to wait for morning with the first ray of light that struggled through the crevices in the shutters, Oliver arose and again unbarred the door. One timid look around, one moment's pause of hesitation, he had closed it behind him, and was in the open street. He looked to the right and to the left, uncertain whither to fly. He remembered to have seen the wagons, as they went out, toiling up the hill. 
he took the same route and arriving at a footpath across the fields which he knew after some distance led out again into the road struck into it and walked quickly on along this same footpath oliver well remembered he had trotted beside mr bumble when he first carried him from the workhouse to the farm his way lay directly in front of the cottage his heart beat quickly when he bethought himself of this and he half resolved to turn back he had come a long way though and should lose a great deal of time by doing so besides it was so early that there was very little fear of his being seen and so he walked on he reached the house there was no appearance of its inmates stirring at that early hour oliver stopped and peeped into the garden a child was weeding one of the little beds as he stopped he raised his pale face and disclosed the features of one of his former companions oliver felt glad to see him before he went for though younger than himself he had been his little friend and playmate they had been beaten and starved and shut up together many and many a time hush dick said oliver as the boy ran to the gate and thrust his thin arm between the rails to greet him is any one up nobody but me replied the child you mustn't say you saw me dick said oliver i'm running away they beat and ill-use me dick and i'm going to seek my fortune some long way off i don't know where how pale you are i heard the doctor tell him i was dying replied the child with a faint smile i am very glad to see you dear but don't stop don't stop yes yes i will to say good-bye to you replied oliver i shall see you again dick i know i shall you will be well and happy i hope so replied the child after i am dead but not before i know the doctor must be right oliver because i dream so much of heaven and angels and kind faces that i never see when i am awake kiss me said the child climbing up the low gate and flinging his little arms round oliver's neck good-bye dear oh god bless you the blessing was from a young child's lips but it was the first that oliver had ever heard invoked upon his head and through the struggles and sufferings and troubles and changes of his afterlife he never once forgot it end of chapter seven chapter eight of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter eight oliver walks to london he encounters a strange sort of young gentleman oliver reached the stile at which the bypath terminated and once more gained the high road it was eight o'clock now though he was nearly five miles away from the town he ran and hid behind the hedges by turns till noon fearing that he might be pursued and overtake him then he sat down to rest by the side of the milestone and began to think for the first time where he had better go and try to live the stone by which he was seated bore in large characters an intimation that it was just seventy miles from that spot to london the name awakened a new train of ideas in the boy's mind london that great place nobody not even mr bumble could ever find him there he had often heard the old men in the workhouse too say that no lad of spirit need want in london and that there were ways of living in that vast city which those who had been bred up in country parts had no idea of it was the very place for a homeless boy who must die in the streets unless some one helped him as these things passed through his thoughts he jumped upon his feet and again walked forward he had diminished the distance between himself and london by full four miles more before he recollected how much he must undergo ere he could hope to reach his place of destination as this consideration forced itself upon him he slackened his pace a little and meditated upon his means of getting there he had a crust of bread a coarse shirt and two pairs of stockings in his bundle he had a penny too a gift of sourberries after some funeral in which he had acquitted himself more than ordinarily well in his pocket a clean shirt thought oliver is a very comfortable thing and so are two pairs of darned stockings and so is a penny but they're small helps to a sixty-five miles walk in winter time but oliver's thoughts like those of most other people although they were extremely ready and active to point out his difficulties were wholly at a loss to suggest any feasible mode of surmounting them so after a good deal of thinking to no particular purpose he changed his little bundle over to the other shoulder and trudged on 
oliver walked twenty miles that day and all the time tasted nothing but the crust of dry bread and a few draughts of water which he begged at the cottage doors by the roadside when the night came he turned into a meadow and creeping close under a hayrick determined to lie there till morning he felt frightened at first for the wind moaned dismally over the empty fields and he was cold and hungry and more alone than he had ever felt before being very tired with his walk however he soon fell asleep and forgot his troubles he felt cold and stiff when he got up next morning and so hungry that he was obliged to exchange the penny for a small loaf in the very first village through which he passed he had walked no more than twelve miles when night closed in again his feet were sore and his legs so weak that they trembled beneath him another night passed in the bleak damp air made him worse when he set forward on his journey next morning he could hardly crawl along he waited at the bottom of a steep hill till a stage-coach came up and then begged of the outside passengers but there were very few who took any notice of him and even those told him to wait till they got to the top of the hill and then let them see how far he could run for a halfpenny poor oliver tried to keep up with the coach a little way but was unable to do it by reason of his fatigue and sore feet when the outsides saw this they put their halfpence back into their pockets again declaring that he was an idle young dog and didn't deserve anything and the coach rattled away and left only a cloud of dust behind in some villages large painted boards were fixed up warning all persons who begged within the district that they would be sent to jail this frightened oliver very much and made him glad to get out of those villages with all possible expedition in others he would stand about the inn yards and look mournfully at every one who passed a proceeding which generally terminated in the landlady's ordering one of the post-boys who were lounging about to drive that strange boy out of the place for she was sure he had come to steal something if he begged at a farmer's house ten to one but they threatened to set the dog on him and when he showed his nose in a shop they talked about the beetle which brought oliver's heart into his mouth very often the only thing he had there for many hours together in fact if it had not been for a good-hearted turnpike man and a benevolent old lady oliver's troubles would have been shortened by the very same process which had put an end to his mother's in other words he would most assuredly have fallen dead upon the king's highway but the turnpike man gave him a meal of bread and cheese and the old lady who had a shipwrecked grandson wandering barefoot in some distant part of the earth took pity upon the poor orphan and gave him what little she could afford and more with such kind and gentle words and such tears of sympathy and compassion that they sank deeper into oliver's soul than all the sufferings he had ever undergone early on the seventh morning after he had left his native place oliver limped slowly into the little town of barnett the window shutters were closed the street was empty not a soul had awakened to the business of the day the sun was rising in all its splendid beauty but the light only served to show the boy his own lonesomeness and desolation as he sat with bleeding feet covered up with dust upon a doorstep by degrees the shutters were opened the window blinds were drawn up and people began passing to and fro some few stopped to gaze at oliver for a moment or two or turned round to stare at him as they hurried by but none relieved him or troubled themselves to inquire how he came there he had no heart to beg and there he sat he had been crouching on the step for some time wondering at the great number of public houses every other house in barnet was a tavern large or small gazing listlessly at the coaches as they passed through and thinking how strange it seemed that they could do with ease in a few hours what had taken him a whole week of courage and determination beyond his years to accomplish when he was aroused by observing that a boy who had passed him carelessly some minutes before had returned and was now surveying him most earnestly from the opposite side of the way he took little heed of this at first but the boy remained in the same attitude of close observation so long that oliver raised his head and returned his steady look upon this the boy crossed over and walking close up to oliver said hello my covey what's the row the boy who addressed this inquiry to the young wayfarer was about his own age but one of the queerest looking boys that oliver had ever seen he was snub-nosed flat-browed common-faced boy enough and as dirty a juvenile as one would wish to see but he had about him all the airs and manners of a man he was short of his age with rather bow legs and little sharp ugly eyes his hat was stuck on the top of his head so lightly that it threatened to fall off every moment and would have done so very often if the wearer had not had a knack of every now and then giving his head a sudden twitch which brought it back to its old place again he wore a man's coat which reached nearly to his heels 
He had turned the cuffs back, halfway up his arm, to get his hands out of the sleeves, apparently with the ultimate view of thrusting them into the pockets of his corduroy trousers, for there he kept them. He was altogether as roistering and swaggering a young gentleman as ever stood four feet six, or something less, in the blutchers. "'Hello, my covey, what's the row?' said this strange young gentleman to Oliver. "'I am very hungry and tired,' replied Oliver, the tears standing in his eyes as he spoke. "'I have walked a long way. I have been walking these seven days.' "'Walking for seven days?' said the young gentleman. "'Oh, I see. Big soda, eh? But—' he added, noticing Oliver's look of surprise. "'I suppose you don't know what a beak is, my flash companion.' Oliver mildly replied that he had always heard a bird's mouth described by the term in question. "'My eyes are green!' exclaimed the young gentleman. "'Why, a beak's a mad straight, and when you walk by a beak's order, it's not straightforward, but always going up and never coming down again. Was he never on the mill?' "'What mill?' inquired Oliver. "'What mill? Why, the mill! The mill as takes up so little room that it'll work inside a stone jug, and always go better when the wind's low with people than when it's high. Of course, then they can't get workmen. "'But come,' said the young gentleman. "'You won't grub, and you shall have it. I'm at low water mark myself. Only one bob and a magpie. But, as far as it goes, I'll fork cut and stump. Up with you on your pins. There. Now then, Morris!' Assisting Oliver to rise, the young gentleman took him to an adjacent chandler's shop, where he purchased a sufficiency of ready-dressed ham and a half-quartern loaf, or as he himself expressed it, a four-penny bran, the ham being kept clean and preserved from dust by the ingenious expedient of making a hole in the loaf by pulling out a portion of the crumb and stuffing it therein. Taking the bread under his arm, the young gentleman turned into a small public house and led the way to a tap-room in the rear of the premises. Here a pot of beer was brought in by the direction of the mysterious youth, and Oliver, falling to at his new friend's bidding, made a long and hearty meal, during the progress of which the strange boy eyed him from time to time with great attention. "'Going to London?' said the strange boy, when Oliver had at length concluded. "'Yes.' "'Got any lodgings?' "'No.' "'Money?' "'No.' The strange boy whistled, and put his arms into his pockets as far as the big coat-sleeves would let them go. "'Do you live in London?' inquired Oliver. "'Yes, I do, when I'm at home,' replied the boy. "'I suppose you want some place to sleep in tonight, don't you?' "'I do, indeed,' answered Oliver. "'I have not slept under a roof since I left the country.' "'Don't fret your eyelids on that score,' said the young gentleman. "'I've got to be in London tonight, and I know a respectable old gentleman as lives there, what will give you lodgings for nothing, and never ask for the change, that is, if any gentleman he knows introduces you. And don't he know me? Oh, no, not in the least. By no means.' "'Certainly not.' The young gentleman smiled, as if to intimate that the latter fragments of discourse were playfully ironical, and finished the beer as he did so. This unexpected offer of shelter was too tempting to be resisted, especially as it was immediately followed up, by the assurance that the old gentleman referred to would doubtless provide Oliver with a comfortable place without loss of time. This led to a more friendly and confidential dialogue, from which Oliver discovered that his friend's name was Jack Dawkins, and that he was a peculiar pet and protégé of the elderly gentleman before mentioned. Mr. Dawkins' appearance did not say a vast deal in favor of the comfort which his patron's interest obtained for those whom he took under his protection, but, as he had a rather flighty and dissolute mode of conversing, and furthermore avowed that among his intimate friends he was better known by the sobriquet of the artful dodger oliver concluded that being of a dissipated and careless turn the moral precepts of his benefactor had hitherto been thrown away upon him under this impression he secretly resolved to cultivate the good opinion of the old gentleman as quickly as possible and if he found the dodger incorrigible as he more than half suspected he should to decline the honour of his farther acquaintance as john dawkins objected to their entering london before nightfall it was nearly eleven o'clock when they reached the turnpike at islington they crossed from the angel into st john's road struck down the small street which terminates at sadler's wells theatre through exmouth street and coppice row down the little court by the side of the workhouse across the classic ground which once bore the name of hockley in the hole thence into little saffron hill and so into saffron hill the great along which the dodger scudded at a rapid pace directing oliver to follow close at his heels 
although oliver had enough to occupy his attention in keeping sight of his leader he could not help bestowing a few hasty glances on either side of the way as he passed along a dirtier or more wretched place he had never seen the street was very narrow and muddy and the air was impregnated with filthy odors there were a good many small shops but the only stock in trade appeared to be heaps of children who even at that time of night were crawling in and out at the doors or screaming from the inside the sole places that seemed to prosper amid the general blight of the place were the public houses and in them the lowest orders of irish were wrangling with might and main covered ways and yards which here and there diverged from the main street disclosed little knots of houses where drunken men and women were positively wallowing in filth and from several of the doorways great ill-looking fellows were cautiously emerging bound to all appearance on no very well-disposed or harmless errands oliver was just considering whether he hadn't better run away when they reached the bottom of the hill his conductor catching him by the arm pushed open the door of a house near field lane and drawing him into the passage closed it behind them now then cried a voice from below in reply to a whistle from the dodger plummy and slam was the reply this seemed to be some watchword or signal that all was right for the light of a feeble candle gleamed on the wall at the remote end of the passage and a man's face peeped out from where a balustrade of the old kitchen staircase had been broken away there's two on ya said the man thrusting the candle farther out and shielding his eyes with his hand who's the t'other one i know pal replied jack dawkins pulling oliver forward where did he come from greenland is fagin upstairs yeah he's assaulting the wipes up with ya the candle was drawn back and the face disappeared oliver groping his way with one hand and having the other firmly grasped by his companion ascended with much difficulty the dark and broken stairs which his conductor mounted with an ease and expedition that showed he was well acquainted with them he threw open the door of a back room and drew oliver in after him the walls and ceiling of the room were perfectly black with age and dirt there was a deal table before the fire upon which were a candle stuck in a ginger beer bottle two or three pewter pots a loaf and butter and a plate in a frying pan which was on the fire and which was secured to the mantel shelf by a string some sausages were cooking and standing over them with a toasting fork in his hand was a very old shriveled jew whose villainous looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair he was dressed in a greasy flannel gown with his throat bare and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying pan and the clothes horse over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging several rough beds made of old sacks were huddled side by side on the floor seated round the table were four or five boys none older than the dodger smoking long clay pipes and drinking spirits with the air of middle-aged men these all crowded about their associate as he whispered a few words to the jew and then turned round and grinned at oliver so did the jew himself toasting fork in hand this is him fagin said jack dawkins my friend hold of a twist the jew grinned and making a low obeisance to oliver took him by the hand and hoped he should have the honour of his intimate acquaintance upon this the young gentleman with the pipes came round him and shook both his hands very hard especially the one in which he held his little bundle one young gentleman was very anxious to hang up his cap for him and another was so obliging as to put his hands in his pockets in order that as he was very tired he might not have the trouble of emptying them himself when he went to bed these civilities would probably be extended much farther but for a liberal exercise of the jews toasting fork on the heads and shoulders of the affectionate youths who offered them we are very glad to see you oliver very said the jew dodger take off the sausages and draw a tub near the fire for oliver you are staring at the pocket handkerchiefs eh my dear there are a good many of em ain't there we've just looked them out ready for the wash that's all oliver that's all <laughs> the latter part of this speech was hailed by a boisterous shout from all the hopeful pupils of the merry old gentleman in the midst of which they went to supper oliver ate his share and the jew then mixed him a glass of hot gin and water telling him he must drink it off directly because another gentleman wanted the tumbler oliver did as he was desired immediately afterwards he felt himself gently lifted on to one of the sacks and then he sunk into a deep sleep End of chapter 8
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 9 containing further particulars concerning the pleasant old gentleman and his hopeful pupils it was late next morning when oliver awoke from a sound long sleep there was no other person in the room but the old jew who was boiling some coffee in a saucepan for breakfast and whistling softly to himself as he stirred it round and round with an iron spoon he would stop every now and then to listen when there was the least noise below and when he had satisfied himself he would go on whistling and stirring again as before Although Oliver had roused himself from sleep, he was not thoroughly awake. There is a drowsy state, between sleeping and waking, when you dream more in five minutes with your eyes half open, and yourself half conscious of everything that is passing around you, than you would in five nights with your eyes fast closed, and your senses wrapped in perfect unconsciousness. At such time a mortal knows just enough of what his mind is doing to form some glimmering conception of its mighty powers, its bounding from earth and spurning time and space, when freed from the restraint of its corporeal associate. Oliver was precisely in this condition. He saw the Jew with his half-closed eyes, heard his low whistling, and recognized the sound of the spoon grating against the saucepan's sides and yet the self-same senses were mentally engaged at the same time in busy action with almost everybody he had ever known when the coffee was done the jew drew the saucepan to the hob standing then in an irresolute attitude for a few minutes as if he did not well know how to employ himself he turned round and looked at oliver and called him by his name he did not answer and was to all appearances asleep after satisfying himself upon this head the jew stepped gently to the door which he fastened he then drew forth, as it seemed to Oliver, from some trap in the floor, a small box, which he placed carefully on the table. His eyes glistened as he raised the lid and looked in. Dragging an old chair to the table, he sat down and took from it a magnificent gold watch, sparkling with jewels. Aha! Uh -huh. said the Jew, shrugging up his shoulders and distorting every feature with a hideous grin. Clever dogs! Clever dogs! Staunch to the last! Never told the old parson where they were! They were poached upon old Fagin. And why should they? It wouldn't have loosened the knot, or kept the drop up a minute longer. No, no, no. Fine fellows. Fine fellows. With these and other muttered reflections of the like nature, the Jew once more deposited the watch in its place of safety. At least a half a dozen more were severally drawn forth from the same box and surveyed with equal pleasure, besides rings, brooches, bracelets, and other articles of jewelry, of such magnificent materials and costly workmanship that Oliver had no idea even of their names. Having replaced these trinkets, the Jew took out another, so small that it lay in the palm of his hand. There seemed to be some very minute inscription on it, for the Jew laid it flat upon the table and shading it with his hand poured over it long and earnestly at length he put it down as if despairing of success and leaning back in his chair muttered what a fine thing capital punishment is dead men never repent dead men never bring awkward stories to light ah it's a fine thing for the trade five of em strung up in a row and none left to play booty or turn white-livered as the Jew uttered these words, his bright, dark eyes, which had been staring vacantly before him, fell on Oliver's face. The boy's eyes were fixed on his in mute curiosity, and although the recognition was only for an instant, for the briefest space of time that can possibly be conceived, it was enough to show the old man that he had been observed. He closed the lid of the box with a loud crash, and laying his hand on a bread knife which was on the table, started furiously up. He trembled very much, though, for even in his terror, Oliver could see that the knife quivered in the air. "'What's that?' said the Jew. "'What do you watch me for? Why are you awake? What have you seen? Speak out, boy, quick! Quick for your life!' "'I wasn't able to sleep any longer, sir,' replied Oliver meekly. "'I am very sorry if I have disturbed you, sir.' "'You were not awake an hour ago,' said the Jew, scowling fiercely on the boy. "'No, no, indeed,' replied Oliver. "'Are you sure?' cried the Jew, with a still fiercer look than before, and a threatening attitude. "'Upon my word, I was not, sir,' replied Oliver earnestly. "'I was not, indeed, sir.' "'Tush, tush, my dear,' 
said the jew abruptly resuming his old manner and playing with the knife a little before he laid it down as if to induce the belief that he had caught it up in mere sport of course i knew that my dear i only tried to frighten you you're a brave boy <laughs> you're a brave boy oliver the jew rubbed his hands with a chuckle but glanced uneasily at the box notwithstanding did you see any of these pretty things my dear said the jew laying his hand upon it after a short pause yes sir replied oliver ah said the jew turning rather pale they they're mine oliver my little property all i have to live on in me old age the folks call me a miser my dear only a miser that's all oliver thought the old gentleman must be a decided miser to live in such a dirty place with so many watches but thinking that perhaps his fondness for the dodger and the other boys cost him a good deal of money he only cast a deferential look at the jew and asked if he might get up certainly my dear certainly replied the old gentleman stay there's a pitcher of water in the corner by the door bring it here and i'll give you a basin to wash in my dear oliver got up walked across the room and stooped for an instant to raise the pitcher when he turned his head the box was gone he had scarcely washed himself and made everything tidy by emptying the basin out of the window agreeably to the jew's directions when the dodger returned accompanied by a very sprightly young friend whom oliver had seen smoking on the previous night and who was now formally introduced to him as charlie bates the four sat down to breakfast on the coffee and some hot rolls and ham which the dodger had brought home in the crown of his hat well said the jew glancing slyly at oliver and addressing himself to the dodger i hope you've been hard at work this morning my dears hard replied the dodger a snails added charlie bates good boys good boys said the jew what have you got dodger couple of pocket-books replied that young gentleman blind inquired the jew with eagerness pretty well replied the dodger producing two pocket-books one green and the other red not so heavy as they might be said the jew after looking at the insides carefully very neat and nicely made ingenious workman ain't he oliver very indeed sir said oliver at which mr charles bates laughed uproariously very much to the amazement of oliver who saw nothing to laugh at in anything that had passed and what have you got my dear said fagin to charlie bates wops replied master bates at the same time producing four pocket handkerchiefs well said the jew inspecting them closely the very good ones very you haven't marked them well though charlie so the marks shall be picked out with a needle and we'll teach oliver how to do it shall us oliver eh ha 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 if you please sir said oliver you'd like to be able to make pocket handkerchiefs as easy as charlie bates wouldn't you my dear said the jew very much indeed if you'll teach me sir replied oliver Master Bates saw something so exquisitely ludicrous in this reply that he burst into another laugh, which laugh, meeting the coffee he was drinking and carrying it down some wrong channel, very nearly terminated in his premature suffocation. "'He's so jolly green,' said Charlie when he recovered, as an apology to the company for his unpolite behavior. The Dodger said nothing, but he smoothed Oliver's hair over his eyes and said he'd know better by and by, upon which the old gentleman, observing Oliver's color mounting, changed the subject by asking whether there had been much of a crowd at the execution that morning. This made him wonder more and more, for it was plain from the replies of the two boys that they had both been there, and Oliver naturally wondered how they could possibly have found time to be so very industrious. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman, placing a snuff-box in one pocket of his trousers, a note-case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket, with a guard-chain round his neck, and sticking a mock diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tight round him, and putting his spectacle-case and handkerchief in his pockets, trotted up and down the room with a stick in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets at any hour in the day sometimes he stopped at the fireplace and sometimes at the door making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop windows at such times he would look constantly round him for fear of thieves and would keep slapping at his pockets in turn to see that he hadn't lost anything in such a very funny and natural manner that oliver laughed to the tears ran down his face all this time the two boys followed him closely about getting out of his sight so nimbly every time he turned around that it was impossible to follow their motions 
at last the dodger trod upon his toes or ran upon his boot accidentally while charlie bates stumbled up against him from behind and in that one moment they took from him with the most extraordinary rapidity snuff-box note-case watch-guard chain shirt-pin pocket-handkerchief even the spectacle-case if the old gentleman felt a hand in any one of his pockets he cried out where it was and then the game began all over again when this game had been played a great many times a couple young ladies called to see the young gentleman one of whom was named bet and the other nancy they wore a good deal of hair not very neatly turned up behind and were rather untidy about the shoes and stockings they were not exactly pretty perhaps but they had a great deal of color in their faces and looked quite stout and hardy being remarkably free and agreeable in their manners oliver thought them very nice girls indeed as there is no doubt they were the visitors stopped a long time spirits were produced in consequence of one of the young ladies complaining of a coldness in her inside and the conversation took a very convivial and improving turn at length charlie bates expressed his opinion that it was time to pad the hoof this it occurred to oliver must be french for going out for directly afterwards the dodger and charlie and the two young ladies went away having been kindly furnished by the amiable old jew with money to spend there my dear said fagin that's a pleasant life isn't it they've gone out for the day have they done work sir inquired oliver yes said the jew that is unless they should unexpectedly come across any when they're out and they won't neglect it if they do my dear depend on it make him your models my dear make him your models tapping the fire shovel on the hearth to add force to his words everything they bid you and take their advice in all matters especially the dodgers my dear he'll be a great man himself and he'll make you one too if you pattern by him is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket my dear said the jew stopping short yes sir said oliver see if you can take it out without my feeling it as you saw them do when you were at play this morning oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand as he had seen the dodger hold it and drew the handkerchief lightly out of it with the other is it gone cried the jew here it is sir said oliver showing it in his hand you're a clever boy my dear said the playful old gentleman patting oliver on the head approvingly i never saw a sharper lad here's a shilling for you if you go on this way you'll be the greatest man of all time and now come here i'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man but thinking that the jew being so much his senior must know best he followed him quietly to the table and was soon deeply involved in his new study End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Ten. Oliver becomes better acquainted with the characters of his new associates and purchases experience at a height price, being a short but very important chapter in this history for many days oliver remained in the jew's room picking the marks out of the pocket handkerchief of which a great number were brought home and sometimes taking part in the game already described which the two boys and the jew played regularly every morning at length he began to languish for fresh air and took many occasions of earnestly entreating the old gentleman to allow him to go out to work with his two companions oliver was rendered the more anxious to be actively employed by what he had seen of the stern morality of the old gentleman's character whenever the dodger or charlie bates came home at night empty-handed he would expatiate with great vehemence on the misery of idle and lazy habits and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed on one occasion indeed he even went so far as to knock them both down a flight of stairs but this was carrying out his virtuous precepts to an unusual extent at length one morning oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought there had been no handkerchiefs to work upon for two or three days and the dinners had been rather meagre perhaps these were reasons for the gentleman's giving his assent but whether they were or no he told oliver he might go and placed him under the joint guardianship of charlie bates and his friend the dodger the three boys sallied out the dodger with his coat sleeves tucked up and his hat cocked as usual 
master bates sauntering along with his hands in his pockets and oliver between them wondering where they were going and what branch of manufacture he would be instructed in first the pace at which they went was such a very lazy ill-looking saunter that oliver soon began to think his companions were going to deceive the old gentleman by not going to work at all the dodger had a vicious propensity too of pulling the caps from the heads of small boys and tossing them down areas while charlie bates exhibited some very loose notions concerning the rights of property by pilfering divers apples and onions from the stalls at the kennel sides and thrusting them into pockets which were so surprisingly capacious that they seemed to undermine his whole suit of clothes in every direction these things looked so bad that oliver was on the point of declaring his attention of seeking his way back in the best way he could when his thoughts were suddenly directed into another channel by a very mysterious change of behavior on the part of the dodger they were just emerging from a narrow court not far from the open square in clerkenwell which is yet called by some strange perversion of terms the green when the dodger made a sudden stop and laying his finger on his lip drew his companions back again with the greatest caution and circumspection what's the matter demanded oliver push replied the dodger did you see that old cove at the bookstall the old gentleman over the way said oliver yes i see him he'll do said the dodger a prime plant observed master charlie bates oliver looked from one to the other with the greatest surprise but he was not permitted to make any inquiries for the two boys walked stealthily across the road and slunk close behind the old gentleman towards whom his attention had been directed oliver walked a few paces after them and not knowing whether to advance or retire stood looking on in silent amazement the old gentleman was a very respectable looking personage with a powdered head and gold spectacles he was dressed in a bottle green coat with a black velvet collar wore white trousers and carried a smart bamboo cane under his arm he had taken up a book from the stall and there he stood reading away as hard as if he were in his elbow chair in his own study it is very possible that he fancied himself there indeed for it was plain from his abstraction that he saw not the book stall nor the street nor the boys nor in short anything but the book itself which he was reading straight through turning over the leaf when he got to the bottom of a page beginning at the top line of the next one and going regularly on with the greatest interest and eagerness what was oliver's horror and alarm as he stood a few paces off looking on with his eyelids as wide open as they would possibly go to see the dodger plunge his hand into the old gentleman's pocket and draw from thence a handkerchief to see him hand the same to charlie bates and finally to behold them both running away round the corner at full speed in an instant the whole mystery of the handkerchiefs and the watches and the jewels and the jew rushed upon the boy's mind he stood for a moment with the blood so tingling through all his veins from terror that he felt as if he were in a burning fire then confused and frightened he took to his heels and not knowing what he did made off as fast as he could lay his feet to the ground this was all done in a minute's space in the very instance when oliver began to run the old gentleman putting his hand to his pocket and missing his handkerchief turned sharp round seeing the boy scudding away at such a rapid pace he very naturally concluded him to be the depredator and shouting stop thief with all his might made off after him book in hand but the old gentleman was not the only person who raised the hue and cry the dodger and master bates unwilling to attract public attention by running down the open street had merely retired into the very first doorway round the corner they no sooner heard the cry and saw oliver running than guessing exactly how the matter stood they issued forth with great promptitude and shouting stop, stop thief! thief too joined in the pursuit like good citizens although oliver had been brought up by philosophers he was not theoretically acquainted with the beautiful axiom that self-preservation is the first law of nature if he had been perhaps he would have been prepared for this not being prepared however it alarmed him the more so away he went like the wind with the old gentleman and the two boys roaring and shouting behind him stop, stop, thief! Thief! stop, stop, thief! stop thief! there is magic in the sound the tradesman leaves his counter and the carman his wagon the butcher throws down his tray the baker his basket the milkman his pail the errand boy his parcels the schoolboy his marbles the pavior his pickaxe the child his battle door away they run pell-mell helter-skelter slap-dash tearing yelling screaming knocking down the passengers as they turn the corners 
rousing up the dogs and astonishing the fowls and streets squares and courts re-echo with the sound stop, stop, thief. Thief. stop, stop thief. thief stop thief the cry is taken up by a hundred voices and the crowd accumulate at every turning away they fly splashing through the mud and rattling along the pavements up go the windows out run the people onward bear the mob a whole audience desert punch in the very thickest of the plot and joining the rushing throng swell the shout and lend fresh vigor to the cry there is a passion for hunting something deeply implanted in the human breast one wretched breathless child panting with exhaustion terror in his looks agony in his eyes large drops of perspiration streaming down his face strains every nerve to make head upon his pursuers and as they follow on his track and gain upon him every instant they hail his decreasing strength with joy stop, stop him please. ay stop him for god's sake were it only in mercy stopped at last a clever blow he is down upon the pavement and the crowd eagerly gather round him each newcomer jostling and struggling with the others to catch a glimpse stand aside give him a little air nonsense he doesn't deserve where's it. the gentleman here he is coming down Make the street room there for the gentleman is this the boy sir yes oliver lay covered with mud and dust and bleeding from the mouth looking wildly round upon the heap of faces that surrounded him when the old gentleman was officiously dragged and pushed into the circle by the foremost of the pursuers yes said the gentleman i am afraid it is the boy afraid, afraid murmured the crowd that's a good un poor fellow said the gentleman he has hurt himself i did that sir said a great lubberly fellow stepping forward and precisely i cut my knuckle agin his mouth i stopped him sir the fellow touched his hat with a grin expecting something for his pains but the old gentleman eyeing him with an expression of dislike looked anxiously round as if he contemplated running away himself which it is very possible he might have attempted to do and thus have afforded another chase had not a police officer who is generally the last person to arrive in such cases at that moment made his way through the crowd and seized oliver by the collar come get up said the man roughly it wasn't me indeed sir indeed indeed it was two other boys said oliver clasping his hands passionately and looking round uh, they're here somewhere oh no they ain't said the officer he meant this to be ironical but it was true besides for the dodger and charlie bates had filed off down the first convenient court they came to come get up don't hurt him said the old gentleman compassionately oh no i won't hurt him replied the officer tearing his jacket half off his back in proof thereof come i know you it won't do who stand upon your legs young devil oliver who could hardly stand made a shift to raise himself on his feet and was at once lugged along the streets by the jacket collar at a rapid pace the gentleman walked on with them by the officer's side and as many of the crowd as could achieve the feat got a little ahead and stared back at oliver from time to time the boys shouted in triumph and on they went end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 11 Treats of Mr. Fang the Police Magistrate and Furnishes a Slight Specimen of His Mode of Delivering Justice. The offence had been committed within the district, and indeed in the immediate neighborhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets, and down a place called Mutton Hill, when he was led beneath a low archway and up a dirty court into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face and a bunch of keys in his hand. Oh, what's the matter now? said the man carelessly. A young fellow hunter, replied the man who had Oliver in charge. Are you the party that's been robbed, sir? inquired the man with the keys. Yes, I am, replied the old gentleman. But I am not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. I, I would rather not press the case. 
must go before the magistrate now sir replied the man his worship will be disengaged in half a minute now young gallows this was an invitation for oliver to enter through a door which he unlocked as he spoke and which led into a stone cell here he was searched and nothing being found upon him locked up this cell was in shape and size something like an area cellar only not so light it was most intolerably dirty for it was monday morning and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since saturday night but this is little in our station houses men and women are every night confined on the most trivial charges the word is worth noting in dungeons compared with which those in newgate occupied by the most atrocious felons tried found guilty and under the sentence of death are palaces that any one who doubts this compared the two the old gentleman looked almost as rueful as oliver when the key grated in the lock he turned with a sigh to the book which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance there is something in that boy's face said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner something that touches and interests me can he be innocent he looked like a... by the by exclaimed the old gentleman halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky bless my soul where have i seen something like that look before after musing for some minutes the old gentleman walked with the same meditative face into a back anteroom opening from the yard and there retiring into a corner called up before his mind's eye a vast amphitheatre of faces over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years no said the old gentleman shaking his head it must be imagination he wandered over them again he had called them into view and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them there were the faces of friends and foes and of many that had been almost strangers peering intrusively from the crowd there were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women there were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon but which the mind superior to its power still dressed in their old freshness and beauty calling back the luster of the eyes the brightness of the smile the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay and the whispering of beauty beyond the tomb changed but to be heightened and taken from the earth only to be set up as a light to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven but the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which oliver's features bore a trace so he heaved a sigh over the recollections he had awakened and being happily for himself an absent old gentleman buried them again in the pages of the musty book he was roused by a touch on the shoulder and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office he closed his book hastily and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned mr fang the office was a front parlor with a paneled wall mr fang sat behind a bar at the upper end and on one side the door was a sort of wooden pen in which poor little oliver was already deposited trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene mr fang was a lean long-backed stiff-necked middle-sized man with no great quantity of hair and what he had growing on the back and sides of his head his face was stern and much flushed if he were really not in the habit of drinking rather more than was exactly good for him he might have brought action against his countenance for libel and have recovered heavy damages the old gentleman bowed respectfully and advancing to the magistrate's desk said suiting the action to the word that is my name and address sir he then withdrew a pace or two and with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of the head waited to be questioned now it so happened that mr fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in the newspaper of the morning adverting to some recent decision of his and commending him for the three hundred and fiftieth time to the special and particular notice of the secretary of state for the home department he was out of temper and he looked up with an angry scowl who are you said mr fang the old gentleman pointed with some surprise to his card officer said mr fang tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper who is this fellow my name sir said the old gentleman speaking like a gentleman my name sir is brownlow permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to respectable person under the protection of the bench 
saying this mr brownlow looked around the office as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information officer said mr fang throwing the paper on one side what's this fellow charged with he's not charged at all your worship replied the officer he appears against this boy your worship his worship knew this perfectly well but it was a good annoyance and a safe one appears against the boy does he said mr fang surveying mr brownlow contemptuously from head to foot swear him before i am sworn i must beg to say one word said mr brownlow and that is that i really never without actual experience could have believed hold your tongue sir said mr fang peremptorily i will not sir replied the old gentleman hold your tongue this instant or i'll have you turned out of the office said mr fang you're an insolent impertinent fellow how dare you bully a magistrate what exclaimed the old gentleman reddening swear this person said fang to the clerk i'll not hear another word swear him mr brownlow's indignation was greatly roused but reflecting perhaps that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it he suppressed his feelings and submitted to being sworn at once now said fang what's the charge against this boy what have you got to say sir i was standing at a bookstall mr brownlow began hold your tongue sir said mr fang policeman where's the policeman here swear this policeman now policeman what is this the policeman with becoming humility related how he had taken the charge how he had searched oliver and found nothing on his person and how that was all he knew about it are there any witnesses inquired mr fang none your worship replied the policeman mr fang sat silent for some minutes and then turning round to the prosecutor said in a towering passion do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is man or do you not you have been sworn now if you stand there refusing to give evidence i'll punish you for disrespect to the bench i will by by what or by whom nobody knows for the clerk and jailer coughed very loud just at the right moment and the former dropped a heavy book upon the floor thus preventing the word from being heard accidentally of course with many interruptions and repeated insults mr brownlow contrived to state his case observing that in the surprise of the moment he had run after the boy because he had saw him running away and expressing his hope that if the magistrate should believe him although not actually the thief to be connected with the thieves he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow he has been hurt already said the old gentleman in conclusion and i fear he added with great energy looking towards the bar i really fear that he is ill oh yes i dare say said mr fang with a sneer come none of your tricks here you young vagabond they won't do what's your name oliver tried to reply but his tongue failed him he was deadly pale and the whole place seemed turning round and round what's your name you hardened scoundrel demanded mr fang officer what's his name this was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat who was standing by the bar he bent over oliver and repeated the inquiry but finding him really incapable of understanding the question and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more and add to the severity of his sentence he hazarded a guess he says his name's tom white your worship said the kind-hearted thief-taker oh he won't speak out won't he said fang very well very well where does he live where he can your worship replied the officer again pretending to receive oliver's answer has he any parents inquired mr fang he says they died in his infancy your worship replied the officer hazarding the usual reply at this point of the inquiry oliver raised his head and looking round with imploring eyes murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water stuff and nonsense said mr fang don't try to make a fool of me i think he really is ill your worship remonstrated the officer i know better said mr fang take care of him officer said the old gentleman raising his hand instinctively he'll fall down stand away officer cried fang let him if he likes oliver availed himself of the kind permission and fell to the floor in a fainting fit the men in the office looked at each other but no one dared to stir i knew he was shamming said fang as if this were incontestable proof of the fact let him lie there he'll soon be tired of that how do you propose to deal with the case sir inquired the clerk in a low voice summarily replied mr fang 
He stands committed for three months. Hard labour, of course. Clear the office. The door was opened for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry the insensible boy to his cell, when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office and advanced towards the bench. "'Stop! Stop! Don't take him away! For heaven's sake, stop a moment!' cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. Although the presiding genii in such an office as this exercise a summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poorer class, and although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press. Footnote, or were virtually then. Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. What is this? Who is this? Turn this man out. Clear the office, cried Mr. Fang. I will speak, cried the man. I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I keep the bookstore. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir. The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. Swear the man, growled Mr. Fang with a very ill grace. Now, man, what have you got to say? This, said the man. I saw three boys, two others and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way, when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done, and I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it. Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall keeper proceeded to relate, in a more coherent manner, the exact circumstances of the robbery. "'Why didn't you come here before?' said Fang, after a pause. "'I hadn't a soul to mind the shop.' replied the man everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit i could get nobody till five minutes ago and i've run here all the way the prosecutor was reading was he inquired fang after another pause yes replied the man the very book he has in his hand oh that book eh said fang is it paid for no it is not replied the man with a smile dear me i forgot all about it exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently a nice person to prefer a charge against a poor boy said fang with a comical effort to look humane i consider sir that you have obtained possession of that book under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute let this be a lesson to you my man or the law will overtake you yet the boy is discharged clear the office damn me cried the old gentleman, bursting out with the rage he had kept down so long. "'Damn me! I'll—' "'Clear the office,' said the magistrate. "'Officers, do you hear? Clear the office!' The mandate was obeyed, and the indignant Mr. Brownlow was conveyed out, with the book in one hand and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment. Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned, and his temples bathed with water, his face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' said Mr. Brownlow, bending over him. "'Call a coach somebody, pray! Directly!' A coach was obtained, and Oliver having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in and sat himself on the other. "'May I accompany you?' said the bookstall keeper, looking in. "'Bless me! Yes, my dear sir,' said Mr. Brownlow, quickly. "'I forgot you. Dear, dear, I have this unhappy book still. Jump in. Poor fellow. There's no time to lose.' The bookstall keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 12, in which Oliver is taken better care of than he ever was before, and in which the narrative reverts to the merry old gentleman and his youthful friends. The coach rattled away over nearly the same ground as that which Oliver had traversed when he first entered London in company with the Dodger, and turning a different way when it reached the Angel at Islington, 
stopped at length before a neat house in a quiet shady street near pentonville here a bed was prepared without loss of time in which mr brownlow saw his young charge carefully and comfortably deposited and here he was tended with a kindness and solicitude that knew no bounds but for many days oliver remained insensible to all the goodness of his new friends the sun rose and sank and rose and sank again and many times after that and still the boy lay stretched on his uneasy bed dwindling away beneath the dry and wasting heat of fever the worm does not work more surely on the dead body than does this slow creeping fire upon the living frame weak and thin and pallid he awoke at last from what seemed to have been a long and troubled dream feebly raising himself in the bed with his head resting on his trembling arm he looked anxiously round what room is this where have i been brought to said oliver this is not the place i went to sleep in he uttered these words in a feeble voice being very faint and weak but they were overheard at once the curtain at the bed's head was hastily drawn back and a motherly old lady very neatly and precisely dressed rose as she undrew it from an armchair close by in which she had been sitting at needlework hush my dear said the old lady softly you must be very quiet or you will be ill again and you have been very bad as bad as could be pretty nigh lie down again there's a dear with those words the old lady very gently placed oliver's head upon the pillow and smoothing back his hair from his forehead looked so kindly and loving in his face that he could not help placing his little withered hand in hers and drawing it round his neck save us said the old lady with tears in her eyes what a grateful little dear it is pretty creature what would his mother feel if she had sat by him as i have and could see him now perhaps she does see me whispered oliver folding his hands together perhaps she sat by me i almost feel as if she had that was the fever my dear said the old lady mildly i suppose it was replied oliver because heaven is a long way off and they're too happy there to come down to the bedside of a poor boy but if she knew i was ill she must have pitied me even there for she was very ill herself before she died she can't know anything about me though added oliver after a moment's silence if she'd seen me hurt it would have made her sorrowful and her face has always looked sweet and happy when i've dreamed of her the old lady made no reply to this but wiping her eyes first and her spectacles which lay on the counterpane afterwards as if they were part and parcel of those features brought some cool stuff for oliver to drink and then patting him on the cheek told him he must lie very quiet or he would be ill again so oliver kept very still partly because he was anxious to obey the kind old lady in all things and partly to tell the truth because he was completely exhausted with what he had already said he soon fell into a gentle doze from which he was awakened by the light of a candle which being brought near the bed showed him a gentleman with a very large and loud ticking gold watch in his hand who felt his pulse and said he was a great deal better you are a great deal better are you not my dear said the gentleman yes thank you sir replied oliver yes i know you are said the gentleman you're hungry too aren't you no sir answered oliver hmm said the gentleman no i know you're not he is not hungry mrs bedwin said the gentleman looking very wise the old lady made a respectful inclination of the head which seemed to say that she thought the doctor was a very clever man the doctor appeared much of the same opinion himself you feel sleepy don't you my dear said the doctor no sir replied oliver no said the doctor with a very shrewd and satisfied look you're not sleepy nor thirsty are you yes sir rather thirsty answered oliver just as i expected mrs bedwin said the doctor it's very natural that he should be thirsty you may give him a little tea ma'am and some dry toast without any butter don't keep him too warm ma'am but be careful that you don't let him be too cold will you have the goodness the old lady dropped a curtsey the doctor after tasting the cool stuff and expressing a qualified approval of it hurried away his boots creaking in a very important and wealthy manner as he went downstairs oliver dozed off again soon after this when he awoke it was nearly twelve o'clock 
the old lady tenderly bade him good night shortly afterwards and left him in charge of a fat old woman who had just come bringing with her in a little bundle a small prayer book and a large nightcap putting the latter on her head and the former on the table the old woman after telling oliver that she had come to sit up with him drew her chair close to the fire and went off into a series of short naps checkered at frequent intervals with sundry tumblings forward and divers moans and chokings these however had no worse effect than causing her to rub her nose very hard and then fall asleep again and thus the night crept slowly on oliver lay awake for some time counting the little circles of light which the reflection of the rushlight shade threw upon the ceiling or tracing with his languid eyes the intricate pattern of the paper on the wall the darkness and the deep stillness of the room were very solemn as they brought into the boy's mind the thought that death had been hovering there for many days and nights and might yet fill it with the gloom and dread of his awful presence he turned his face upon the pillow and fervently prayed to heaven gradually he fell into that deep tranquil sleep which ease from recent suffering alone imparts that calm and peaceful rest which it is pain to wake from who if this were death would be roused again to all the struggles and turmoils of life to all its cares for the present its anxieties for the future more than all its weary recollections of the past it had been bright day for hours when oliver opened his eyes he felt cheerful and happy the crisis of the disease was safely past he belonged to the world again in three days time he was able to sit in an easy chair well propped up with pillows and as he was still too weak to walk mrs bedwin had him carried downstairs into the little housekeeper's room which belonged to her having him set here by the fireside the good old lady sat herself down too and being in a state of considerable delight at seeing him so much better forthwith began to cry most violently never mind me my dear said the old lady i'm only having a regular good cry there it's all over now and i'm quite comfortable you're very very kind to me ma'am said oliver well never you mind that my dear said the old lady that's got nothing to do with your broth and it's full time you had it for the doctor says mr brownlow may come in to see you this morning and we must get up our best looks because the better we look the more he'll be pleased and with this the old lady applied herself to warming up in a little saucepan a basin full of broth strong enough oliver thought to furnish an ample dinner when reduced to the regulation strength for three hundred and fifty paupers at the lowest computation are you fond of pictures dear inquired the old lady seeing that oliver had fixed his eyes most intently on a portrait which hung against the wall just opposite his chair i don't quite know ma'am said oliver without taking his eyes from the canvas i've seen so few that i hardly know what a beautiful mild face that lady's is ah uh, said the old lady painters always make ladies out prettier than they are or they wouldn't get any custom child the man that invented the machine for taking likenesses might have known that would never succeed <laughs> it's a deal too honest <laughs> a deal said the old lady laughing very heartily at her own acuteness is is that a likeness ma'am said oliver yes said the old lady looking up for a moment from the broth that's a portrait whose ma'am asked oliver why really my dear i i don't know answered the old lady in a good-humoured manner it's not a likeness of anybody that you or i know i expect it seems to strike your fancy dear it's so pretty replied oliver why sure you're not afraid of it said the old lady observing in great surprise the look of awe with which the child regarded the painting oh no no returned oliver quickly but the eyes look so sorrowful and where i sit they seem fixed upon me it makes my heart beat added oliver in a low voice as if it was alive and wanted to speak to me but couldn't lord save us exclaimed the old lady starting don't talk in that way child you're weak and nervous after your illness let me wheel your chair round to the other side and then you won't see it there said the old lady suiting the action to the word you don't see it now at all events oliver did see it in his mind's eye as distinctly as if he had not altered his position but he thought it better not to worry the kind old lady so he smiled gently when she looked at him 
and mrs bedwin satisfied that he felt more comfortable salted and broke bits of toasted bread into the broth with all the bustle befitting so solemn a preparation oliver got through it with extraordinary expedition he had scarcely swallowed the last spoonful when there came a soft rap at the door come in said the old lady and in walked mr brownlow now the old gentleman came in as brisk as need be but he had no sooner raised his spectacles on his forehead and thrust his hands behind the skirts of his dressing-gown to take a good long look at oliver than his countenance underwent a very great variety of odd contortions oliver looked very worn and shadowy from sickness and made an ineffectual attempt to stand up out of respect to his benefactor which terminated in his sinking back into the chair again and the fact is if the truth must be told that mr brownlow's heart being large enough for any six ordinary old gentlemen of humane disposition forced a supply of tears into his eyes by some hydraulic process which we are not sufficiently philosophical to be in a condition to explain poor boy poor boy said mr brownlow clearing his throat <clears throat> i'm rather hoarse this morning mrs bedwin i'm afraid i have caught cold i hope not sir said mrs bedwin everything you have had has been well aired sir i don't know bedwin i don't know said mr brownlow i rather think i had a damp napkin at dinner time yesterday uh, but never mind that how do you feel my dear very happy sir replied oliver and very grateful indeed sir for your goodness to me good boy said mr brownlow stoutly have you given him any nourishment bedwin any slops eh he has just had a basin of beautiful strong broth sir replied mrs bedwin drawing herself up slightly and laying strong emphasis on the last word to intimate that between slops and broth well compounded there existed no affinity or connection whatsoever <clears throat> said mr brownlow with a slight shudder a couple of glasses of port wine would have done him a great deal more good wouldn't they tom white eh my name's oliver sir replied the little invalid with a look of great astonishment oliver said mr brownlow oliver what oliver white eh no sir twist oliver twist queer name said the old gentleman what made you tell the magistrate your name was white i never told him so sir returned oliver in amazement this sounded so like a falsehood that the old gentleman looked somewhat sternly in oliver's face it was impossible to doubt him there was truth in every one of its thin and sharpened lineaments some mistake said mr brownlow but although his motive for looking steadily at oliver no longer existed the old idea of the resemblance between his features and some familiar face came upon him so strongly that he could not withdraw his gaze i hope you're not angry with me sir said oliver raising his eyes beseechingly no no replied the old gentleman why what's this bedwin look here as he spoke he pointed hastily to the picture over oliver's head and then to the boy's face there was its living copy the eyes the head the mouth every feature was the same the expression was for the instant so precisely alike that the minutest line seemed copied with startling accuracy oliver knew not the cause of this sudden exclamation for not being strong enough to bear the start it gave him he fainted away a weakness on his part which affords the narrative an opportunity of relieving the reader from suspense in behalf of the two young pupils of the merry old gentleman and of recording that when the dodger and his accomplished friend master bates joined in the hue and cry which was raised at oliver's heels in consequence of their executing an illegal conveyance of mr brownlow's personal property as has already been described they were actuated by a very laudable and becoming regard for themselves and forasmuch as the freedom of the subject and the liberty of the individual are among the first and proudest boasts of a true-hearted englishman so i need hardly beg the reader to observe that this action should tend to exalt them in the opinion of all public and patriotic men in almost as great a degree as this strong proof of their anxiety for their own preservation and safety goes to corroborate and confirm the little code of laws which certain profound and sound judging philosophers have laid down as the mainsprings of all nature's deeds and actions the said philosophers very wisely reducing the good lady's proceedings to matters of maxim and theory and 
by a very neat and pretty compliment to her exalted wisdom and understanding putting entirely out of sight any considerations of heart or generous impulse and feeling for these are matters totally beneath a female who is acknowledged by universal admission to be far above the numerous little foibles and weaknesses of her sex if i wanted any further proof of the strictly philosophical nature of the conduct of these young gentlemen in their very delicate predicament i should at once find it in the fact also recorded in a foregoing part of this narrative of their quitting the pursuit when the general attention was fixed upon oliver and making immediately for their home by the shortest possible cut although i do not mean to assert that it is usually the practice of the renowned and learned sages to shorten the road to any great conclusion their course indeed being rather to lengthen the distance by various circumlocutions and discursive staggerings like unto those in which drunken men under the pressure of a too mighty flow of ideas are prone to indulge still i do mean to say and do say distinctly that it is the invariable practice of many mighty philosophers in carrying out their theories to evince great wisdom and foresight in providing against every possible contingency which can be supposed at all likely to affect themselves thus to do a great right you may do a little wrong and you may take any means which the end to be attained will justify the amount of the right or the amount of the wrong or indeed the distinction between the two being left entirely to the philosopher concerned to be settled and determined by his clear comprehensive and impartial view of his own particular case it was not until the two boys had scoured with great rapidity through a most intricate maze of narrow streets and courts that they ventured to halt beneath a low and dark archway having remained silent here just long enough to recover breath to speak master bates uttered an exclamation of amusement and delight and bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter flung himself upon a doorstep and rolled thereon in a transport of mirth what's the matter inquired the dodger <laughs> <laughs> roared charlie bates hold your noise remonstrated the dodger looking cautiously round do you want to be grab stupid i can't help it said charlie i can't help it to see him splitting away at that pace and cutting round the corners and knocking up against the posts and starting on again as if he was made of iron as well as them and me with a wipe in my pocket singing out after him oh my eye the vivid imagination of master bates presented the scene before him in two strong colours as he arrived at this apostrophe he again rolled upon the doorstep and laughed louder than before what a fag inside inquired the dodger taking advantage of the next interval of breathlessness on the part of his friend to propound the question what repeated charlie bates ah what said the dodger why well, what should he say inquired charlie stopping rather suddenly in his merriment for the dodger's manner was impressive what should he say mr dawkins whistled for a couple minutes then taking off his hat scratched his head and nodded thrice what do you mean said charlie to a loo gammon and spinach the froggy wouldn't high cockle em said the dodger with a slight sneer on his intellectual countenance this was explanatory but not satisfactory master bates felt it so and again said what do you mean the dodger made no reply but putting his hat on again and gathering the skirts of his long-tailed coat under his arm thrust his tongue into his cheek slapped the bridge of his nose some half-dozen times in a familiar but expressive manner and turning on his heel slunk down the court master bates followed with a thoughtful countenance the noise of footsteps on the creaking stairs a few minutes after the occurrence of this conversation roused the merry old gentleman as he sat over the fire with a saveloy and a small loaf in his hand a pocket-knife in his right and a pewter pot on the trivet there was a rascally smile on his white face as he turned round and looking sharply out from under his thick red eyebrows bent his ear toward the door and listened why how's this muttered the jew changing countenance only two of em where's the third they can't have gotten into any trouble hark the footsteps approached nearer they reached the landing the door was slowly opened and the dodger and charlie bates entered closing it behind them End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Oliver Twist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist 
by Charles Dickens. Chapter 13. Some new acquaintances are introduced to the intelligent reader, connected with whom various pleasant matters are related, appertaining to this history. Where's Oliver? said the Jew, rising with a menacing look. Where's the boy? The young thieves eyed their preceptor as if they were alarmed at his violence, and looked uneasily at each other. But they made no reply. What's become of the boy? said the Jew, seizing Dodger tightly by the collar, and threatening him with horrid imprecations. Speak out, or I'll throttle you! Mr. Fagin looked so very much in earnest that Charlie Bates, who deemed it prudent in all cases to be on the safe side, and who conceived it by no means improbable that it might be his turn to be throttled second, dropped upon his knees and raised a loud, well-sustained, and continuous roar, something between a mad bull and a speaking trumpet. Will you speak? thundered the Jew, shaking the Dodger so much that his keeping in the big coat at all seemed perfectly miraculous. "'Why, the traps have got him, and that's all about it,' said the Dodger sullenly. "'Come, let go of me, will you?' And swinging himself at one jerk, clean out of the big coat, which he left in the Jew's hands, the Dodger snatched up the toasting fork, and made a pass at the merry old gentleman's waistcoat, which, if it had taken effect, would have let a little more merriment out than could have been easily replaced.' The Jew stepped back in this emergency, with more agility than could have been anticipated in a man of his apparent decrepitude, and, seizing up the pot, prepared to hurl it at his assailant's head. But Charlie Bates, at this moment calling his attention by a perfectly terrific howl, he suddenly altered its destination, and flung it full at that young gentleman. "'Why, what the blazes is in the wind now?' growled a deep voice. "'Who pitched that ear at me?' It's well it's the beer and not the pot, as it me, or I'd a settled somebody. I might a knowed as nobody but an infernal, rich, plundering, thundering old Jew could afford to throw away any drink but water. Not that, unless he done the river company every quarter. What's he all about, Fagin? Damn me! If my neck handkerchief ain't lined with beer. Come in, you sneaking barman. What are you stopping outside for, as if you was ashamed of your master? Come in. The man who growled out these words was a stoutly built fellow of about five and thirty, in a black velveteen coat, very soiled drab breeches, lace-up half-boots, and grey cotton stockings which enclosed a bulky pair of legs with large swelling calves, the kind of legs which in such costume always look in an unfinished and incomplete state without a set of fetters to garnish them. He had a brown hat on his head and a dirty belcher handkerchief round his neck, with the long frayed ends of which he smeared the beer from his face as he spoke. He disclosed, when he had done so, a broad, heavy countenance with a beard of three days' growth and two scowling eyes, one of which displayed various part-coloured symptoms of having been recently damaged by a blow. "'Come in, do you hear?' growled this engaging ruffian. A white shaggy dog, with his face scratched and torn in twenty different places, skulked into the room. "'Why didn't you come in afore?' said the man. You're getting too proud to own me a four company, are you? Lie down. This command was accompanied with a kick which sent the animal to the other end of the room. He appeared well used to it, however, for he coiled himself up in a corner very quietly, without uttering a sound, and winking his very ill-looking eyes twenty times in a minute, appeared to occupy himself in taking a survey of the apartment. What are you up to? ill treatin the boys you covetous avaricious insatiable old fence said the man seating himself deliberately i wonder they don't murder you i would if i was them if i'd been your apprentice i'd a done it long ago and no i couldn't have sold you out of woods for you're fit for nothing but keeping as a curiosity of ugliness in a glass bottle not suppose they don't blow glass bottles large enough. Hush, hush, Mr. Sykes, said the Jew, trembling. Don't speak so loud. None of your misterin', replied the ruffian. You always mean mischief when you come that. You know my name. 
out with it. I shan't disgrace it when the time comes. Well, well then, Bill Sykes, said the Jew with abject humility. You seem out of humour, Bill. Perhaps I am, replied Sykes. I should think you was rather out of sorts too, unless you mean as little arm when you throw pewter pots about, as you do when you blab and... Are you mad? said the Jew, catching the man by the sleeve and pointing towards the boys. Mr. Sykes contented himself with tying an imaginary knot under his left ear and jerking his head over on the right shoulder, a piece of dumb show which the Jew appeared to understand perfectly. He then, in cant terms, with which his whole conversation was plentifully besprinkled, but which would be quite unintelligible if they were recorded here, demanded a glass of liquor. And more, you don't poison it, said Mr. Sykes, laying his hat upon the table. This was said in jest, but if the speaker could have seen the evil leer with which the Jew bit his pale lip as he turned round to the cupboard, he might have thought the caution not wholly unnecessary, or the wish, at all events, to improve upon the distiller's ingenuity not very far from the old gentleman's merry heart. After swallowing two of three glasses of spirits, Mr. Sykes condescended to take some notice of the young gentleman, which gracious act led to a conversation in which the cause and manner of Oliver's capture were circumstantially detailed, with such alterations and improvements on the truth, as to the Dodger appeared most advisable under the circumstances. "'I'm afraid,' said the Jew, "'that he may say something which will get us into trouble.' "'That's very likely,' returned Sykes, with a malicious grin. "'You're blowed upon Fagin.' "'And I'm afraid, you see.' added the Jew, speaking as if he had not noticed the interruption, and regarding the other closely as he did so. I'm afraid that, if the game was up with us, it might be up for a good many more, and that it would come out rather worse for you than it would for me, my dear. The man started and turned round upon the Jew, but the old gentleman's shoulders were shrugged up to his ears, and his eyes were vacantly staring on the opposite wall. There was a long pause. Every member of the respectable coterie appeared plunged in his own reflections, not excepting the dog, who, by a certain malicious licking of his lips, seemed to be meditating an attack upon the legs of the first gentleman or lady he might encounter in the streets when he went out. "'Somebody must find out what's been done at the office,' said Mr. Sykes, in a much lower tone than he had taken since he came in. The Jew nodded assent. "'If he hasn't peached, and he's committed?' "'There's no fear till he comes out again,' said Mr. Sykes. "'And then he must be taken care on. "'You must get hold of him somehow.' "'Again the Jew nodded. "'The prudence of this line of action indeed was obvious, "'but unfortunately there was one very strong objection to its being adopted. "'This was that the Dodger and Charlie Bates and Fagin and Mr. William Sykes happened, one and all, to entertain a violent and deeply rooted antipathy to going near a police office on any ground or pretext whatever. How long they might have sat and looked at each other, in a state of uncertainty not the most pleasant of its kind, is difficult to guess. It is not necessary to make any guesses on the subject, however, for the sudden entrance of the two young ladies whom Oliver had seen on a former occasion caused the conversation to flow afresh. "'The very thing,' said the Jew. "'Bet will go, won't you, my dear?' "'Was,' inquired the young lady. "'Only just up to the office, my dear,' said the Jew coaxingly. "'It is due to the young lady to say that she did not positively affirm that she would not, but that she merely expressed an emphatic and earnest desire to be blessed, if she would, a polite and delicate evasion of the request, which shows the young lady to have been possessed of that natural good breeding which cannot bear to inflict upon a fellow creature the pain of a direct and pointed refusal. The Jew's countenance fell. He turned from this young lady, who was gaily, not to say gorgeously attired, in a red gown, green boots, and yellow curl papers, to the other female. Nancy, my dear, said the Jew, in a soothing manner, what do you say? "'That it won't do, so it's no use trying it on, Fagin,' replied Nancy. "'What do you mean by that?' said Mr. Sykes, looking up in a surly manner. "'What I say, Bill,' replied the lady collectedly. "'Why, you're just the very person for it,' reasoned Mr. Sykes. "'Nobody about here knows anything of you.' "'As I don't want em to, neither,' replied Nancy in the same composed manner. 
It's rather more no than yes with me, Bill. She'll go, Fagin, said Sykes. No, she won't, Fagin, said Nancy. Yes, she will, Fagin, said Sykes. And Mr. Sykes was right. By dint of alternate threats, promises, and bribes, the lady in question was ultimately prevailed upon to undertake the commission. She was not, indeed, withheld by the same considerations as her agreeable friend, for, having recently moved into the neighborhood of Field Lane from the remote but genteel suburb of Ratcliffe, she was not under the same apprehension of being recognized by any of her numerous acquaintances. Accordingly, with a clean white apron tied over her gown, and her curl papers tucked up under a straw bonnet, both articles of dress being provided from the Jew's inexhaustible stock, Miss Nancy prepared to issue forth on her errand. "'Stop a minute, my dear,' said the Jew, producing a little covered basket. "'Carry that in one hand. It looks more respectable, my dear.' "'Give her a door key to carry in her t'other one, Fagin,' said Sykes. "'It looks real and genuine-like.' "'Yes, yes, my dear, so it does,' said the Jew, hanging a large street-door key on the forefinger of the young lady's right hand. "'There. Very good. Very good indeed, my dear,' said the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'Oh, my brother, my poor, dear, sweet, innocent little brother!' exclaimed Nancy, bursting into tears and wringing the little basket and the street-door key in an agony of distress. "'What has become of him? Where have they taken him to? Oh, do have pity, and tell me what's been done with the dear boy, gentlemen. Do, gentlemen, if you please, gentlemen.' Having uttered those words in a most lamentable and heart-broken tone, to the immeasurable delight of her hearers, Miss Nancy paused, winked to the company, nodded smilingly round, and disappeared. "'Ah! She's a clever girl, my dears,' said the Jew, turning round to his young friends and shaking his head gravely, as if in mute admonition to them to follow the bright example they had just beheld. "'She's an honour to her sex, said Mr. Sykes, filling his glass and smiting the table with his enormous fist. "'Here's her health, and wishing though it's all like her.' While these and many other encomiums were being passed on the accomplished Nancy, that young lady made the best of her way to the police office, whither, notwithstanding a little natural timidity consequent upon walking through the streets alone and unprotected, she arrived in perfect safety shortly afterwards. Entering by the back way, she tapped softly with the key at one of the cell doors and listened. There was no sound within, so she coughed and listened again. Still there was no reply, so she spoke. "'Nolly, my dear,' murmured Nancy in a gentle voice. "'Nolly!' There was nobody inside but a miserable, shoeless criminal, who had been taken up for playing the flute, and who, the offence against society having been clearly proved, had been very properly committed by Mr. Fang to the House of Correction for one month, with the appropriate and amusing remark that since he had so much breath to spare, it would be more wholesomely expended on the treadmill than in a musical instrument. He made no answer, being occupied mentally bewailing the loss of the flute, which had been confiscated for the use of the county, so Nancy passed on to the next cell and knocked there. "'Well,' cried a faint and feeble voice, "'is there a little boy here?' inquired Nancy, with a preliminary sob. "'No,' replied the voice. "'God forbid.' This was a vagrant of sixty-five who was going to prison for not playing the flute, or, in other words, for begging in the streets and doing nothing for his livelihood. In the next cell was another man who was going to the same prison for hawking tin saucepans without license, thereby doing something for his living, in defiance of the stamp office. But as neither of these criminals answered to the name of Oliver, or knew anything about him, Nancy made straight up to the bluff officer in the striped waistcoat, and with the most piteous wailings and lamentations, rendered more piteous by a prompt and efficient use of the street-door key in the little basket, demanded her own dear brother. "'I haven't got him, my dear,' said the old man. "'Where is he?' screamed Nancy in a distracted manner. "'Why, the gentleman's got him,' replied the officer. "'What gentleman? Oh, gracious heavens, what gentleman?' exclaimed Nancy. In reply to this incoherent questioning, the old man informed the deeply affected sister that Oliver had been taken ill in the office, and discharged in consequence of a witness having proved the robbery to have been committed by another boy not in custody, and that the prosecutor had carried him away in an insensible condition to his own residence, of and concerning which all the informant knew was that it was somewhere in Pentonville, he having heard word mentioned in the directions to the coachman. 
in a dreadful state of doubt and uncertainty the agonized young woman staggered to the gate and then exchanging her faltering walk for a swift run returned by the most devious and complicated route she could think of to the domicile of the jew mr bill sykes no sooner heard the account of the expedition delivered than he very hastily called up the white dog and putting on his hat expeditiously departed without devoting any time to the formality of wishing the company good morning we must know where he is my dears he must be found said the jew greatly excited charlie do nothing but skulk about till you bring home some news of him nancy my dear i must have him found i trust you to you my dear to you and the artful for everything stay stay added the jew unlocking a drawer with a shaking hand there's money my dears i shall shut up this shop to-night you know where to find me don't stop here a minute not an instant my dears with these words he pushed them from the room and carefully double locking and barring the door behind them drew from its place of concealment the box which he had unintentionally disclosed to oliver then he hastily proceeded to dispose the watches and jewelry beneath his clothing a rap at the door startled him in this occupation who is there he cried in a shrill tone may replied the voice of the dodger through the keyhole what now cried the jew impatiently is he to be kidnapped to the other ken nancy says inquired the dodger yes replied the jew wherever she lays hands on him find him find him out that's all i shall know what to do next never fear the boy murmured a reply of intelligence and hurried downstairs after his companions he has not peached so far said the jew as he pursued his occupation if he means to blab us among his new friends we may stop his mouth yet End of chapter 13、chapter、14 of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 14 Comprising Further Particulars of Oliver's Stay at Mr. Brownlow's, with the remarkable prediction which one Mr. Grimwig uttered concerning him when he went out on an errand. Oliver, soon recovering from the fainting fit into which Mr. Brownlow's abrupt exclamation had thrown him, the subject of the picture was carefully avoided, both by the old gentleman and Mrs. Bedwin, in the conversation that ensued. Which indeed bore no reference to Oliver's history or prospects, but was confined to such topics as might amuse without exciting him. He was still too weak to get up to breakfast, but when he came down into the housekeeper's room next day, his first act was to cast an eager glance at the wall in the hope of again looking on the face of the beautiful lady. His expectations were disappointed, however, for the picture had been removed. Ah.、Uh -huh. Said the housekeeper, watching the direction of Oliver's eyes. It's gone, you see. I see it is, ma'am, replied Oliver. Why have they taken it away? It has been taken down, child, because Mr. Brownlow said that as it seemed to worry you, perhaps it might prevent your getting well, you know, rejoined the old lady. Oh, no, indeed, it didn't worry me, ma'am, said Oliver. I liked to see it. I quite loved it. Well, well, said the old lady good humouredly. You get well as fast as ever you can, dear, and it shall be hung up again. There, I promise you that. Now, let us talk about something else. This was all the information Oliver could obtain about the picture at that time. As the old lady had been so kind to him in his illness, he endeavoured to think no more of the subject just then. So he listened attentively to a great many stories she told him about an amiable and handsome daughter of hers who was married to an amiable and handsome man and lived in the country, and about a son who was a clerk to a merchant in the West Indies, and who was also such a good young man, and wrote such dutiful letters home four times a year, that it brought the tears into her eyes to talk about them. When the old lady had expatiated a long time on the excellences of her children and the merits of her kind good husband besides, who had been dead and gone, poor dear soul, just six and twenty years, it was time to have tea. After tea she began to teach Oliver cribbage, which he learnt as quickly as she could teach, and at which game they played, with great interest and gravity, until it was time for the invalid to have some warm wine and water. 
with a slice of dry toast, and then go cosily to bed. They were happy days, those of Oliver's recovery. Everything was so quiet and neat and orderly, everybody so kind and gentle, that, after the noise and turbulence in the midst of which he had always lived, it seemed like heaven itself. He was no sooner strong enough to put his clothes on properly than Mr. Brownlow caused a complete new suit and a new cap and a new pair of shoes to be provided for him. As Oliver was told that he might do what he liked with the old clothes, he gave them to a servant who had been very kind to him, and asked her to sell them to a Jew, and to keep the money for herself. This she very readily did, and as Oliver looked out of the parlour window, and saw the Jew roll them up in his bag and walk away, he felt quite delighted to think that they were safely gone, and that there was now no possible danger of his ever being able to wear them again. They were sad rags, to tell the truth, and Oliver had never had a new suit before. One evening, about a week after the affair of the picture, as he was sitting talking to Mrs. Bedwin, there came a message down from Mr. Brownlow that if Oliver Twist felt pretty well, he should like to see him in his study, and talk to him a little while. "'Bless us and save us. Wash your hands, and let me part your hair nicely for you, child,' said Mrs. Bedwin dear heart alive if we had known he would have asked for you we would have put you a clean collar on and made you as smart as sixpence oliver did as the old lady bade him and although she lamented grievously meanwhile that there was not even time to crimp the little frill that bordered his shirt collar he looked so delicate and handsome despite that important personal advantage that she went so far as to say looking at him with great complacency from head to foot that she really didn't think it would have been possible, on the longest notice, to have made much difference in him for the better. Thus encouraged, Oliver tapped at the study door. On Mr. Brownlow calling to him to come in, he found himself in a little back room, quite full of books, with a window looking into some pleasant little gardens. There was a table drawn up before the window, at which Mr. Brownlow was seated, reading. When he saw Oliver, he pushed the book away from him, and told him to come near the table and sit down. Oliver complied, marvelling where the people could be found to read such a great number of books as seemed to be written to make the world wiser. Which is still a marvel to more experienced people than Oliver Twist every day of their lives. "'There are a good many books, are there not, my boy?' said Mr. Brownlow, observing the curiosity with which Oliver surveyed the shelves that reached from the floor to the ceiling. "'A great number, sir.' replied oliver i never saw so many you shall read them if you behave well said the old gentleman kindly and you will like that better than looking at the outsides that is some cases because there are books of which the backs and covers are by far the best parts i suppose they are those heavy ones sir said oliver pointing to some large quartos with a good deal of gilding about the binding not always those said the old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head and smiling as he did so. There are other, equally heavy ones, though of a much smaller size. How should you like to grow up a clever man and write books, eh? I think I would rather read them, sir, replied Oliver. What? Wouldn't you like to be a book writer? said the old gentleman. Oliver considered a little while, and at last said he should think it would be a much better thing to be a bookseller, upon which the old gentleman laughed heartily and declared he had said a very good thing, which Oliver felt glad to have done, though he by no means knew what it was. "'Well, well,' <laughs> said the old gentleman, composing his features. "'Don't be afraid. We won't make an author of you, while there's an honest trade to be learnt or brick-making to turn to thank you sir said oliver at the earnest manner of his reply the old gentleman laughed again and said something about a curious instinct which oliver not understanding paid no very great attention to no said mr brownlow speaking if possible in a kinder but at the same time in a much more serious manner than oliver had ever known him assume yet I want you to pay great attention, my boy, to what I am going to say. I shall talk to you without any reserve, because I am sure you are well able to understand me, as many older persons would be. Oh, don't tell me you are going to send me away, sir. Pray, 
exclaimed Oliver, alarmed at the serious tone of the old gentleman's commencement. "'Don't turn me out of doors to wander in the streets again. Let me stay here and be a servant. Don't send me back to the wretched place I came from. Have mercy upon a poor boy, sir.' "'My dear child,' said the old gentleman, moved by the warmth of Oliver's sudden appeal, "'you need not be afraid of my deserting you, unless you give me cause.' "'I never, never will, sir,' interposed Oliver. "'I hope not,' rejoined the old gentleman. "'I do not think you ever will. I have been deceived before in the objects whom I have endeavoured to benefit, but I feel strongly disposed to trust you, nevertheless, and I am more interested in your behalf than I can well account for, even to myself.' The persons on whom I have bestowed my dearest love lie deep in their graves, but, although the happiness and delight of my life lie buried there too, I have not made a coffin of my heart, and sealed it up for ever on my best affections. Deep affliction has but strengthened and refined them. As the old gentleman said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companion, and as he remained silent for a short time afterwards, Oliver sat quite still. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman at length, in a more cheerful tone, "'I only say this, because you have a young heart, and knowing that I have suffered great pain and sorrow, you will be more careful, perhaps, not to wound me again. You say you were an orphan.' without a friend in the world all the inquiries i have been able to make confirm the statement let me hear your story where you come from who brought you up and how you got into the company in which i found you speak the truth and you shall not be friendless while i live oliver's sobs checked his utterance for some minutes when he was on the point of beginning to relate how he had been brought up at the farm and carried to the workhouse by mr bumble a peculiarly impatient little double knock was heard at the street door and the servant running upstairs announced mr grimwig is he coming up inquired mr brownlow yes sir replied the servant he asked if there were any muffins in the house and when i told him yes he said he had come to tea mr brownlow smiled and turning to oliver said that mr grimwig was an old friend of his and he must not mind his being a little rough in his manners for he was a worthy creature at bottom as he had reason to know shall i go downstairs sir inquired oliver no replied mr brownlow i would rather you remained here at this moment there walked into the room supporting himself by a thick stick a stout old gentleman rather lame in one leg who was dressed in a blue coat striped waistcoat nankeen breeches and gaiters and a broad-brimmed white hat with the sides turned up with green a very small plaited shirt frill stuck out from his waistcoat and a very long steel watch chain with nothing but a key at the end dangled loosely below it the ends of his white neckerchief were twisted into a ball about the size of an orange the variety of shapes into which his countenance was twisted defy description he had a manner of screwing his head on one side when he spoke and of looking out the corners of his eyes at the same time which irresistibly reminded the beholder of a parrot in this attitude he fixed himself the moment he made his appearance and holding out a small piece of orange peel at arm's length exclaimed in a growling discontented voice look here do you see this isn't it a most wonderful and extraordinary thing that i can't call at a man's house but i find a piece of this poor surgeon's friend on the staircase i've been lamed with orange peel once and i know orange peel will be my death or i'll be content to eat my own head sir this was the handsome offer with which mr grimwig backed and confirmed nearly every assertion he made and it was the more singular in his case because even admitting for the sake of argument the possibility of scientific improvements being brought to pass which will enable a gentleman to eat his own head in the event of his being so disposed mr grimwig's head was such a particularly large one that the most sanguine man alive could hardly entertain a hope of being able to get through it at a sitting to put entirely out of the question a very thick coating of powder. 
i'll eat my head sir repeated mr grimwig striking his stick upon the ground hello what's that looking at oliver and retreating a pace or two this is young oliver twist whom we were speaking about said mr brownlow oliver bowed you don't mean to say that's the boy who had the fever i hope said mr grimwig recoiling a little more wait a minute don't speak stop continued mr grimwig abruptly losing all dread of the fever in his triumph at the discovery that's the boy who had the orange if that's not the boy sir who had the orange and threw this bit of peel upon the staircase i'll eat my head and his too no no he has not had one said mr brownlow laughing come put down your hat and speak to my young friend i feel strongly on this subject sir said the irritable old gentleman drawing off his gloves there's always more or less orange peel on the pavement in our street and i know it's put there by the surgeon's boy at the corner a young woman stumbled over a bit last night and fell against my garden railings directly she got up i saw her look towards his infernal red lamp with the pantomime light don't go to him i called out of the window he's an assassin a man-trap so he is if he is not here the irascible old gentleman gave a great knock on the ground with his stick which was always understood by his friends to imply the customary offer whenever it was not expressed in words then still keeping his stick in his hand he sat down and opening a double eyeglass which he wore attached to a broad black riband took a view of oliver who seeing that he was the object of inspection colored and bowed again that's the boy is it said mr grimwig at length that's the boy replied mr brownlow how are you boy said mr grimwig a great deal better thank you sir replied oliver mr brownlow seeming to apprehend that his singular friend was about to say something disagreeable asked oliver to step downstairs and tell mrs bedwin they were ready for tea which as he did not half like the visitor's manner he was very happy to do he is a nice-looking boy is he not inquired mr brownlow i don't know replied mr grimwig pettishly don't know no i don't know i never see any difference in boys i only knew two sort of boys mealy boys and beef-faced boys and which is oliver mealy i know a friend who has a beef-faced boy a fine boy they call him with a round head and red cheeks and glaring eyes a horrid boy with a body and limbs that appear to be swelling out of the seams of his blue clothes with the voice of a pilot and the appetite of a wolf i know him the wretch come said mr brownlow these are not the characteristics of young oliver twist so he needn't excite your wrath they are not replied mr grimwig he may have worse here mr brownlow coughed impatiently which appeared to afford mr grimwig the most exquisite delight he may have worse i say repeated mr grimwig where does he come from who is he what is he he has had a fever what of that fevers are not peculiar to good people are they bad people have fevers sometimes haven't they eh? i knew a man who was hung in jamaica for murdering his master he had had a fever six times he wasn't recommended to mercy on that account Pugh, nonsense now the fact was that in the inmost recesses of his own heart mr grimwig was strongly disposed to admit that oliver's appearance and manner were unusually prepossessing but he had a strong appetite for contradiction sharpened on this occasion by the finding of the orange peel and inwardly determining that no man should dictate to him whether a boy was well-looking or not he had resolved from the first to oppose his friend when mr brownlow admitted that on no one point of inquiry could he yet return a satisfactory answer and that he had postponed any investigation into oliver's previous history until he thought the boy was strong enough to hear it mr grimwig chuckled maliciously and he demanded with a sneer whether the housekeeper was in the habit of counting the plate at night because if she didn't find a tablespoon or two missing some sunshiny morning why he would be content to and so forth 
all this mr brownlow although himself somewhat of an impetuous gentleman knowing his friend's peculiarities bore with great good humor as mr grimwig at tea was graciously pleased to express his entire approval of the muffins matters went on very smoothly and oliver who made one of the party began to feel more at his ease than he had yet done in the fierce old gentleman's presence and when are you going to hear a full true and particular account of the life and adventures of oliver twist asked grimwig of mr brownlow at the conclusion of the meal looking sideways at oliver as he resumed his subject to-morrow morning replied mr brownlow i would rather he was alone with me at the time come up to me to-morrow morning at ten o'clock my dear yes sir replied oliver he answered with some hesitation because he was confused by mr grimwig's looking so hard at him i'll tell you what whispered that gentleman to mr brownlow he won't come up to you to-morrow morning i saw him hesitate he is deceiving you my good friend i swear he is not replied mr brownlow warmly if he is not said mr grimwig i'll and down went the stick i'll answer for that boy's truth with my life said mr brownlow knocking the table and i for his falsehood with my head rejoined mr grimwig knocking the table also we shall see said mr brownlow checking his rising anger we will replied mr grimwig with a provoking smile we will as fate would have it mrs bedwin chanced to bring in at this moment a small parcel of books which mr brownlow had that morning purchased of the identical bookstall keeper who has already figured in this history having laid them on the table she prepared to leave the room stop the boy mrs bedwin said mr brownlow there is something to go back he has gone sir replied mrs bedwin call after him said mr brownlow it's particular he is a poor man and they are not paid for there are some books to be taken back too the street door was opened oliver ran one way and the girl ran another and mrs bedwin stood on the step and screamed for the boy but there was no boy in sight oliver and the girl returned in a breathless state to report that there were no tidings of him dear me i am very sorry for that exclaimed mr brownlow i particularly wished those books to be returned to-night send oliver with them said mr grimwig with an ironical smile he will be sure to deliver them safely you know yes do let me take them if you please sir said oliver i'll run all the way sir the old gentleman was just going to say that oliver should not go out on any account when a most malicious cough from mr grimwig determined him that he should and that by his prompt discharge of the commission he should prove to him the injustice of his suspicions on this head at least at once you shall go my dear said the old gentleman the books are on a chair by my table fetch them down oliver delighted to be of use brought down the books under his arm in a great bustle and waited cap in hand to hear what message he was to take you are to say said mr brownlow glancing steadily at grimwig you are to say that you have brought these books back and that you have come to pay the four pound ten i owe him this is a five pound note so you will have to bring me back ten shillings change i won't be ten minutes sir said oliver eagerly having buttoned up the bank-note in his jacket pocket and placed the books carefully under his arm he made a respectful bow and left the room mrs bedwin followed him to the street door giving him many directions about the nearest way and the name of the bookseller and the name of the street all of which oliver said he clearly understood having superadded many injunctions to be sure and not take cold the old lady at length permitted him to depart bless his sweet face said the old lady looking after him i can't bear somehow to let him go out of my sight at this moment oliver looked gaily round and nodded before he turned the corner the old lady smilingly returned his salutation and closing the door went back to her own room let me see he'll be back in twenty minutes at the longest said mr brownlow pulling out his watch and placing it on the table it will be dark by that time oh you really expect him to come back do you inquired mr grimwig don't you asked mr brownlow smiling the spirit of contradiction was strong in mr grimwig's breast at the moment and it was rendered strongly by his friend's confident smile 
no he said smiting the table with his fist i do not the boy has a new suit of clothes on his back a set of valuable books under his arm and a five-pound note in his pocket he'll join his old friends the thieves and laugh at you if ever that boy returns to this house sir i'll eat my head with these words he drew his chair closer to the table and there the two friends sat in silent expectation with the watch between them it is worthy of remark as illustrating the importance we attach to our own judgments and the pride with which we put forth our most rash and hasty conclusions that although mr grimwig was not by any means a bad-hearted man and though he would have been unfeignedly sorry to see his respected friend duped and deceived he really did most earnestly and strongly hope at that moment that oliver twist might not come back it grew so dark that the figures on the dial plate were scarcely discernible but there the two old gentlemen continued to sit in silence with the watch between them end of chapter 14 chapter 15 of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter 15 showing how very fond of oliver twist the merry old jew and miss nancy were in the obscure parlor of a low public house in the filthiest part of little saffron hill a dark and gloomy den where a flaring gas light burnt all day in the winter time and where no ray of sun ever shone in the summer there sat brooding over a little pewter measure and a small glass strongly impregnated with the smell of liquor a man in a velveteen coat drab shorts half boots and stockings whom even by that dim light no experienced agent of the police would have hesitated to recognize as mr william sykes at his feet sat a white-coated red-eyed dog who occupied himself alternately in winking at his master with both eyes at the same time and in licking a large fresh cut on one side of his mouth which appeared to be the result of some recent conflict keep quiet you woman keep quiet said mr sykes suddenly breaking silence whether his meditations were so intense as to be disturbed by the dog's winking or whether his feelings were so wrought upon by his reflections that they required all the relief derivable from kicking an unoffending animal to allay them is a matter for argument and consideration whatever was the cause the effect was a kick and a curse bestowed upon the dog simultaneously dogs are not generally apt to revenge injuries inflicted upon them by their masters but mr sykes's dog having faults of temper in common with its owner and laboring perhaps at this moment under a powerful sense of injury made no more ado but at once fixed his teeth in one of the half boots having given in a hearty shake he retired growling under a form just escaping the pewter measure which mr sykes levelled at his head you would would you said sykes seizing the poker in one hand and deliberately opening with the other a large clasp knife which he drew from his pocket come here you born devil come here do you hear the dog no doubt heard because mr sykes spoke in the very harshest key of a very harsh voice but appearing to entertain some unaccountable objection to having his throat cut he remained where he was and growled more fiercely than before at the same time grasping the end of the poker between his teeth and biting at it like a wild beast this resistance only infuriated mr sykes the more who dropping on his knees began to assail the animal most furiously the dog jumped from right to left and from left to right snapping growling and barking the man thrust and swore and struck and blasphemed and the struggle was reaching a most critical point for one or other when the door suddenly opening the dog darted out leaving bill sykes with the poker and the clasp knife in his hands there must always be two parties to a quarrel says the old adage mr sykes being disappointed of the dog's participation at once transferred his share in the quarrel to the newcomer what the devil do you come in between me and my dog for said sykes with a fierce gesture i didn't know my dear i didn't know replied fagin humbly for the jew was the newcomer didn't know you what you thief growled sykes 
Couldn't you hear the noise? Not a sound of it, as I'm a living man, Bill, replied the Jew. Oh, no, you hear nothing, you don't, retorted Sykes with a fierce sneer. Sneaking in and out, so as nobody hears how you come or go. Oh, I wish you had been the dog, Fagin, half a minute ago. Why? inquired the Jew with a forced smile. Who's the government? It's cares for the likes of such men as you, as haven't half the plot occurs, lets a man kill a dog how he likes, replied Sykes, shutting up the knife with a very expressive look. That's why. The Jew rubbed his hands, and sitting down at the table, affected to laugh at the pleasantry of his friend. He was obviously very ill at ease, however. Run away, said Sykes, replacing the poker and surveying him with savage contempt. Run away. You'll never have the laugh at me, though, unless it's behind a nightcap. I've got the upper hand over you, Fagin, and, damn me, I'll keep it. There. If I go, you go. So, take care of me. Well, well, my dear, said the Jew. I know that we, we have a mutual interest, Bill. A mutual interest. <sighs> said Sykes, as if he thought the interest lay rather more on the Jew's side than on his. Well, what are you got to say to me? It's all passed safe through the melting pot, replied Fagin. And this is your share. It's rather more than it ought to be, my dear, but as you know, you'll do me a good turn another time, and— Stow that, gammon, interposed the robber impatiently. Where is it? And over. Yes, yes, Bill. Give me time. Give me time, replied the Jew soothingly. Here it is, all safe. As he spoke, he drew forth an old cotton handkerchief from his breast, and, untying a large knot in one corner, produced a small brown paper packet. Sykes, snatching it from him, hastily opened it and proceeded to count the sovereigns it contained. This is all, is it? inquired Sykes. All? Oh replied the jew you haven't opened the parcel and swallowed one or two as you come along have you inquired sykes suspiciously don't put on an injured look at the question you've done it many a time jerk the tinkler these words in plain english conveyed an injunction to ring the bell it was answered by another jew younger than fagin but nearly as vile and repulsive in appearance bill sykes merely pointed to the empty measure the Jew, perfectly understanding the hint, retired to fill it, previously exchanging a remarkable look with Fagin, who raised his eyes for an instant, as if in expectation of it, and shook his head in reply, so slightly that the action would have been almost imperceptible to an observant third person. It was lost upon Sykes, who was stooping at the moment to tie the bootlace which the dog had torn. Possibly, if he had observed this brief interchange of signals, he might have thought that it boded no good to him. "'Is anybody here, Barney?' inquired Fagin, speaking, now that Sykes was looking on, without raising his eyes from the ground. "'Got a show,' replied Barney, whose words, whether they came from the heart or not, made their way through the nose. "'Nobody?' inquired Fagin, in a tone of surprise, which perhaps meant that Barney was at liberty to tell the truth. "'Nobody but his dad, see?' replied Barney. "'Nancy!' exclaimed Sykes. "'Where?' Strike me blind if I don't honour that ear girl for her native talents. She's better than having a plate of boiled beef in the bar, replied Barney. Send her ear, said Sykes, pouring out a glass of liquor. Send her ear. Barney looked timidly at Fagin as if for permission. The Jew remaining silent and not lifting his eyes from the ground, he retired and presently returned, ushering in Nancy, who was decorated with the bonnet, apron, basket, and street-door key complete. "'You are on the scent, are you, Nancy?' inquired Sykes, proffering the glass. "'Yes, I am, Bill,' replied the young lady, disposing of its contents. "'And tired enough of it I am, too. The young brat's been ill and confined to the crib, and—' "'Ah, oh, Nancy, dear,' said Fagin, looking up. Now whether a peculiar contraction of the Jew's red eyebrows and a half-closing of his deeply set eyes warned Miss Nancy that she was disposed to be too communicative is not a matter of much importance. 
the fact is all we need care for here and the fact is that she suddenly checked herself and with several gracious smiles upon mr sykes turned the conversation to other matters in about ten minutes time mr fagin was seized with a fit of coughing upon which nancy pulled her shawl over her shoulders and declared it was time to go mr sykes finding that he was walking a short part of her way himself expressed his intention of accompanying her they went away together followed at a little distance by the dog who slunk out of a back yard as soon as his master was out of sight the jew thrust his head out of the room door when sykes had left it looked after him as he walked up the dark passage shook his clenched fist muttered a deep curse and then with a horrible grin reseated himself at the table where he was soon deeply absorbed in the interesting pages of the hue and cry meanwhile oliver twist little dreaming that he was within so very short a distance of the merry old gentleman was on his way to the bookstall when he got into clerkenwell he accidentally turned down a by-street which was not exactly in his way but not discovering his mistake until he had got halfway down it and knowing it must lead in the right direction he did not think it worth while to turn back and so marched on as quickly as he could with the books under his arm he was walking along thinking how happy and contented he ought to feel and how much he would give for only one look at poor little dick who starved and beaten might be weeping bitterly at the very moment when he was startled by a young woman screaming out very loud oh my dear brother and he had hardly looked up to see what the matter was when he was stopped by having a pair of arms thrown tight around his neck don't cried oliver struggling let go of me who is it what are you stopping me for the only reply to this was a great number of loud lamentations from the young woman who had embraced him and who had a little basket and a street door key in her hand oh my gracious said the young woman i found him oh oliver oliver oh you naughty boy to make me suffer such distress on your account come home dear come home oh i found him thank gracious goodness heavens i found him with these incoherent exclamations the young woman burst into another fit of crying and got so dreadfully hysterical that a couple of women who came up at the moment asked a butcher's boy with a shiny head of hair anointed with suet who was also looking on whether he didn't think he had better run for the doctor to which the butcher's boy who appeared of a lounging not to say indolent disposition replied that he thought not oh no no never mind said the young woman grasping oliver's hand i'm better now come home you cruel boy come oh ma'am replied the young woman he ran away near a month ago from his parents who were hard-working and respectable people went and joined a set of thieves and bad characters and almost broke his mother's heart young wretch said one woman go home do you little brute said the other i am not replied oliver greatly alarmed i don't know her i haven't any sister or father and mother either i'm an orphan i live at pentonville only her about me braves it out cried the young woman why it's nancy exclaimed oliver who now saw her face for the first time and started back in irrepressible astonishment you see he knows me cried nancy appealing to the bystanders he can't help himself make him come home there's good people or he'll kill his dear mother and father and break my heart what the devil's this said a man bursting out of a beer shop with a white dog at his heels young oliver come home to your poor mother you young dog come home directly i don't belong to them i don't know them help help cried oliver struggling in the man's powerful grasp help repeated the man yes i'll help you you young rascal what books are these you've been a stealing em have you give em here with these words the man tore the volumes from his grasp and struck him on the head that's right cried a looker-on from a garret window that's the only way to bring him to his senses to be sure cried a sleepy-faced carpenter casting a proving look at the garret window it'll, it'll do, do him, him good said the two women and he shall have it too rejoined the man administering another blow and seizing oliver by the collar come on you young villain here bull'seye mind him boy mind him weak with recent illness stupefied by the blows and the suddenness of the attack terrified by the fierce growling of the dog and the brutality of the man overpowered by the conviction of the bystanders that he really was the hardened little wretch he was described to be what could one poor child do darkness had set in it was a low neighborhood no help was near resistance was useless 
in another moment he was dragged into a labyrinth of dark narrow courts and was forced along them at a pace which rendered the few cries he dared to give utterance to unintelligible it was of little moment indeed whether they were intelligible or no for there was nobody to care for them had they been ever so plain the gas lamps were lighted mrs bedwin was waiting anxiously at the open door the servant had run up the street twenty times to see if there were any traces of oliver and still the two old gentlemen sat perseveringly in the dark parlor with the watch between them end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter sixteen relates what became of oliver twist after he had been claimed by nancy the narrow streets and courts at length terminated in a large open space scattered about which were pens for beasts and other indications of a cattle market sykes slackened his pace when they reached this spot the girl being quite unable to support any longer the rapid rate at which they had hitherto walked turning to oliver he roughly commanded him to take hold of nancy's hand yeah, yeah. growled sykes as oliver hesitated and looked round they were in a dark corner quite out of the track of passengers oliver saw but too plainly that resistance would be of no avail he held out his hand which nancy clasped tight in hers give me other said sykes seizing oliver's unoccupied hand yeah, bullseye. the dog looked up and growled see here boy said sykes putting his other hand to oliver's throat if you ever speak so soft a word hold him do you mind the dog growled again and licking his lips eyed oliver as if he were anxious to attach himself to his windpipe without delay he's as willing as a christian strike me blind if he isn't said sykes regarding the animal with a kind of grim and ferocious approval now you know what you got to expect master so call away as quick as you like <laughs> the dog will soon stop that game get on young un bullseye wagged his tail in acknowledgment of this unusually endearing form of speech and giving vent to another admonitory growl for the benefit of oliver led the way onward it was smithfield that they were crossing although it might have been grosvenor square for anything oliver knew to the contrary the night was dark and foggy the lights in the shops could scarcely struggle through the heavy mist which thickened every moment and shrouded the streets and houses in gloom rendering the strange place still stranger in oliver's eyes and making his uncertainty the more dismal and depressing they had hurried on a few paces when a deep church bell struck the hour with its first stroke his two conductors stopped and turned their heads in the direction whence the sound proceeded eight o'clock bill said nancy when the bell ceased what's the good of telling me that i can hear it can't i replied sykes i wonder if they can hear it said nancy of course i can replied sykes it was about only time when i was shopped and there wa'n't a penny trumpet in the fair as i couldn't hear a squeaking on after i was locked up for the night the row and din outside made the thundering old jail so silent that i could have almost have beat me brains out against the iron plates of the door poor fellow said nancy who still had her face turned towards the quarter in which the bell had sounded oh bill such fine young chaps as them yes it's all you women think of answered sykes fine young chaps we'll live as good as dead so it don't much matter with this consolation mr sykes appeared to repress a rising tendency to jealousy and clasping oliver's wrist more firmly told him to step out again wait a minute said the girl i wouldn't hurry by if it was you that was coming out to be hung next time eight o'clock struck bill i'd walk round and round the place till i dropped the snow was on the ground i haven't a shawl to cover me and what good would that do inquired the unsentimental mr sykes unless you could pitch over a file and twenty yards of good stout rope you might as well be walking fifty mile off or not walking at all for all the good it would do me come on and don't stand preaching near the girl burst into a laugh drew her shawl more closely round her and they walked away but oliver felt her hand tremble and looking up in her face as they passed a gas lamp saw that it had turned a deadly white they walked on by little frequented and dirty ways for a full half hour 
meeting very few people and those appearing from their looks to hold much the same position in society as mr sykes himself at length they turned into a very filthy narrow street nearly full of old clothes shops the dog running forward as if conscious that there was no further occasion for his keeping on guard stopped before the door of a shop that was closed and apparently untenanted the house was in a ruinous condition and on the door was nailed a board intimating that it was to let which looked as if it had hung there for many years all right cried sykes glancing cautiously about nancy stooped below the shutters and oliver heard the sound of a bell they crossed to the opposite side of the street and stood for a few moments under a lamp a noise as if a sash window were gently raised was heard and soon afterwards the door softly opened mr sykes then seized the terrified boy by the collar with very little ceremony and all three were quickly inside the house the passage was perfectly dark they waited while the person who had let them in chained and barred the door anybody here inquired sykes no replied a voice which oliver thought he had heard before is he old in here asked the robber yes replied the voice precious down in the mouth he's been won't he be glad to see you oh no the style of this reply as well as the voice which delivered it seemed familiar to oliver's ears but it was impossible to distinguish even the form of the speaker in the darkness let's have a glim said sykes we shall go breaking our necks or treading on the dog look out your legs if you do stand still a moment and i'll get you on replied the voice the receding footsteps of the speaker were heard and in another minute the form of mr john dawkins otherwise the artful dodger appeared he bore in his right hand a tallow candle stuck in the end of a cleft stick the young gentleman did not stop to bestow any other mark of recognition upon oliver than a humorous grin but turning away beckoned the visitors to follow him down a flight of stairs they crossed an empty kitchen and opening the door of a low earthy smelling room which seemed to have been built in a small back yard were received with a shout of laughter oh my wig my wig cried master charles bates from whose lungs the laughter had proceeded <laughs> here he is oh cry here he is oh fagin look at him fagin do look at him i can't bear it it is such a jolly game i can't bear it hold me somebody while i laugh it out with this irrepressible ebullition of mirth master bates laid himself flat on the floor and kicked convulsively for five minutes in an ecstasy of facetious joy then jumping to his feet he snatched the cleft stick from the dodger and advancing to oliver viewed him round and round while the jew taking off his nightcap made a great number of low bows to the bewildered boy the artful meantime who was of a rather saturnine disposition and seldom gave way to merriment when it interfered with business rifled oliver's pockets with steady assiduity look at his dog is fagin said charlie putting the light so close to his new jacket as nearly to set him on fire look at his togs super fine cloth and a heavy swell cut oh my eye what a game and his books too nothing but a gentleman fagin delighted to see you looking so well my dear said the jew bowing with mock humility the artful should give you another suit my dear for fear you should spoil that sunday one why didn't you write my dear and say you were coming we'd have got something warm for supper at his master bates roared again so loud that fagin himself relaxed and even the dodger smiled but as the artful drew forth the five pound note at that instant it is doubtful whether the sally of the discovery awakened his merriment hello what's that inquired sykes stepping forward as the jew seized the note it's mine fagin no no my dear said the jew mine bill mine you shall have the books if that ain't mine said bill sykes putting on his hat with a determined air mine and nancy's that is i'll take the boy back again the jew started oliver started too though from a very different cause for he hoped that the dispute might really end in his being taken back come and over will you said sykes this is hardly fair bill hardly fair is it nancy inquired the jew fair or not fair retorted sykes and over i tell you do you think nancy and me has got nothing else to do with our precious time but to spend it in scouting arter and kidnapping every young boy as gets grabbed through you give it here you avaricious old skeleton give it here 
with this gentle remonstrance mr sykes plucked the note from between the jew's finger and thumb and looking the old man coolly in the face folded it up small and tied it in his neckerchief that's for our share of the trouble said sykes and not half enough neither you may keep the books if you're fond of reading if you ain't sell em they're very pretty said charlie bates who with sundry grimaces had been affecting to read one of the volumes in question beautiful writing isn't it oliver at the sight of the dismayed look with which oliver regarded his tormentors master bates who was blessed with a lively sense of the ludicrous fell into another ecstasy more boisterous than the first they belong to the old gentleman said oliver wringing his hands to the good kind old gentleman who took me into his house and had me nursed when i was near dying of the fever oh pray send them back send him back the books and money keep me here all my life long but pray pray send them back he'll think i stole them the old lady all of them who were so kind to me will think i stole them oh do have mercy upon me and send them back with these words which were uttered with all the energy of passionate grief oliver fell upon his knees at the jew's feet and beat his hands together in perfect desperation the boy's right remarked fagin looking covertly round and knitting his shaggy eyebrows into a hard knot you're right oliver you're right they will think you have stolen em ha <laughs> ha chuckled the jew rubbing his hands it couldn't have happened better if we had chosen our time of course it couldn't replied sykes i know that directly i see him coming through clerkenwell with the books under his arm it's all right enough they're soft-hearted psalm singers or they wouldn't have taken him in at all and they'll ask no questions out of him fear they should be obliged to prosecute and so get him lagged he's safe enough oliver had looked from one to the other while these words were being spoken as if he were bewildered and could scarcely understand what passed but when bill sykes concluded he jumped suddenly to his feet and tore wildly from the room uttering shrieks for help which made the bare old house echo to the roof keep back the dog bill cried nancy springing before the door and closing it as the jew and his two pupils darted out in pursuit keep back the dog he'll tell the boy to pieces serve him right cried sykes struggling to disengage himself from the girl's grasp stand off from me or i'll split your head against the wall i don't care for that bill i don't care for that screamed the girl struggling violently with the man the child shan't be torn down by the dog unless you kill me first shawty said sykes setting his teeth i'll soon do that if you don't keep off the housebreaker flung the girl from him to the further end of the room just as the jew and the two boys returned dragging oliver among them what's the matter here said fagin looking round the girl's gone mad i think replied sykes savagely no she hasn't said nancy pale and breathless from the scuffle no she hasn't fagin don't think it then keep quiet will you said the jew with a threatening look no i won't do that neither replied nancy speaking very loud come what do you think of that mr fagin was sufficiently well acquainted with the manners and customs of that particular species of humanity to which nancy belonged to feel tolerably certain that it would be rather unsafe to prolong any conversation with her at present with the view of diverting the attention of the company he turned to oliver so you wanted to get away my dear did you said the jew taking up a jagged and knotted club which law in a corner of the fireplace Eh? oliver made no reply but he watched the jew's motions and breathed quickly wanted to get assistance called for the police did you sneered the jew catching the boy by the arm we'll cure you of that my young master the jew inflicted a smart blow on oliver's shoulders with the club and was raising it for a second when the girl rushing forward wrested it from his hand she flung it into the fire with a force that brought some of the glowing coals whirling out into the room i won't stand by and see it done fagin cried the girl you've got the boy what more would you have let him be let him be or i shall put the mark on some of you that will bring me to the gallows before my time the girl stamped her foot violently on the floor as she vented this threat and with her lips compressed and her hands clenched looked alternately at the jew and the other robber her face quite colourless from the passion of rage into which she had gradually worked herself why nancy said the jew in a soothing tone after a pause during which he and mr sykes had stared at one another in a disconcerted manner you you're more clever than ever to-night ha <laughs> ha my dear you're acting beautifully am i said the girl take care i don't overdo it he'll be the worst for me fagin if i do 
and so I tell you in good time to keep clear of me. There is something about a roused woman, especially if she add to all her other strong passions, the fierce impulses of recklessness and despair, which few men like to provoke. The Jew saw that it would be hopeless to effect any further mistake regarding the reality of Miss Nancy's rage, and shrinking involuntarily back a few paces, cast a glance, half imploring and half cowardly, at Sykes, as if to hint that he was the fittest person to pursue the dialogue. Mr. Sykes, thus mutely appealed to, and possibly feeling his personal pride and influence interested in the immediate reduction of Miss Nancy to reason, gave utterance to about a couple of score of curses and threats, the rapid production of which reflected great credit on the fertility of his invention. As they produced no visible effect on the object against whom they were discharged, however, he resorted to more tangible arguments. "'What do you mean by this?' said Sykes backing the inquiry with a very common imprecation concerning the most beautiful of human features which if it were heard above only once out of every fifty thousand times that it is uttered below would render blindness as common a disorder as measles what do you mean by it burn my body do you know who you are and what you are oh yes i know all about it replied the girl laughing hysterically and shaking her head from side to side with a poor assumption of indifference "'Well, then, keep quiet,' rejoined Sykes, with a growl like that he was accustomed to use when addressing his dog. "'Or I'll quiet you for a good long time to come.' The girl laughed again, even less composedly than before, and, darting a hasty look at Sykes, turned her face aside and bit her lip till the blood came. "'You're a nice one,' added Sykes, as he surveyed her with a contemptuous air. "'To take up the humane and genteel side. A pretty subject for the child.' as you call him, to make a friend of. "'God Almighty, help me, I am!' cried the girl passionately. "'And I wish I'd been struck dead in the street to change places with him when we passed so near to-night, before I had lent a hand in bringing him here. He's a thief, a liar, a devil, all that's bad from this night forth. Isn't that enough for the old wretch without blows?' "'Come, come, Sykes,' said the Jew, appealing to him in a remonstratory tone, and motioning towards the boys, who were eagerly attentive to all that passed." we must have civil words civil words bill civil words cried the girl whose passion was frightful to see civil words you villain yes you deserve them from me i fear for you when i was a child not half as old as this pointing to oliver i have been the same trident in the same service for twelve years since don't you know it speak out don't you know it well well replied the jew with an attempt at pacification and if you have it's your living ay it is returned the girl, not speaking, but pouring out the words in one continuous and vehement scream. "'It is my living in the cold, wet, dirty streets of my home, and you're the wretch that drove me to them long ago, and that'll keep me there day and night, day and night, till I die.' "'I shall do you a mischief,' interposed the Jew, goaded by these reproaches. "'A mischief worse than that, if you say much more.' The girl said nothing more, but tearing her hair and dress in a transport of passion, made such a rush at the Jew as would probably have left signal marks of her revenge upon him, had not her wrist been seized by Sykes at the right moment, upon which she made a few ineffectual struggles and fainted. "'She's all right now,' said Sykes, laying her down in a corner. "'She's uncommon strong in the arms, when she's up in this way.' The Jew wiped his forehead and smiled, as if it were a relief to have the disturbance over, but neither he nor Sykes nor the dog nor the boys seemed to consider it in any other light than a common occurrence incidental to business. "'It's the worst of having to do with women,' said the Jew, replacing his club. "'But they're clever, and we can't get on in our line without em, Charlie. Show Oliver to the bed.' "'I suppose he'd better not wear his best clothes tomorrow, Fagin, had he?' inquired Charlie Bates. "'Certainly not,' replied the Jew, reciprocating the grin with which Charlie put the question. Master Bates, apparently much delighted with his commission, took the cleft stick, and led Oliver into an adjacent kitchen, where there were two or three of the beds on which he had slept before, and here, with many uncontrollable bursts of laughter, he produced the identical old suit of clothes which Oliver had so much congratulated himself upon leaving off at Mr. Brownlow's, and the accidental display of which, to Fagin, by the Jew who purchased them, had been the very first clue of his whereabout. "'Put off the smart ones.' said Charlie, and I'll give him to Fagin to take care of. What fun it is! Poor Oliver unwillingly complied. Master Bates, rolling up the new clothes under his arm, departed from the room, leaving Oliver in the dark, and locking the door behind him. 
the noise of charlie's laughter and the voice of miss betsy who opportunely arrived to throw water over her friend and perform other feminine offices for the promotion of her recovery might have kept many people awake under more happy circumstances than those in which oliver was placed but he was sick and weary and he soon fell sound asleep end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter seventeen oliver's destiny continuing unpropitious brings a great man to london to injure his reputation it is the custom on the stage in all good murderous melodramas to present the tragic and the comic scenes in as regular alteration as the layers of red and white in a side of streaky bacon the hero sinks upon his straw bed weighed down by fetters and misfortunes in the next scene his faithful but unconscious squire regales the audience with a comic song we behold with throbbing bosoms the heroine in the grasp of a proud and ruthless baron her virtue and her life alike in danger drawing forth her dagger to preserve the one at the cost of the other and just as our expectations are wrought up to the highest pitch a whistle is heard and we are straightway transported to the great hall of the castle where a grey-headed seneschal sings a funny chorus with a funnier body of vassals who are free of all sorts of places from church vaults to palaces and roam about in company caroling perpetually such changes appear absurd but they are not so unnatural as they would seem at first sight the transitions in real life from well-spread boards to death-beds and from mourning weeds to holiday garments are not a whit less startling only there we are busy actors instead of passive lookers-on which makes a vast difference the actors in the mimic life of the theatre are blind to the violent transitions and abrupt impulses of passion or feeling which presented before the eyes of mere spectators are at once condemned as outrageous and preposterous as sudden shiftings of the scene and rapid changes of time and place are not only sanctioned in books by long usage but are by many considered as the great art of authorship an author's skill in his craft being by such critics chiefly estimated with relation to the dilemmas in which he leaves his characters at the end of every chapter this brief introduction to the present one may perhaps be deemed unnecessary if so let it be considered a delicate intimation on the part of the historian that he is going back to the town in which oliver was born the reader taking it for granted that there are good and substantial reasons for making the journey or he would not be invited to proceed upon such an expedition mr bumble emerged at early morning from the workhouse gate and walked with portly carriage and commanding steps up the high street he was in the full bloom and pride of beetlehood his cocked hat and coat were dazzling in the morning sun he clutched his cane with the vigorous tenacity of health and power mr bumble always carried his head high but this morning it was higher than usual there was an abstraction in his eye an elevation in his air which might have warned an observant stranger that thoughts were passing in the beetle's mind too great for utterance mr bumble stopped not to converse with the small shopkeepers and others who spoke to him deferentially as he passed along he merely returned their salutations with a wave of his hand and relaxed not in his dignified pace until he reached the farm where mrs mann tended the infant paupers with parochial care drop that beetle said mrs mann hearing the well-known shaking at the garden gate if it isn't him at this time in the morning look mr bumble only think of its being you well dear me it is a pleasure this is come into the parlour sir please the first sentence was addressed to susan and the exclamations of delight were uttered to mr bumble as the good lady unlocked the garden gate and showed him with great attention and respect into the house mrs mann said mr bumble not sitting upon or dropping himself into a seat as any common jackanapes would but letting himself gradually and slowly down into a chair mrs mann ma'am good morning well and good morning to you sir replied mrs mann with many smiles and hoping you find yourself well sir so so mrs mann replied the beadle a parochial life 
is not a bed of roses, Mrs. Man. Ah, that it isn't indeed, Mr. Bumble, rejoined the lady, and all the infant paupers might have chorused the rejoinder with great propriety if they had heard it. A parochial life, ma'am, continued Mr. Bumble, striking the table with his cane, is a life of worrit and vexation and hardihood. But all public characters, as I may say, must suffer prosecution. Mrs. Mann, not very well knowing what the beetle meant, raised her hands with a look of sympathy and sighed. Ah, you may well sigh, Mrs. Mann, said the beetle. Finding she had done right, Mrs. Mann sighed again, evidently to the satisfaction of the public character, who, repressing a complacent smile by looking sternly at his cocked hat, said, Mrs. Mann, I am going to London. Lock, Mr. Bumble, cried Mrs. Mann, starting back. To London, ma'am, resumed the inflexible beetle. By coach, I and two paupers, Mrs. Mann. A legal action is coming on, about a settlement, and the board has appointed me, me, Mrs. Mann, to dispose to the matter before the quarter sessions at Clerkenwell. And I very much question, added Mr. Bumble, drawing himself up, whether the Clerkenwell sessions will not find themselves in the wrong box before they have done with me. Oh, you mustn't be too hard upon them, sir, said Mrs. Mann coaxingly. The Clerkenwell Sessions have brought it upon themselves, ma'am, replied Mr. Bumble. And if the Clerkenwell Sessions find that they have come off rather worse than they expected, the Clerkenwell Sessions have only themselves to thank. There was so much determination and depth of purpose about the menacing manner in which Mr. Bumble delivered himself of these words that Mrs. Mann appeared quite awed by them. At length she said, You're going by coach, sir? I thought it was always usual to send them papas in cards. That's when they're ill, Mrs. Mann, said the beetle. We put the sick paupers into open carts in the rainy weather to prevent their taking cold. Oh, said Mrs. Mann. The opposition coach contracts for these two and takes them cheap, said Mr. Bumble. They are both in a very low state, and we find it would come two pound cheaper to move them than to bury them. That is, if we can throw em upon another parish, which I think we shall be able to do if they don't die upon the road to spite us. Ha, ha, ha! When Mr. Bumble laughed a little while, his eyes again encountered the cocked hat, and he became grave. We are forgetting business, ma'am, said the beetle. Here is your parochial stipend for the month. Mr. Bumble produced some silver money rolled up in paper from his pocket-book, and requested a receipt, which Mrs. Mann wrote. It's very much blotted, sir, said the farmer of infants. But it's formal enough, I dare say. Thank you, Mr. Bumble, sir. I'm very much obliged to you, I'm sure. Mr. Bumble nodded blandly in acknowledgment of Mrs. Mann's curtsy, and inquired how the children were. Bless their dear little hearts, said Mrs. Mann with emotion. They're as well as can be the dears. Of course, except the two that died last week, and little Dick. Isn't that boy no better? inquired Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Mann shook her head. He's an ill-conditioned, wicious, bad-disposed, parochial child, that, said Mr. Bumble angrily. Where is he? I'll bring him to you in one minute, sir, replied Mrs. Mann. Here you, Dick! After some calling, Dick was discovered. Having had his face put under the pump and dried upon Mrs. Mann's gown, he was led into the awful presence of Mr. Bumble, the beetle. The child was pale and thin, his cheeks were sunken, and his eyes large and bright. The scanty parish dress, the livery of his misery, hung loosely on his feeble body, and his young limbs had wasted away like those of an old man. Such was the little being who stood trembling beneath Mr. Bumble's glance, not daring to lift his eyes from the floor, and dreading even to hear the beetle's voice. "'Can't you look at the gentleman, you obstinate boy?' said Mrs. Mann. The child meekly raised his eyes and encountered those of Mr. Bumble. "'What's the matter with you, parochial Dick?' inquired Mr. Bumble, with well-timed jocularity. "'Nothing, sir,' replied the child faintly. "'I should think not!' said Mrs. Mann, who had, of course, laughed very much at Mr. Bumble's humour. "'You want for nothing, I'm sure.' "'I should like,' faltered the child. 
hey day interposed mrs mann i suppose you're going to say that you do want for something now why you little wretch stop mrs mann stop said the beetle raising his hand with a show of authority like what sir eh i should like faltered the child if somebody that can write would put a few words down for me on a piece of paper and fold it up and seal it and keep it for me after i am laid in the ground why what does the boy mean exclaimed mr bumble on whom the earnest manner and wan aspect of the child had made some impression accustomed as he was to such things what do you mean sir i should like said the child to leave my dear love to poor oliver twist to let him know how often i have sat by myself and cried to think of his wandering about in the dark nights with nobody to help him and i should like to tell him said the child pressing his small hands together and speaking with great fervour that i was glad to die when i was very young for perhaps if i had lived to be a man and had grown up my little sister who is in heaven might forget me or be unlike me and it would be so much happier if we were both children there together mr bumble surveyed the little speaker from head to foot with indescribable astonishment and turning to his companion said they're all in one story mrs mann that outdageous oliver had demogalized them all i couldn't have believed it sir said mrs mann holding up her hands and looking malignantly at dick i never see such a hardened little wretch take him away ma'am said mr bumble imperiously this must be stated to the board mrs mann i hope the gentleman will understand that it isn't my fault sir said mrs mann whimpering pathetically they shall understand that ma'am they shall be acquainted with the true state of the case said mr bumble there take him away i can't bear the sight of him dick was immediately taken away and locked up in the coal cellar mr bumble shortly afterwards took himself off to prepare for his journey at six o'clock next morning mr bumble having exchanged his cocked hat for a round one and encased his person in a blue greatcoat with a cape to it took his place on the outside of the coach accompanied by the criminals whose settlement was disputed with whom in due course of time he arrived in london he experienced no other crosses on the way than those which originated in the perverse behavior of the two paupers who persisted in shivering and complaining of the cold in a manner which mr bumble declared caused his teeth to chatter in his head and made him feel quite uncomfortable although he had a great coat on having disposed of these evil-minded persons for the night mr bumble sat himself down in the house at which the coach stopped and took a temperate dinner of steaks oyster sauce and porter putting a glass of hot gin and water on the chimney-piece he drew his chair to the fire and with sundry moral reflections on the too prevalent sin of discontent and complaining composed himself to read the paper the very first paragraph upon which mr bumble's eyes rested was the following advertisement five guineas reward where is a young boy named oliver twist absconded or was enticed on thursday evening last from his home at pentonville and has not since been heard of the above reward will be paid to any person who will give such information as will lead to the discovery of the said oliver twist or tend to throw any light upon his previous history in which the advertiser is for many reasons warmly interested and then followed a full description of oliver's dress person appearance and disappearance with the name and address of mr brownlow at full length mr bumble opened his eyes read the advertisement slowly and carefully three several times and in something more than five minutes was on his way to pentonville having actually in his excitement left the glass of hot gin and water untasted is mr brownlow at home inquired mr bumble of the girl who opened the door to the inquiry the girl returned the not uncommon but rather evasive reply of i don't know where do you come from mr bumble no sooner uttered oliver's name in explanation of his errand than mrs bedwin who had been listening at the parlour door hastened into the passage in a breathless state come in come in said the old lady i knew we should hear of him poor dear i knew we should i was certain of it bless his heart i said so all along having heard this the worthy old lady hurried back into the parlour again and seating herself on a sofa burst into tears 
the girl who was not quite so susceptible had run upstairs meanwhile and now returned with a request that mr bumble would follow her immediately which he did he was shown into the little back study where sat mr brownlow and his friend mr grimwig with decanters and glasses before them the latter gentleman at once burst into the exclamation a beetle a parish beetle or i'll eat my head pray don't interrupt just now said mr brownlow take a seat will you mr bumble sat himself down quite confounded by the oddity of mr grimwig's manner mr brownlow moved the lamp so as to obtain an uninterrupted view of the beetle's countenance and said with a little impatience oh sir you come in consequence of having seen the advertisement yes sir said mr bumble and you are a beetle are you not inquired mr grimwig i am a parochial beetle gentlemen rejoined mr bumble proudly of course observed mr grimwig aside to his friend i knew he was a beetle all over mr brownlow gently shook his head to impose silence on his friend and resumed do you know where this poor boy is now no more than nobody replied mr bumble well what do you know of him inquired the old gentleman speak out my friend if you have anything to say what do you know of him you don't happen to know any good of him do you said mr grimwig caustically after an attentive perusal of mr bumble's features mr bumble catching at the inquiry very quickly shook his head with portentous solemnity you see said mr grimwig looking triumphantly at mr brownlow mr brownlow looked apprehensively at mr bumble's pursed-up countenance and requested him to communicate what he knew regarding oliver in as few words as possible mr bumble put down his hat unbuttoned his coat folded his arms inclined his head in a retrospective manner and after a few moments reflection commenced his story it would be tedious if given in the beetle's words occupying as it did some twenty minutes in the telling but the sum and substance of it was that oliver was a foundling born of low and vicious parents that he had from his birth displayed no better qualities than treachery ingratitude and malice that he had terminated his brief career in the place of his birth by making a sanguinary and cowardly attack on an unoffending lad and running away in the night-time from his master's house in proof of his really being the person who represented himself mr bumble laid upon the table the papers he had brought to town folding his arms again he then awaited mr brownlow's observations i fear it is all too true said the old gentleman sorrowfully after looking over the papers this is not much for your intelligence but i would gladly have given you treble the money if it had been favourable to the boy it is not improbable that if mr bumble had been possessed of this information at an earlier period of the interview he might have imparted a very different colouring to his little history it was too late to do it now however so he shook his head gravely and pocketing the five guineas withdrew mr brownlow paced the room to and fro for some minutes evidently so much disturbed by the beetle's tail that even mr grimwig forbode to vex him further at length he stopped and rang the bell violently mrs bedwin said mr brownlow when the housekeeper appeared that boy oliver is an impostor it can't be sir it cannot be said the old lady energetically i tell you he is retorted the old gentleman what do you mean by can't be we have just heard a full account of him from his birth and he has been a thorough-paced little villain all his life i never will believe it sir replied the old lady firmly never you old women never believe anything but quack doctors and lying story-books growled mr grimwig i knew it all along why didn't you take my advice in the beginning you would if he hadn't had a fever i suppose eh he was interesting wasn't he interesting Blah. and mr grimwig poked the fire with a flourish he was a dear grateful gentle child sir retorted mrs bedwin indignantly i know what children are sir and have done these forty years and people who can't say the same shouldn't say anything about them that's my opinion this was a hard hit at mr grimwig who was a bachelor as it extorted nothing from that gentleman but a smile the old lady tossed her head and smoothed down her apron preparatory to another speech when she was stopped by mr brownlow silence said the old gentleman feigning in anger he was far from feeling never let me hear the boy's name again 
I rang to tell you that. Never, never on any pretense, mind. You may leave the room, Mrs. Bedwin. Remember, I am in earnest. There were sad hearts at Mr. Brownlow's that night. Oliver's heart sank within him when he thought of his good friends. It was well for him that he could not know what they had heard, or it might have broken outright. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter eighteen. How Oliver passed his time in improving the society of his reputable friends. About noon the next day, when the Dodger and Master Bates had gone out to pursue their customary avocations, Mr. Fagin took the opportunity of reading Oliver a long lecture on the crying sin of ingratitude, of which he clearly demonstrated he had been guilty, to no ordinary extent, in willfully absenting himself from the society of his anxious friends, and still more in endeavouring to escape from them after so much trouble and expense had been incurred in his recovery. Mr. Fagin laid great stress on the fact of his having taken Oliver in and cherished him, when without his timely aid he might have perished with hunger. And he related the dismal and affecting history of a young lad whom, in his philanthropy, he succored under parallel circumstances, but who, proving unworthy of his confidence and evincing a desire to communicate with the police, had unfortunately come to be hanged at the Old Bailey one morning. Mr. Fagin did not seek to conceal his share in the catastrophe, but lamented with tears in his eyes that the wrong-headed and treacherous behavior of the young person in question had rendered it necessary that he should become the victim of certain evidence for the Crown, which, if it were not precisely true, was indispensably necessary for the safety of him, Mr. Fagin, and a few select friends. Mr. Fagin concluded by drawing a rather disagreeable picture of the discomforts of hanging, and with great friendliness and politeness of manner expressed his anxious hopes that he might never be obliged to submit Oliver Twist to that unpleasant operation. Little Oliver's blood ran cold as he listened to the Jew's words, and imperfectly comprehended the dark threats conveyed in them. That it was possible even for justice itself to confound the innocent with the guilty when they were in accidental companionship he knew already and that the deeply laid plans for the destruction of inconveniently knowing or over-communicative persons had really been devised and carried out by the Jew on more occasions than one, he thought by no means unlikely, when he recollected the general nature of the altercations between that gentleman and Mr. Sykes, which seemed to bear reference to some foregone conspiracy of the kind. As he glanced timidly up, and met the Jew's searching look, he felt that his pale face and trembling limbs were neither unnoticed nor unrelished by that wary old gentleman. The Jew, smiling hideously, patted Oliver on the head, and said that if he kept himself quiet and applied himself to business, he saw they would be very good friends yet. Then taking his hat and covering himself with an old patched greatcoat, he went out and locked the room door behind him. And so Oliver remained all that day, and for the greater part of many subsequent days, seeing nobody between early morning and midnight, and left during the long hours to commune with his own thoughts, which never failing to revert to his kind friends and the opinion they must long ago have formed of him, were sad indeed. After the lapse of a week or so the Jew left the room door unlocked, and he was at liberty to wander about the house. It was a very dirty place. The rooms upstairs had great high wooden chimney-pieces and large doors, with panelled walls and cornices to the ceiling, which, although they were black with neglect and dust, were ornamented in various ways. From all of these tokens Oliver concluded that a long time ago, before the old Jew was born, it had belonged to better people, and had perhaps been quite gay and handsome, dismal and dreary as it looked now. Spiders had built their webs in the angles of the walls and ceilings, and sometimes when Oliver walked softly into a room, the mice would scamper across the floor and run back terrified to their holes. With these exceptions there was neither sight nor sound of any living thing, and often, when it grew dark and he was tired of wandering from room to room, he would crouch in the corner of the passage by the street door, to be as near living people as he could, and would remain there listening and counting the hours until the Jew or the boys returned. In all the rooms the mouldering shutters were fast closed. 
the bars which held them were screwed tight into the wood the only light which was admitted stealing its way through round holes at the top which made the rooms more gloomy and filled them with strange shadows there was a back garret window with rusty bars outside which had no shutter and out of this oliver often gazed with a melancholy face for hours together but nothing was to be descried from it but a confused and crowded mass of housetops blackened chimneys and gable ends sometimes indeed a grisly head might be seen peering over the parapet wall of a distant house but it was quickly withdrawn again and as the window of oliver's observatory was nailed down and dimmed with the rain and smoke of years it was as much as he could do to make out the forms of the different objects beyond without making any attempt to be seen or heard which he had as much chance of being as if he had lived inside the ball of st peter's cathedral one afternoon the dodger and master bates being engaged out that evening the first named young gentleman took it into his head to evince some anxiety regarding the decoration of his person to do him justice this was by no means an habitual weakness with him and with this end and aim he condescendingly commanded oliver to assist him in his toilet straight away oliver was but too glad to make himself useful too happy to have some faces however bad to look upon too desirous to conciliate those about him when he could honestly do so to throw any objection in the way of this proposal so he at once expressed his readiness and kneeling on the floor while the dodger sat upon the table so that he could take his foot in his laps he applied himself to a process which mr dawkins designated as japanning his trotter cases the phrase rendered into plain english signifieth cleaning his boots whether it was the sense of freedom and independence which a rational animal may be supposed to feel when he sits on a table in an easy attitude smoking a pipe swinging one leg carelessly to and fro and having his boots cleaned all the time without even the past trouble of having taken them off or the prospective misery of putting them on to disturb his reflections or whether it was the goodness of the tobacco that soothed the feelings of the dodger or the mildness of the beer that mollified his thoughts he was evidently tinctured for the nonce with a spice of romance and enthusiasm foreign to his general nature he looked down on oliver with a thoughtful countenance for a brief space then raising his head and heaving a gentle sigh said half in abstraction and half to master bates what a pity it is he isn't a prig ah said master charles bates he don't know what's good for him the dodger sighed again and resumed his pipe as did charlie bates they both smoked for some seconds in silence i suppose you don't even know what a prig is said the dodger mournfully i think i know that replied oliver looking up it's uh, the ear one are you not inquired oliver checking himself i am replied the dodger i scorn to be anything else mr dawkins gave his hat a ferocious cock after delivering this sentiment and looked at master bates as if to denote that he would feel obliged by his saying anything to the contrary i am repeated the dodger so's charlie so's fagin so's sykes so's nancy so's bib so we all are down to the dog and he's a downiest one of the lot and the least given to peachin added charlie bates he went so much as bark in a witness box for fear of committing himself no not if you tied him up in one and left him there without widows for a fortnight said the dodger not a bit of it observed charlie he's a rum dog don't he look fiercer than his strange cove that laughs or sings when he's in company pursued the dodger won't he growl at all when he hears a fiddle playing and don't he hate other dogs ain't of his breed oh no he's an out and out christian said charlie this was merely intended as a tribute to the animal's abilities but it was an appropriate remark in another sense if master bates had only known it for there are a good many ladies and gentlemen claiming to be out and out christians between whom and mr sykes's dog there exist strong and singular points of resemblance well well said the dodger recurring to the point from which they had strayed with that mindfulness of his profession which influenced all his proceedings this hasn't got anything to do with young green here no more it has said charlie why don't you put yourself on the fagin oliver and make your foot out of hand added the dodger with a grin and so be able to retire on your property and do the genteel as i mean to in the very next leap year but for that ever comes and the forty-second tuesday in the trinity week said charlie bates i don't like it rejoined oliver timidly i wish they would let me go i i would rather go and fagin would rather not rejoined charlie oliver knew this too well but thinking it might be dangerous to express his feelings more openly he only sighed and went on with his boot cleaning go exclaimed the dodger why where's your spirit 
Don't you take any pride out of yourself? Would you go and be dependent on your friends? Oh, blow that, said Master Bates, drawing two or three silk handkerchiefs from his pocket and tossing them into a cupboard. That's too mean, that is. Oh, I couldn't do it, said the Dodger, with an air of haughty disgust. You can leave your friends, though, said Oliver, with a half-smile. And let them be punished for what you did. That, rejoined the Dodger, with a wave of his pipe. That was all out of consideration for Fagin, cause the chaps know that we work together, and he might have got into trouble if we hadn't made our lucky. That was the move, wasn't it, Charlie? Master Bates nodded assent, and would have spoken, but the recollection of Oliver's flight came so suddenly upon him that the smoke he was inhaling got entangled with a laugh, and went up into his head, and down into his throat, and brought on a fit of coughing and stamping about five minutes long. "'Look here,' said the Dodger, drawing forth a handful of shillings and halfpence. "'Here's a jolly life. What's the odds where it comes from? Here, catch all. There's plenty more where they were took from. You won't, won't you? Oh, you precious flat!' "'It's not tea, ain't it, Oliver?' inquired Charlie Bates. "'He'll come to be scragged, won't he?' "'I don't know what that means,' replied Oliver. "'Something in this way, old fella," said Charlie. As he said it, Master Bates caught up an end of his neckerchief, and holding it erect in the air, dropped his head on his shoulder and jerked a curious sound through his teeth, thereby indicating, by a lively pantomimic representation, that scragging and hanging were one and the same thing. "'And that's what he means.' said charlie look how he stays jack i never did see such prime company as our boy he'll be the death of me i know we will master charlie bates having laughed heartily again resumed his pipe with tears in his eyes you've been brought up bad said the dodger surveying his boots with much satisfaction when oliver had polished them fagin'll make something of you though or you'll be the first one he ever had that turned out unprofitable you better begin at once if you'll come to the trade long before you think of it and you're only losing time oliver Master Bates backed this advice with sundry moral admonitions of his own, which being exhausted, he and his friend Mr. Dawkins launched into a glowing description of the numerous pleasures incidental to the life they led, interspersed with a variety of hints to Oliver that the best thing he could do would be to secure Fagin's favour without more delay by the means which they themselves had employed to gain it. "'And always put this in your pipe, Nellie,' said the Dodger, as the Jew was heard unlocking the door above. "'If you don't take foggles and tickers—' "'What's the good for talking in that way?' interposed master bates you don't know what you mean if you don't take pocket handkerchiefs and watches said the dodger reducing his conversation to the level of oliver's capacity some other cove will so the, the coves that lose them will be all the worse and you'll be all the worse too and nobody half a half earth the better except the chap what gets them and you've just as good a right to them as they have to be sure to be sure said the jew who had entered unseen by oliver it all lies in a nutshell my dear in a nutshell take the dodger's word for it <laughs> he understands the catechism of his trade the old man rubbed his hands gleefully together as he corroborated the dodger's reasoning in these terms and chuckled with delight at his pupil's proficiency the conversation proceeded no farther at this time for the jew had returned home accompanied by miss betsy and a gentleman whom oliver had never seen before but who was accosted by the dodger as tom chitling and who having lingered on the stairs to exchange a few gallantries with the lady now made his appearance mr chitling was older in years than the dodger having perhaps numbered eighteen winters but there was a degree of deference in his deportment towards that younger gentleman which seemed to indicate that he felt himself conscious of a slight inferiority in point of genius and professional acquirements he had small twinkling eyes and a pock-marked face wore a fur cap, a dark corduroy jacket, greasy fustian trousers, and an apron. His wardrobe was, in truth, rather out of repair, but he excused himself to the company by stating that his time was only out an hour before, and that, in consequence of having worn the regimentals for six weeks past, he had not been able to bestow any attention on his private clothes. Mr. Chitling added, with strong marks of irritation, that the new way of fumigating clothes up yonder was infernal unconstitutional, for it burnt holes in them, and there was no remedy against the county. The same remark he considered to apply to the regulation mode of cutting the hair, which he held to be decidedly unlawful. Mr. Chitling wound up his observations by stating that he had not touched a drop of anything for forty-two moral, long, hard-working days, and that he wished he might be busted, if he wasn't dry as a lime basket. "'Where do you think the gentleman has come from, Oliver?' inquired the Jew with a grin as the other boys put a bottle of spirits on the table. "'I... I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Who's that?' inquired Tom Chitling, casting a contemptuous look at Oliver. 
a young friend of mine my dear replied the jew he's in luck then said the young man with a meaning look at fagin never mind where i came from young un you'll find your way there soon enough i'll bet a crayon at this sally the boys laughed after some more jokes on the same subject they exchanged a few short whispers with fagin and withdrew after some words apart between the last comer and fagin they drew their chairs towards the fire and the jew telling oliver to come and sit by him led the conversation to the topics most calculated to interest his hearers these were the great advantages of the trade the proficiency of the dodger the amiability of charlie bates and the liberality of the jew himself at length these subjects displayed signs of being thoroughly exhausted and mr chitling did the same for the house of correction becomes fatiguing after a week or two miss betsy accordingly withdrew and left the party to their repose from this day oliver was seldom left alone but was placed in almost constant communication with the two boys who played the old game with the jew every day whether for their own improvement or oliver's mr fagin best knew at other times the old man would tell them stories of robberies he had committed in his younger days mixed up with so much that was droll and curious that oliver could not help laughing heartily and showing that he was amused in spite of all his better feelings in short the wily old jew had the boy in his toils having prepared his mind by solitude and gloom to prefer any society to the companionship of his own sad thoughts in such a dreary place he was now slowly instilling into his soul the poison which he hoped would blacken it and change its hue for ever end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org oliver twist by charles dickens chapter 19 in which a notable plan is discussed and determined on it was a chill damp windy night when the jew buttoning his greatcoat tight round his shriveled body and pulling the collar up over his ears so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face emerged from his den he paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him and having listened while the boys made all secure and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible slunk down the street as quickly as he could the house to which oliver had been conveyed was in the neighborhood of whitechapel the jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street and glancing suspiciously round crossed the road and struck off in the direction of the spitalfields the mud lay thick upon the stones and a black mist hung over the streets the rain fell sluggishly down and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch it seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the jew to be abroad as he glided stealthily along creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal he kept his course through many winding and narrow ways until he reached bethnal green then turning suddenly off to the left he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter the jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way he hurried through several alleys and streets and at length turned into one lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end at the door of a house in this street he knocked having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it he walked upstairs a dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door and a man's voice demanded who was there only me bill only me my dear said the jew looking in bring your body in then said sykes lie down you stupid brute don't you know the devil when he's got a great coat on apparently the dog had been somewhat deceived by mr fagin's outer garment for as the jew unbuttoned it and threw it over the back of a chair he retired to the corner from which he had risen wagging his tail as he went to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be well said sykes well my dear replied the jew ah oh, nancy the latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception for mr fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of oliver 
all doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behavior. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his, without saying more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. "'It is cold, Nancy, dear,' said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. "'It seems to go right through one,' added the old man, touching his side. "'It must be a piercer, if it finds its way through your heart,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Give him something to drink, Nancy.' "'Burn my body! Make haste! "'It's enough to turn a man ill "'to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way, "'like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave.' "'Nancy quickly brought a bottle from a cupboard, "'in which there were many, "'which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, "'were filled with several kinds of liquids. "'Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, "'bade the Jew drink it off. "'Quite enough!' quite thank you bill replied the jew putting down the glass after just setting his lips to it what you're afraid of our getting the better of you are you inquired sykes fixing his eyes on the jew <sighs> with a hoarse grunt of contempt mr sykes seized the glass and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself which he did at once the jew glanced round the room as his companion tossed down the second glassful not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life-preserver that hung over the chimney-piece. "'There,' said Sykes, smacking his lips. "'Near I'm ready. For business?' inquired the jew for business replied sykes so say what you got to say about the crib at chersty bill said the jew drawing his chair forward and speaking in a very low voice yes what about it inquired sykes ah you know what i mean my dear said the jew he knows what i mean nancy don't he no he don't sneered mr sykes or he won't and that's the same thing Speak out and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me and ints as if you weren't the very first that thought about a robbery. What do you mean? Hush, Bill, hush, said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us. Let him hear, said Sykes. I don't care. But as Mr. Sykes did care on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words and grew calmer. "'There, there,' said the Jew coaxingly. "'It was only my caution, nothing more. Now, my dear, about the crib at Charity, when is it to be done, Bill, eh? When is it to be done? Such plate, my dear, such plate!' said the Jew, rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. "'Not at all,' replied Sykes coldly. "'Not to be done at all,' echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. "'No, not at all,' rejoined Sykes. "'At least it can't be a put-up job, as we expected.' "'Then it hasn't been properly gone about,' said the Jew, turning pale with anger. "'Don't tell me!' "'But I will tell you,' retorted Sykes. "'Who are you that's not to be told?' I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yes, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had him these twenty years, and if you were to give him five hundred pounds, they wouldn't be in it. Do you mean to say, my dear, remonstrated the Jew, that the women can't be got over? Not a bit of it, replied Sykes. Not by flash, Toby Crockett, said the Jew incredulously. Think what women are, Bill. No, not even by flash, Toby Crockett, replied Sykes. He says he's worn sham whiskers and a canary waistcoat. The whole blessed time he's been loitering down there. And it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios and a pair of military trousers, my dear, said the Jew. So he did, 
rejoined Sykes. And they weren't of no more use than the other plant. The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said with a deep sigh that if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. And yet, said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we had set our hearts upon it. So it is, said Mr. Sykes. Worse luck. A long silence ensued, during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy, perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire as if she had been deaf to all that passed. Fagin, said Sykes abruptly, breaking the stillness that prevailed. Is it worth fifty shiners extra if it's safely done from the outside? Yes, said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. Is it a bargain? inquired Sykes. Yes, my dear, yes, rejoined the Jew, his eyes glistening and every muscle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. Then, said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, let you come off as soon as you like. Toby and me were over the garden wall the night afore last, sounding the panels of the door and shutters. The crib's barred up at night like a jail, but there's one part we can crack, safe and softly. Which is that, Bill? asked the Jew eagerly. Why? whispered Sykes. As you cross the lawn. Yes? said the Jew, bending his head forward with his eyes almost starting out of it. <sighs> cried Sykes, stopping short as the girl, scarcely moving her head, looked suddenly round and pointed for an instant to the Jew's face. Never mind which part it is. You can't do it without me, I know, but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you. As you like, my dear, as you like, replied the Jew. Is there no help wanted but yours and Toby's? None, said Sykes. Except to sit a bit and a boy the first we both got the second you must find us a boy exclaimed the jew oh then it's a panel eh never mind what it is replied sykes i want a boy and he mustn't be a big un lord said mr sykes reflectively if i'd only got that young boy of ned the chimbley sweepers he kept him small on purpose and let him out by the job but the father gets lagged, and then a juvenile delinquent society comes and takes a boy away from a trade where he was earning money, teaches him to read and write, and in time makes a prentice of him. And so they go on, said Mr. Sykes, his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs. So they go on, and if they got money enough, which is a providence, they haven't, we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the old trade in a year or two. No more we should, acquiesced the Jew, who had been considering during this speech and had only caught the last sentence. Bill! What now? inquired Sykes. The Jew nodded his head towards Nancy, who was still gazing at the fire, and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room. Sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently, as if he thought the precaution unnecessary but complied nevertheless by requesting miss nancy to fetch him a jug of beer you don't want any beer said nancy folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly i tell you i do replied sykes nonsense rejoined the girl coolly go on fagin i know what he's going to say bill he needn't mind me the jew still hesitated sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise why you don't mind the old girl do you fagin he asked at length You've known her long enough to trust her, or the devil's in it. She ain't one to blab, are you, Nancy? I should think not, replied the young lady, drawing her chair up to the table and putting her elbows upon it. No, no, my dear, I know you're not, said the Jew. But— And again the old man paused. But what? inquired Sykes. I didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts, you know, my dear— as she was the other night replied the jew at this confession miss nancy burst into a loud laugh 
and swallowing a glass of brandy shook her head with an air of defiance and burst into sundry exclamations of keep the game a-goin never say die and the like these seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen for the jew nodded his head with a satisfied air and resumed his seat as did mr sykes likewise now fagin said nancy with a laugh tell bill at once about oliver ha <laughs> you're a clever one my dear the sharpest girl i ever saw said the jew patting her on the neck it was about oliver i was going to speak sure enough <laughs> what about him demanded sykes he's the boy for you my dear replied the jew in a hoarse whisper laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully hey exclaimed sykes have him bill said nancy i would if i was in your place he mayn't be so much up as any of the others but that's not what you want if he's only to open a door for you depend on it he's a safe one bill i know he is rejoined fagin he's been in good training these last few weeks and it's time he began to work for his bread besides the others are all too big well he's just the size i want said mr sykes ruminating and we'll do everything you want bill my dear interposed the jew he can't help himself that is if you frighten him enough frighten him echoed sykes it'll be no sham frightening mind you if there's anything queer about him once we get into the work him for a penny him for a pound you won't see him alive again fagin think of that before you send him mark my words said the robber poising a crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead i've thought of it all said the jew with energy i I've, I've had my eye upon him my dears close close once let him feel that he is one of us once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief and he's ours ours for life oh it couldn't have come about better the old man crossed his arms upon his breast and drawing his head and shoulders into a heap literally hugged himself for joy ours said sykes yours you mean perhaps i do my dear said the jew with a shrill chuckle mine if you like bill and what said sykes scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend what makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night as you might pick and choose from because they're of no use to me my dear replied the jew with some confusion not worth the taking their looks convict him when they get into trouble and i lose em all with this boy properly managed my dears i could do what i couldn't with twenty of them besides said the jew recovering his self-possession he has us now if he could only give us leg bail again and he must be in the same boat with us never mind how he came there it's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery that's all i want now how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way which would be dangerous and we should lose by it besides when is it to be done asked nancy stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of mr sykes expressive of the disgust with which he received fagin's affectation of humanity Ah to be sure said the jew when is it to be done bill oh, i plan with toby the night after to-morrow rejoined sykes in a surly voice if he heard nothing from me to the contrary good said the jew there's no moon no rejoined sykes it's all arranged about bringing off the swag is it asked the jew sykes nodded and about oh ah it's all planned rejoined sykes interrupting him never mind particulars you better bring the boy here to-morrow night i shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak then you hold your tongue and keep the milking pot ready and that's all you'll have to do after some discussion in which all three took an active part it was decided that nancy should repair to the jews next evening when the night had set in and bring oliver away with her fagin craftily observing that if he evinced any disinclination to the task he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had so recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else 
it was also solemnly arranged that poor oliver should for the purposes of the contemplated expedition be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of mr william sykes and further that the said sykes should deal with him as he thought fit and should not be held responsible by the jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him it being understood that to render the compact in this respect binding any representations made by mr sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated in all important particulars by the testimony of flash toby crackett these preliminaries adjusted mr sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song mingled with wild execrations at length in a fit of professional enthusiasm he insisted upon producing his box of housebreaking tools which he had no sooner stumbled in with and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained and the peculiar beauties of their construction than he fell over the box upon the floor and went to sleep where he fell good night nancy said the jew muffling himself up as before good night their eyes met and the jew scrutinized her narrowly there was no flinching about the girl she was as true and earnest in the manner as toby crackett himself could be the jew again bade her good night and bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of mr sykes while her back was turned groped downstairs always the way muttered the jew to himself as he turned homeward the worst of these women is that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling and the best of them that it never lasts <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections mr fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode where the dodger was sitting up impatiently awaiting his return is oliver abed i want to speak to him was his first remark as they descended the stairs hours ago replied the dodger throwing open a door there he is the boy was lying fast asleep on a rude bed upon the floor so pale with anxiety and sadness and the closeness of his prison that he looked like death not death as it shows in shroud and coffin but in the guise it wears when life has just departed when a young and gentle spirit has but an instant fled to heaven and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed not now said the jew turning softly away to-morrow to-morrow end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty, wherein Oliver is delivered to Mr. William Sykes. When Oliver awoke in the morning, he was a good deal surprised to find that a new pair of shoes with strong, thick soles had been placed at his bedside, and that his old shoes had been removed at first he was pleased with the discovery hoping that it might be the forerunner of his release but such thoughts were quickly dispelled on his sitting down to breakfast along with the jew who told him in a tone and manner which increased his alarm that he was to be taken to the residence of bill sykes that night to to stop there sir asked oliver anxiously no no my dear not to stop there replied the jew we shouldn't like to lose you don't be afraid oliver you shall come back to us again <laughs> we won't be so cruel as to send you away my dear oh no no the old man who was stooping over the fire toasting a piece of bread looked round as he bantered oliver thus and chuckled as if to show that he knew he would still be very glad to get away if he could i suppose said the jew fixing his eyes on oliver you want to know what you're going to bills for eh my dear Oliver colored involuntarily to find that the old thief had been reading his thoughts, but boldly said, Yes, he did want to know. Why, what do you think? inquired Fagin, parrying the question. Indeed, I don't know, sir, replied Oliver. Bah! said the Jew, turning away with a disappointed countenance from a close perusal of the boy's face. Wait till Bill tells you, then. The Jew seemed much vexed by Oliver's not expressing any greater curiosity on the subject, but the truth is that although Oliver felt very anxious, he was too much confused by the earnest cunning of Fagin's looks and his own speculations to make any further inquiries just then. 
he had no other opportunity for the jew remained very surly and silent till night when he prepared to go abroad you may burn a candle said the jew putting one upon the table and here's a book for you to read till they come to fetch you good night good night replied oliver softly the jew walked to the door looking over his shoulder at the boy as he went suddenly stopping he called him by his name oliver looked up the jew pointing to the candle motioned him to light it he did so and as he placed the candlestick upon the table saw that the jew was gazing fixedly at him with lowering and contracted brows from the dark end of the room take heed oliver take heed said the old man shaking his right hand before him in a warning manner he's a rough man and thinks nothing of blood when his own is up whatever falls out say nothing and do what he bids you mind placing a strong emphasis on the last word he suffered his features gradually to resolve themselves into a ghastly grin and nodding his head left the room oliver leaned his head upon his hand when the old man disappeared and pondered with a trembling heart on the words he had just heard the more he thought of the jew's admonition the more he was at loss to divine its real purpose and meaning he could think of no bad object to be attained by sending him to sykes which would not be equally well answered by his remaining with fagin and after meditating for a long time concluded that he had been selected to perform some ordinary menial offices for the housebreaker until another boy better suited for his purpose could be engaged he was too well accustomed to suffering and had suffered too much where he was to bewail the prospect of change very severely he remained lost in thought for some minutes and then with a heavy sigh snuffed the candle and taking up the book which the jew had left with him began to read he turned over the leaves carelessly at first but lighting on a passage which attracted his attention he soon became intent upon the volume it was a history of the lives and trials of great criminals and the pages were soiled and thumbed with use here he read of dreadful crimes that made the blood run cold of secret murders that had been committed by the lonely wayside of bodies hidden from the eye of man in deep pits and wells which would not keep them down deep as they were but had yielded them up at last after many years and so maddened the murderers with the sight that in their horror they had confessed their guilt and yelled for the gibbet to end their agony here too he read of men who lying in their beds at dead of night had been tempted so they said and led on by their own bad thoughts to such dreadful bloodshed as it made the flesh creep and the limbs quail to think of the terrible descriptions were so real and vivid that the sallow pages seemed to turn red with gore and the words upon them to be sounded in his ears as if they were whispered in hollow murmurs by the spirits of the dead in a paroxysm of fear the boy closed the book and thrust it from him then falling upon his knees he prayed heaven to spare him from such deeds and rather to will that he should die at once than be reserved for crimes so fearful and appalling by degrees he grew more calm and besought in a low and broken voice that he might be rescued from his present dangers and that if any aid were to be raised up for a poor outcast boy who had never known the love of friends or kindred it might come to him now when desolate and deserted he stood alone in the midst of wickedness and guilt he had concluded his prayer but still remained with his head buried in his hands when a rustling noise aroused him what's that he cried starting up and catching sight of a figure standing by the door who's there me only me replied a tremulous voice oliver raised the candle above his head and looked towards the door it was nancy put down the light said the girl turning away her head it hurts my eyes oliver saw that she was very pale and gently inquired if she were ill the girl threw herself into a chair with her back towards him and wrung her hands but made no reply god forgive me she cried after a while i never thought of this has anything happened asked oliver can i help you i will if i can i will indeed she rocked herself to and fro caught her throat and uttering a gurgling sound gasped for breath nancy cried oliver what is it the girl beat her hands upon her knees and her feet upon the ground and suddenly stopping drew her shawl close round her and shivered with cold oliver stirred the fire drawing her chair close to it she sat there for a little time without speaking but at length she raised her head and looked round i don't know what comes over me sometimes said she affecting to busy herself in arranging her dress it's this damp dirty room i think no no lady are you ready am i to go with you asked oliver yes i've come from bill replied the girl you ought to go with me what for asked oliver recoiling what for 
echoed the girl, raising her eyes and averting them again, the moment they encountered the boy's face. "'Oh, for no harm. I don't believe it,' said Oliver, who had watched her closely. "'Have it your own way,' rejoined the girl, affecting to laugh. <laughs> "'For no good, then.' Oliver could see that he had some power over the girl's better feelings, and for an instant thought of appealing to her compassion for his helpless state. But then the thought darted across his mind that it was barely eleven o'clock, and that many people were still in the streets, of whom surely some might be found to give credence to his tale. As the reflection occurred to him, he stepped forward and said, somewhat hastily, that he was ready. Neither his brief consideration nor its purport was lost on his companion she eyed him narrowly while he spoke and cast upon him a look of intelligence which sufficiently showed that she guessed what had been passing in his thoughts hush said the girl stooping over him and pointing to the door as she looked cautiously round you can't help yourself i tried hard for you but all to no purpose you are hedged round and round if ever you are to get loose from here this is not the time struck by the energy of her manner oliver looked up in her face with great surprise she seemed to speak the truth her countenance was white and agitated, and she trembled with very earnestness. "'I have saved you from being ill-used once, and I will again, and I do now,' continued the girl aloud. "'For those who fetched you, if I had not, would have been far more rough than me. I have promised for your being quiet and silent. If you are not, you will only do harm to yourself and me too, and perhaps be my death. See here, I have done all this for you already, as true as God sees me show it.' She pointed hastily to some livid bruises on her neck and arms, and continued with great rapidity. "'Remember this, and don't let me suffer more for you just now. "'If I can help you, I would, but I have not the power. "'Whatever they make you do is no fault of yours. "'Hush! Every word from you is a blow for me. "'Give me your hand. Make haste your hand.' "'She caught the hand which Oliver instinctively placed in hers, "'and blowing out the light drew him after her up the stairs. "'The door was opened quickly by someone shrouded in the darkness "'and was quickly closed when they had passed out. "'A hackney cabriolet was in waiting.' With the same vehemence which she had exhibited in addressing Oliver, the girl pulled him in with her, and drew the curtains close. The driver wanted no directions, but lashed his horse into full speed, without the delay of an instant. The girl still held Oliver fast by the hand, and continued to pour into his ear the warnings and assurances she had already imparted. All was so quick and hurried that he scarcely had time to recollect where he was or how he came there, when the carriage stopped at the house to which the Jew's steps had been directed on the previous evening. For one brief moment Oliver cast a hurried glance along the emptied street, and a cry for help hung on his lips. But the girl's voice was in his ear, beseeching him in such tones of agony to remember her that he had not the heart to utter it. While he hesitated, the opportunity was gone. He was already in the house, and the door was shut this way said the girl releasing her hold for the first time bill hello replied sykes appearing at the head of the stairs with a candle oh it's the time of day come on this was a very strong expression of approbation an uncommonly hearty welcome from a person of mr sykes's temperament nancy appearing much gratified thereby saluted him cordially bull's eyes gone over with tom observed sykes as he lightened them up who'd have been in the way that's right rejoined Nancy. "'So you've got a kid?' said Sykes, when they had all reached the room, closing the door as he spoke. "'Yes, there he is,' replied Nancy. "'Did he come quiet?' inquired Sykes. "'Like a lamb,' rejoined Nancy. Oh, "'I'm glad to hear it,' said Sykes, looking grimly at Oliver. "'For the sake of his young carcase, as would otherwise have suffered for it. Come here, young un, and let me read you a lecture.' which is as well got over at once thus addressing his new pupil mr sykes pulled off oliver's cap and threw it into a corner and then taking him by the shoulder sat himself down by the table and stood the boy in front of him now first do you know what this is inquired sykes taking up a pocket pistol which lay on the table oliver replied in the affirmative well then look here continued sykes this is powder that is a bullet and this is a little bit of an old et for wadden. Oliver murmured his comprehension of the different bodies referred to, and Mr. Sykes proceeded to load the pistol with great nicety and deliberation. Now it's loaded, said Mr. Sykes when he had finished. Yes, I see it is, sir, replied Oliver. Well, said the robber, grasping Oliver's wrist and putting the barrel so close to his temple that they touched, at which moment the boy could not repress a start. If you speak a word when you're out of doors with me, except when I speak to you, 
That loading will be in your head without notice. Now, if you do make up your mind to speak without leave, say your prayers first. Having bestowed a scowl upon the object of this warning to increase its effect, Mr. Sykes continued, As near as I know, there isn't anybody as will be asking very particular after you, if you was disposed of. So I needn't take this devil and all of a trouble to explain matters to you, if it weren't for your own good. Do you hear me? The short and long of what you mean, said Nancy, speaking very emphatically, and slightly frowning at Oliver, as if to bespeak his serious attention to her words. Is that if you cross by him in this job you have on hand, you'll prevent his ever telling tales afterwards by shooting through the head, taking your chance of swinging for it as you do for many great other things in the way of business every month of your life. That's it, observed Mr. Sykes approvingly. Women can always put things in fewest words, except when it's blowing up, and then they lengthens it out. And now that it's thoroughly up to it, let's have some supper and get a snooze before starting. In pursuance of this request, Nancy quickly laid the cloth. Disappearing for a few minutes, she presently returned with a pot of porter and a dish of sheep's heads, which gave occasion to several pleasant witticisms on the part of Mr. Sykes, founded upon the singular coincidence of Jemmy's being a can name common to them, and also to an ingenious implement much used in his profession. Indeed, the worthy gentleman, stimulated perhaps by the immediate prospect of being on active service, was in great spirits and good humor, in proof whereof it may be here remarked that he humorously drank all the beer at a draught, and did not utter, on a rough calculation, more than four score oaths during the whole progress of the meal. Supper being ended, it may be easily conceived that Oliver had no great appetite for it. Mr. Sykes disposed of a couple of glasses of spirits and water, and threw himself on the bed, ordering Nancy, with many imprecations in case of failure, to call him at five precisely. Oliver stretched himself in his clothes, by command of the same authority, on a mattress upon the floor, and the girl, mending the fire, sat before it, in readiness to rouse them at the appointed time. For a long time Oliver lay awake, thinking it not impossible that Nancy might seek that opportunity of whispering some further advice, but the girl sat brooding over the fire without moving, save now and then to trim the light. Weary with watching and anxiety, he at length fell asleep. When he awoke the table was covered with tea-things, and Sykes was thrusting various articles into the pockets of his greatcoat, which hung over the back of a chair. Nancy was busily engaged in preparing breakfast. It was not yet daylight, for the candle was still burning, and it was quite dark outside. A sharp rain, too, was beating against the window-panes, and the sky looked black and cloudy. "'Now, yeah, then,' growled Sykes, as Oliver started up. "'Half past five. Look sharp, or you'll get no breakfast, for it's late as it is.' Oliver was not long in making his toilet. Having eaten some breakfast, he replied to a surly inquiry from Sykes by saying that he was quite ready. Nancy, scarcely looking at the boy, threw him a handkerchief to tie round his throat. Sykes gave him a large, rough cape to button over his shoulders. Thus attired, he gave his hand to the robber, who, merely pausing to show him with a menacing gesture that he had that same pistol in a side pocket of his greatcoat, clasped it firmly in his, and, exchanging a farewell with Nancy, led him away. Oliver turned for an instant when they reached the door, in the hope of meeting a look from the girl but she had resumed her old seat in front of the fire and sat perfectly motionless before it. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Oliver Twist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 21 the expedition it was a cheerless morning when they got into the street blowing and raining hard and the clouds looking dull and stormy the night had been very wet large pools of water had collected in the road and the kennels were overflowing there was a faint glimmering of the coming day in the sky but it rather aggravated than relieved the gloom of the scene the sombre light only serving to pale that which the street lamps afforded without shedding any warmer or brighter tints upon the wet housetops and dreary streets. There appeared to be nobody stirring in that quarter of the town. The windows of the houses were all closely shut, and the streets through which they passed were noiseless and empty. 
by the time they had turned into the bethnal green road the day had fairly begun to break many of the lamps were already extinguished a few country wagons were slowly toiling on towards london now and then a stage-coach covered with mud rattled briskly by the driver bestowing as he passed an admonitory lash upon the heavy wagoner who by keeping on the wrong side of the road had endangered his arriving at the office a quarter of a minute after his time the public houses with gaslights burning inside were already open by degrees other shops began to be unclosed and a few scattered people were met with then came straggling groups of laborers going to their work then men and women with fish baskets on their heads donkey laden carts with vegetables chaise carts filled with livestock or whole carcasses of meat milk women with pails an unbroken concourse of people trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town as they approached the city the noise and traffic gradually increased when they threaded the streets between shoreditch and smithfield it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle it was as light as it was likely to be till night came on again and the busy morning of half the london population had begun turning down sun street and crown street and crossing finsbury square mr sykes struck by the way of chiswell street into barbican thence into long lane and so into smithfield from which latter place arose a tumult of discordant sounds that filled oliver twist with amazement it was market morning the ground was covered nearly ankle-deep with filth and mire a thick steam perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle and mingling with the fog which seemed to rest upon the chimney-tops hung heavily above all the pens in the centre of the large area and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space were filled with sheep tied up to posts by the gutter side were long lines of beasts and oxen three or four deep countrymen butchers drovers hawkers boys thieves idlers and vagabonds of every low grade were mingled together in a mass the whistling of drovers the barking dogs the bellowing and plunging of the oxen the bleeding of sheep the grunting and squeaking of pigs the cries of the hawkers the shouts oaths and quarrelling on all sides the ringing of bells and roar of voices that issued from every public-house the crowding pushing driving beating whooping and yelling the hideous discordant dim that resounded from every corner of the market and the unwashed unshaven squalid and dirty figures constantly running to and fro and bursting in and out of the throng rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene which quite confounded the senses mr sykes dragging oliver after him elbowed his way through the thickest of the crowd and bestowed very little attention on the numerous sights and sounds which so astonished the boy he nodded twice or thrice to a passing friend and resisting as many invitations to take a morning dram pressed steadily onward until they were clear of the turmoil and had made their way through hosier lane into holborn now young un said sykes looking up at the clock of st andrew's church hard upon seven you must step out come don't lag behind already lazy legs mr sykes accompanied this speech with a jerk at his little companion's wrist oliver quickening his pace into a kind of trot between a fast walk and a run kept up with the rapid strides of the housebreaker as well as he could they held their course at this rate until they had passed hyde park corner and were on their way to kensington when sykes relaxed his pace until an empty cart which was at some little distance behind came up seeing hounslow written on it he asked the driver with as much civility as he could assume if he would give them a lift as far as isleworth jump up said the man is that your boy yes he's my boy replied sykes looking hard at oliver and putting his hand abstractedly into the pocket where the pistol was your father walks rather too quick for you don't he my man inquired the driver seeing that oliver was out of breath not a bit of it replied sykes interposing he's used to it here take hold of my hand ned in with you thus addressing oliver he helped him into the cart and the driver pointing to a heap of sacks told him to lie down there and rest himself as they passed the different milestones oliver wondered more and more where his companion meant to take him kensington hammersmith chiswick kewbridge brentford were all passed and yet they went on as steadily as if they had only just begun their journey at length they came to a public-house called the coach and horses a little way beyond which another road appeared to run off and here the cart stopped 
sykes dismounted with great precipitation holding oliver by the hand all the while and lifting him down directly bestowed a furious look upon him and rapped the side pocket with his fist in a significant manner good-bye boy said the man a sulky replied sykes giving him a shake e sulky a young dog don't mind him not i rejoined the other getting into his cart it's a fine day after all and he drove away sykes waited until he had fairly gone and then telling oliver he might look about him if he wanted once again led him onward on his journey they turned round to the left a short way past the public house and then taking a right-hand road walked on for a long time passing many large gardens and gentlemen's houses on both sides of the way and stopping for nothing but a little beer until they reached a town here against the wall of a house oliver saw written up in pretty large letters hampton they lingered about in the fields for some hours at length they came back into the town and turning into an old public house with a defaced signboard ordered some dinner by the kitchen fire the kitchen was an old low-roofed room with a great beam across the middle of the ceiling and benches with high backs to them by the fire on which were seated several rough men in smock frocks drinking and smoking they took no notice of oliver and very little of sykes and as sykes took very little notice of them he and his young comrade sat in a corner by themselves without being much troubled by their company they had some cold meat for dinner and sat so long after it while mr sykes indulged himself with three or four pipes that oliver began to feel quite certain they were not going any further being much tired with the walk and getting up so early he dozed a little at first then quite overpowered by fatigue and the fumes of the tobacco fell asleep it was quite dark when he was awakened by a push from sykes rousing himself sufficiently to sit up and look about him he found that worthy in close fellowship and communication with a laboring man over a pint of ale so you're going on to lowy alleyford are you inquired sykes yes i am replied the man who seemed a little the worse or better as the case may be for drinking and not slow about it neither my horse hasn't got a load behind him going back as he had coming up in the morning and he won't be along a doing of it here's luck to him he cod he's a good un would you give my boy and me a lift as far as there demanded sykes pushing the ale towards his new friend if you're going directly i can replied the man looking out of the pot are you going to halliford going on to shepperton replied sykes i'm your man as far as i go replied the other is all paid becky yes the other gentleman's paid replied the girl i say said the man with tipsy gravity that won't do you know why not rejoined sykes you're a going to accommodate us and what's to prevent my standing treat for a pint or so in return the stranger reflected upon this argument with a very profound face having done so he seized sykes by the hand and declared he was a real good fellow to which mr sykes replied he was joking as if he had been sober there would have been strong reason to suppose he was after the exchange of a few more compliments they bade the company good night and went out the girl gathering up the pots and glasses as they did so and lounging out to the door with her hands full to see the party start the horse whose health had been drunk in his absence was standing outside ready harnessed to the cart oliver and sykes got in without any further ceremony and the man to whom he belonged having lingered for a minute or two to bear him up and to defy the hostler and the world to produce his equal mounted also then the hostler was told to give the horse his head and his head being given to him he made a very unpleasant use of it tossing it into the air with great disdain and running into the parlor windows over the way after performing those feats and supporting himself for a short time on his hind legs he started off at great speed and rattled out of the town right gallantly the night was very dark a damp mist rose from the river and the marshy ground about and spread itself over the dreary fields it was piercing cold too all was gloomy and black not a word was spoken for the driver had grown sleepy and sykes was in no mood to lead him into conversation oliver sat huddled together in a corner of the cart bewildered with alarm and apprehension and figuring strange objects in the gaunt trees whose branches waved grimly to and fro as if in some fantastic joy at the desolation of the scene as they passed the sunbury church the clock struck seven there was a light in the ferry house window opposite which streamed across the road and threw into the more sombre shadow a dark yew tree with graves beneath it 
There was a dull sound of falling water not far off, and the leaves of the old tree stirred gently in the night wind. It seemed like quiet music for the repose of the dead. Sunbury was passed through, and they came again into the lonely road. Two or three miles more, and the cart stopped. Sykes alighted, took Oliver by the hand, and they once again walked on. They turned into no house at Shepperton, as the weary boy had expected, but still kept walking on, in mud and darkness, through gloomy lanes and over cold open wastes, until they came within sights of the lights of a town at no great distance. On looking intently forward, Oliver saw that the water was just below them, and that they were coming to the foot of a bridge. Sykes kept straight on until they were close upon the bridge, then turned suddenly down a bank upon the left. "'The water!' thought Oliver, turning sick with fear. "'He's brought me to this lonely place to murder me!' He was about to throw himself on the ground and make one struggle for his young life when he saw that they stood before a solitary house, all ruinous and decayed. There was a window on each side of the dilapidated entrance, and one story above, but no light was visible. The house was dark, dismantled, and the all appearance uninhabited. Sykes, with Oliver's hand still in his, softly approached the low porch and raised the latch. The door yielded to the pressure, and they passed in together. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Oliver Twist this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 22 The Burglary. Hello? cried a loud, hoarse voice as soon as they set foot in the passage. Don't make such a row, said Sykes, bolting the door. Show a glim, Toby. Aha, my pal cried the same voice. A glim, Barney, a glim. Show the gentleman in, Barney. Wake up first, if convenient. The speaker appeared to throw a boot-jack or some such article at the person he addressed, to rouse him from his slumbers, for the noise of a wooden body falling violently was heard, and then an indistinct muttering, as of a man between sleep and awake. Do you hear? cried the same voice. There's Bill Sykes in the passage with nobody to do the civil to him, and you sleeping there as if you took loud darnum with your meals, and nothing stronger. Are you any fresher now, or do you want the iron candlestick to wake you thoroughly? A pair of slip-shod feet shuffled hastily across the bare floor of the room, as this interrogatory was put, and there issued from a door on the right hand first a feeble candle, and next the form of the same individual who has been heretofore described as laboring under the infirmity of speaking through his nose, and officiating as a waiter at the public house on Saffron Hill. "'Mr. Sykes!' exclaimed Barney, with real or counterfeit joy. "'Good in, sir. Come in.' "'Here, yeah, you get on first, said Sykes, putting Oliver in front of him. "'Wicker, or I shall tread upon your heels.' Muttering a curse upon his tardiness, Sykes pushed Oliver before him, and they entered a low, dark room with a smoky fire, two or three broken chairs, a table, and a very old couch, on which, with his legs much higher than his head, a man was reposing at full length, smoking a long clay pipe. He was dressed in a smartly cut, snuff-colored coat, with large brass buttons, an orange neckerchief, a coarse, staring, shawl-pattern waistcoat, and drab breeches. Mr. Crackett, for he it was, had no very great quantity of hair, either upon his head or face, but what he had was of a reddish dye and tortured into long corkscrew curls, through which he occasionally thrust some very dirty fingers, ornamented with large common rings. He was a trifle above the middle size, and apparently rather weak in the legs, but this circumstance by no means detracted from his own admiration of his top boots which he contemplated in their elevated situation with lively satisfaction. "'Bill, my boy,' said this figure, turning his head towards the door. "'I'm glad to see you. I was almost afraid you'd given it up, in which case I should have made a personal winter. "'Hello!' Uttering this exclamation in a tone of great surprise, as his eyes rested on Oliver, Mr. Toby Crackett brought himself into a sitting posture and demanded who that was. "'The boy. Are you the boy?' replied Sykes, drawing a chair towards the fire. "'What of Mr. Fadgett's lads?' exclaimed Barney with a grin. "'Fagins, eh?' exclaimed Toby, looking at Oliver. "'What an invaluable boy that'll make. 
for the old lady's pockets and chapels. His mug's a fortune to him. Eh, there's enough of that interposed sykes impatiently and stooping over his recumbent friend he whispered a few words in his ear at which mr crackett laughed immensely and honored oliver with a long stare of astonishment now said sykes as he resumed his seat if you'll give us something to eat and drink while we're waiting you'll put some art in us or in me at all events sit down by the fire yonker and rest yourself for you'll have to go out with us again to-night no, not very far off. Oliver looked at Sykes, in mute and timid wonder, and drawing a stool to the fire sat with his aching head upon his hands, scarcely knowing where he was or what was passing around him. Here, said Toby, as the young Jew placed some fragments of food and a bottle upon the table. Success to the crack. He rose to honor the toast, and, carefully depositing his empty pipe in a corner, advanced to the table, filled a glass with spirits, and drank off its contents. Mr. Sykes did the same. A drain for the boy, said Toby, half filling a wine glass. Down with it, innocence. Indeed, said Oliver, looking piteously up into the man's face. Indeed, I— Down with it, echoed Toby. Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Tell him to drink it, Bill. Yeah, beer, said Sykes, clapping his hand upon his pocket. Burn my body! if it isn't more trouble than a whole family of dodgers. Drink it, you perverse imp. Drink it. Frightened by the menacing gestures of the two men, Oliver hastily swallowed the contents of the glass, and immediately fell into a violent fit of coughing, which delighted Toby Crackett and Barney, and even drew a smile from the surly Mr. Sykes. This done, and Sykes having satisfied his appetite, Oliver could eat nothing but a small crust of bread which they made him swallow, the two men laid themselves down on chairs for a short nap. Oliver retained his stool by the fire. Barney, wrapped in a blanket, stretched himself on the floor, close outside the fender. They slept, or appeared to sleep, for some time, nobody stirring but Barney, who rose once or twice to throw coals on the fire. Oliver fell into a heavy doze, imagining himself straying along the gloomy lanes, or wandering about the dark churchyard, or retracing some one or other of the scenes of the past day when he was roused by Toby Crackett, jumping up and declaring it was half-past one. In an instant the other two were on their legs, and all were actively engaged in busy preparation. Sykes and his companion enveloped their necks and chins in large dark shawls, and drew on their greatcoats. Barney, opening a cupboard, brought forth several articles, which he hastily crammed into the pockets. "'Bark for me, Barney,' said Toby Crackett. "'Here they are,' replied Barney, producing a pair of pistols. You loaded them yourself. All right, replied Toby, stowing them away. The persuaders? I've got them, replied Sykes. Crape, keys, centre bits, darkies, nothing forgotten? inquired Toby, fastening a small crowbar to a loop inside the skirt of his coat. All right, rejoined his companion. Bring them bits of timber, Barney. It's the time of day. With these words he took a thick stick from Barney's hands, who, having delivered another to Toby, busied himself in fastening on Oliver's cape. "'Near then,' said Sykes, holding out his hand. Oliver, who was completely stupefied by the unwanted exercise, and the air, and the drink which had been forced upon him, put his hand mechanically into that which Sykes extended for the purpose. "'Take his other hand, Toby,' said Sykes. "'Look out, Barney.' The man went to the door, and returned to announce that all was quiet. The two robbers issued forth with Oliver between them. Barney, having made all fast, rolled himself up as before, and was soon asleep again. It was now intensely dark. The fog was much heavier than it had been in the early part of the night, and the atmosphere was so damp that, although no rain fell, Oliver's hair and eyebrows, within a few minutes after leaving the house, had become stiff with the half-frozen moisture that was floating about. They crossed the bridge and kept on towards the lights which he had seen before. They were at no great distance off, and, as they walked pretty briskly, they soon arrived at Chertsey. "'Slap through the town,' whispered Sykes. "'There'll be nobody in the way to-night to see us.' Toby acquiesced, and they hurried through the main street of the little town, which at that late hour was wholly deserted. A dim light shone at intervals from some bedroom window, and the hoarse barking of dogs occasionally broke the silence of the night but there was nobody abroad. 
they had cleared the town as the church bell struck two quickening their pace they turned up a road upon the left hand after walking about a quarter of a mile they stopped before a detached house surrounded by a wall to the top of which toby crackett scarcely pausing to take breath climbed in a twinkling the boy next said toby hoist him up i'll catch hold of him before oliver had time to look round sykes had caught him under the arms and in three or four seconds he and toby were lying on the grass on the other side sykes followed directly and they stole cautiously towards the house and now for the first time oliver well nigh mad with grief and terror saw that housebreaking and robbery if not murder were the objects of the expedition he clasped his hands together and involuntarily uttered a subdued exclamation of horror a mist came before his eyes the cold sweat stood upon his ashy face his limbs failed him and he sank upon his knees get up murmured sykes trembling with rage and drawing the pistol from his pockets get up or i'll stray your brains upon that grass oh for god's sake let me go cried oliver let me run away and die in the fields i'll never come near london never never oh pray have mercy on me and do not make me steal for the love of all the bright angels that rest in heaven have mercy upon me the man to whom this appeal was made swore a dreadful oath and had cocked the pistol when toby striking it from his grasp placed his hand upon the boy's mouth and dragged him to the house hush cried the man it won't answer here say another word and i'll do your business myself with a crack on the head that makes no noise and is quite as certain and more genteel here bill wrench the shutter open he's game enough now i'll engage i've seen older hands of his age took the same way for a minute or two on a cold night sykes invoking terrific imprecations upon fagin's head for sending oliver on such an errand plied the crowbar vigorously but with little noise after some delay and some assistance from toby the shutter to which he had referred swung open on its hinges it was a little lattice window about five feet and a half above the ground at the back of the house which belonged to a scullery or small brewing place at the end of the passage the aperture was so small that the inmates had probably not thought it worth while to defend it more securely but it was large enough to admit a boy of oliver's size nevertheless a very brief exercise of mr sykes's art sufficed to overcome the fastening of the lattice and it soon stood wide open also now listen you young limb whispered sykes drawing a dark lantern from his pocket and throwing the glare full on oliver's face i'm a-gonna put you through there that is light go softly up the steps straight afore you and along the little hall to the street door unfasten it and let us in there's a bolt at the top you won't be able to reach interposed toby stand upon one of the hall chairs there are three there bill with a jolly large blue unicorn and gold pitchfork on em which is the old lady's arms keep quiet can't you replied sykes with a threatening look the room door is open is it wide replied toby after peeping in to satisfy himself the game of that is that they always leave it open with a catch so that the dog who's got a bed in here may walk up and down the passage when he feels wakeful ha <laughs> ha barney ticed him away to-night so neat although mr crackett spoke in a scarcely audible whisper and laughed without noise sykes imperiously commanded him to be silent and to get to work toby complied by first producing his lantern and placing it on the ground then by planting himself firmly with his head against the wall beneath the window and his hands upon his knees so as to make a step of his back this was no sooner done than sykes mounting upon him put oliver gently through the window with his feet first and without leaving hold of his collar planted him safely on the floor inside take this lantern said sykes looking into the room you see the stairs are for you oliver more dead than alive gasped out yes sykes pointing to the street door with the pistol barrel briefly advised him to take notice that he was within shot all the way and that if he faltered he would fall dead that instant it's done in a minute said sykes in the same low whisper directly i leave go of you do your work hark what's that whispered the other man they listened intently nothing said sykes releasing his hold of oliver now in the short time he had had to collect his senses the boy had firmly resolved that whether he died in the attempt or not he would make one effort to dart upstairs from the hall and alarm the family filled with this idea he advanced at once but stealthily come back 
suddenly cried sykes aloud back back scared by the sudden breaking of the dead stillness of the place and by a loud cry which followed it oliver let his lantern fall and knew not whether to advance or fly the cry was repeated a light appeared a vision of two terrified half-dressed men at the top of the stairs swam before his eyes a flash a loud noise a smoke a crash somewhere but where he knew not and he staggered back sykes had disappeared for an instant but he was up again and had him by the collar before the smoke had cleared away he fired his own pistol after the men who were already retreating and dragged the boy up clasp your arm daughter said sykes as he drew him through the window give me a shawl here they bid him quick there the boy bleeds then came the loud ringing of a bell mingled with the noise of firearms and the shouts of men and the sensation of being carried over uneven ground at a rapid pace and then the noises grew confused in the distance and a cold deadly feeling crept over the boy's heart and he saw or heard no more end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of oliver twist this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 23, which contains the substance of a pleasant conversation between Mr. Bumble and a lady, and shows that even a beetle may be susceptible on some points. The night was bitter cold. The snow lay on the ground frozen into a hard, thick crust, so that only the heaps that had drifted into byways and corners were affected by the sharp wind that howled abroad, which, as if expending increased fury on such prey as it found, caught it savagely up in the clouds, and whirling it into a thousand misty eddies, scattered it in the air. Bleak, dark, and piercing cold, it was a night for the well-housed and fed to draw round the bright fire and thank God they were at home and for the homeless, starving wretch, to lay him down and die. Many hunger-worn outcasts close their eyes in our bare streets, at such times, who let their crimes have been what they may, can hardly open them in a more bitter world. Such was the aspect of out-of-doors affairs, when Mrs. Corney, the matron of the workhouse to which our readers have been already introduced as the birthplace of Oliver Twist, sat herself down before a cheerful fire in her own little room and glanced, with no small degree of complacency, at a small round table, on which stood a tray of corresponding size, furnished with all necessary materials, for the most grateful meal that matrons enjoy. In fact, Mrs. Corney was about to solace herself with a cup of tea. As she glanced from the table to the fireplace, where the smallest of all possible kettles was singing a small song in a small voice, her inward satisfaction evidently increased so much so indeed that mrs corney smiled well said the matron leaning her elbow on the table and looking reflectively at the fire i'm sure we have all on us a great deal to be thankful for a great deal if we did but know it ah mrs corney shook her head mournfully as if deploring the mental blindness of those paupers who did not know it and thrusting a silver spoon private property into the inmost recesses of a two-ounce tin tea-caddy proceeded to make the tea how slight a thing will disturb the equanimity of our frail minds the black teapot being very small and easily filled ran over while mrs corney was moralizing and the water slightly scalded mrs corney's hand ah drat the pot said the worthy matron setting it down very hastily on the hob a little stupid thing that only holds a couple of cups what use is it of to anybody except said mrs corney pausing except to a poor desolate creetur like me oh dear with these words the matron dropped into her chair and once more resting her elbow on the table thought of her solitary fate the small teapot and the single cup had awakened in her mind sad recollections of mr corney who had not been dead more than five-and-twenty years and she was overpowered i shall never get another said mrs corney pettishly i shall never get another like him whether this remark bore references to the husband or the teapot it is uncertain it might have been the latter for mrs corney looked at it as she spoke and took it up afterwards she had just tasted her first cup when she was disturbed by a soft tap at the room door oh come in with you said mrs corney sharply 
Some of the old women dying, I suppose. They always die when I'm at meals. Don't stand there letting the cold air in, don't. What's amiss now, eh? Nothing, ma'am, nothing, replied a man's voice. Dear me, exclaimed the matron in a much sweeter tone. Is that Mr. Bumble? At your service, ma'am said Mr. Bumble, who had been stopping outside to rub his shoes clean, and to shake the snow off his coat, and who now made his appearance bearing the cocked hat in one hand and a bundle in the other. "'Shall I shut the door, ma'am?' The lady modestly hesitated to reply, lest there should be any impropriety in holding an interview with Mr. Bumble with closed doors. Mr. Bumble, taking advantage of the hesitation, and being very cold himself, shut it without permission. "'A hard weather, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron hard indeed ma'am replied the beetle anti-parochial weather this ma'am we have given away mrs corney we have given away a matter of twenty quartern loaves and a cheese and a half this very blessed afternoon and yet them paupers are not contented of course not when would they be mr bumble said the matron sipping her tea when indeed ma'am rejoined mr bumble why there's one man that in consideration of his wife and large family has a quartern loaf and a good pound of cheese full weight is he grateful ma'am is he grateful not a copper farthing's worth of it what does he do ma'am but ask for a few coals it's only a pocket handkerchief full he says coals what would he do with coals toast his cheese with em and then come back for more that's the way with these people ma'am give em an apron full of coals to-day and they'll come back for another the day after to-morrow as brazen as alabaster the matron expressed her entire concurrence in this intelligible simile and the beetle went on i never said mr bumble see anything like the pitch it's got to the day afore yesterday a man you have been a married woman ma'am and i may mention it to you a man with hardly a rag upon his back here mrs corney looked at the floor goes to our overseas door when he has got company coming to dinner he says he must be relieved mrs corney as he wouldn't go away and shock the company very much our overseer sent him out a pound of potatoes and a half pint of oatmeal my heart says the ungrateful villain what's the use of this to me you might as well give me a pair of iron spectacles very good says our overseer taking em away again you won't get anything else here then i'll die in the streets says the vagrant oh no you won't says our overseer <laughs> that was very good so like mr granite wasn't it interposed the matron well mr bumble well ma'am rejoined the beetle he went away and he did die in the streets there's an obstinate pauper for you it beats anything i could have believed observed the matron emphatically but don't you think out-of-door relief a very bad thing anyway mr bumble you're a gentleman of experience and ought to know come mrs corney said the beetle smiling as men smile who are conscious of superior information out-of-door relief properly managed properly managed ma'am is the parochial safeguard the great principle of out-of-door relief is to give the paupers exactly what they don't want and then they get tired of coming dear me exclaimed mrs corney well that is a good one too yes betwixt you and me ma'am returned mr bumble that's the great principle and that's the reason why if you look at any cases that get into them outdacious newspapers you'll always observe that sick families have been relieved with slices of cheese that's the rule now mrs corney all over the country but however said the beetle stopping to unpack his bundle these are official secrets ma'am not to be spoken of except as i may say among the parochial officers such as ourselves this is the port wine ma'am that the board ordered for the infirmary real fresh genuine port wine only out of the cask this forenoon clear as a bell and no sediment having held the first bottle up to the light and shaken it well to test its excellence mr bumble placed them both on top of a chest of drawers folded the handkerchief in which they had been wrapped put it carefully in his pocket and took up his hat as if to go you'll have a very cold walk mr bumble 
said the matron. It blows, ma'am, replied Mr. Bumble, turning up his coat collar. Enough to cut one's ears off. The matron looked from the little kettle to the beetle, who was moving towards the door, and as the beetle coughed, preparatory to bidding her good night, bashfully inquired whether, whether he wouldn't take a cup of tea. Mr. Bumble instantaneously turned back his collar again, laid his hat and stick upon a chair, and drew another chair up to the table. As he slowly seated himself, he looked at the lady. She fixed her eyes upon the little teapot. Mr. Bumble coughed again, and slightly smiled. Mrs. Corney rose to get another cup and saucer from the closet. As she sat down, her eyes once again encountered those of the gallant beetle. She colored and applied herself to the task of making his tea. Again Mr. Bumble coughed, louder this time than he had coughed yet. Sweet, Mr. Bumble? inquired the matron, taking up the sugar basin. Very sweet, indeed, ma'am, replied Mr. Bumble. He fixed his eyes on Mrs. Corney as he said this, and if ever a beetle looked tender, Mr. Bumble was that beetle at that moment. The tea was made and handed in silence. Mr. Bumble, having spread a handkerchief over his knees to prevent the crumbs from sullying the splendor of his shorts, began to eat and drink, varying these amusements occasionally by fetching a deep sigh, which, however, had no injurious effect upon his appetite, but, on the contrary, rather seemed to facilitate his operations in the tea and toast department. "'You have a cat, ma'am, I see.' said Mr. Bumble, glancing at one who, in the center of her family, was basking before the fire. "'And kittens, too, I declare.' "'I am so fond of them, Mr. Bumble, you can't think,' replied the matron. "'They're so happy, so frolicsome, and so cheerful, that they are quite companions for me.' "'Very nice animals, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble, approvingly. "'So very domestic.' "'Oh, yes.' rejoined the matron with enthusiasm. So fond of their home, too, that it's quite a pleasure, I'm sure. Mrs. Corney, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble slowly, and marking the time with his teaspoon. I mean to say this, ma'am, that any cat or kitten that could live with you, ma'am, and not be fond of its home, must be an ass, ma'am. Uh oh, Mr. Bumble, remonstrated Mrs. Corney. It's no use disguising facts, ma'am said Mr. Bumble, slowly flourishing the teaspoon with a kind of amorous dignity which made him doubly impressive. I would drown it myself, with pleasure. Then you're a cruel man, said the matron vivaciously, as she held out her hand for the beetle's cup. And a very hard-hearted man besides. Hard-hearted man, said Mr. Bumble. Hard. Mr. Bumble resigned his cup without another word squeezed Mrs. Corney's little finger as she took it, and inflicting two open-handed slaps upon his laced waistcoat, gave a mighty sigh, and hitched his chair a very little morsel farther from the fire. It was a round table, and as Mrs. Corney and Mr. Bumble had been sitting opposite each other, with no great space between them, and fronting the fire, it will be seen that Mr. Bumble, in receding from the fire, and still keeping at the table, increased the distance between himself and Mrs. Corney which proceeding some prudent readers will doubtless be disposed to admire, and to consider an act of great heroism on Mr. Bumble's part, he being in some sort tempted by time, place, and opportunity, to give utterance of certain soft nothings, which, however well they may become the lips of the light and thoughtless, do seem immeasurably beneath the dignity of judges of the land, members of Parliament, ministers of State, Lord Mayors, and other great public functionaries, but more particularly beneath the stateliness and gravity of a beetle, who, as is well known, should be the sternest and most inflexible among them all. Whatever were Mr. Bumble's intentions, however, and no doubt they were of the best, it unfortunately happened, as has been twice before remarked, that the table was a round one. Consequently, Mr. Bumble, moving his chair by little and little, soon began to diminish the distance between himself and the matron, and, continuing to travel round the outer edge of the circle, brought his chair, in time, close to that in which the matron was seated. Indeed, the two chairs touched, and when they did so, Mr. Bumble stopped. Now, if the matron had moved her chair to the right, she would have been scorched by the fire, and if to the left, she must have fallen into Mr. Bumble's arms. So, being a discreet matron, and no doubt foreseeing these consequences at a glance, she remained where she was and handed Mr. Bumble another cup of tea. 
"'Hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stirring his tea and looking up into the matron's face. "'Are you hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney?' "'Dear me!' exclaimed the matron. "'What a very curious question from a single man. "'What can you want to know for, Mr. Bumble?' The beetle drank his tea to the last drop, finished a piece of toast, whisked the crumbs off his knees, wiped his lips, and deliberately kissed the matron. "'Mr. Bumble!' cried that discreet lady in a whisper, for the fright was so great that she had quite lost her voice. "'Mr. Bumble! I shall scream!' Mr. Bumble made no reply, but in a slow and dignified manner put his arm round the matron's waist. As the lady had stated her intention of screaming, of course she would have screamed at this additional boldness, but that exertion was rendered unnecessary by a hasty knocking at the door, which was no sooner heard than Mr. Bumble darted, with much agility, to the wine-bottles, and began dusting them with great violence, while the matron sharply demanded who was there. It is worthy of remark, as a curious physical instance of the efficacy of a sudden surprise in counteracting the effects of extreme fear, that her voice had quite recovered all its official asperity. "'If you please, mistress,' said a withered old female pauper, hideously ugly, putting her head in at the door. "'Old Sally is a-going fast.' "'Well, what's that to me?' angrily demanded the matron. "'I can't keep her alive, can I?' "'No, no, mistress,' replied the old woman. "'Nobody can. She's far beyond the reach of help. I've seen many a people die, little babes and great strong men, and I know when deaths are coming well enough. But she's troubled in her mind, and when the fits are not on her, and that's not often, for she is dying very hard, she says she has got something to tell, which you must hear. She'll never die quiet till you come, mistress.' At this intelligence, the worthy Mrs. Corney muttered a variety of invectives against old women who couldn't even die without purposely annoying their betters, and, muffling herself in a thick shawl which she hastily caught up, briefly requested Mr. Bumble to stay till she came back, lest anything particular should occur. Bidding the messenger walk fast, and not be all night hobbling up the stairs, she followed her from the room with a very ill grace, scolding all the way. Mr. Bumble's conduct on being left to himself was rather inexplicable. He opened the closet, counted the teaspoons, weighed the sugar-tongs, closely inspected a silver milk-pot to ascertain that it was of the genuine material, and, having satisfied his curiosity on these points, put on his cocked hat cornerwise and danced with much gravity four distinct times round the table. Having gone through this very extraordinary performance, he took off the cocked hat again, and spreading himself before the fire with his back towards it, seemed to be mentally engaged in taking an exact inventory of the furniture. End of chapter 23「Twenty four of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter twenty four treats on a very poor subject, but is a short one and may be found of importance in this history. It was no unfit messenger of death who had disturbed the quiet of the matron's room. Her body was bent by age. Her limbs trembled with palsy, her face, distorted into a mumbling leer, resembled the more grotesque shaping of some wild pencil than the work of nature's hand. Alas! How few of nature's faces are left alone to gladden us with their beauty! The cares and sorrows and hungerings of the world change them as they change hearts, and it is only when those passions sleep, and have lost their hold for ever, that the troubled clouds pass off and leave heaven's surface clear. It is a common thing for the countenances of the dead, even in that fixed and rigid state, to subside into the long-forgotten expression of sleeping infancy, and settle into the very look of early life. So calm, so peaceful, do they grow again, that those who knew them in their happy childhood kneel by the coffin side in awe, and see the angel even upon earth. The old crone tottered along the passages and up the stairs, muttering some indistinct answers to the chidings of her companion being at length compelled to pause for breath she gave the light into her hand and remained behind to follow as she might while the more nimble superior made her way to the room where the sick woman lay it was a bare garret room with a dim light burning at the farther end there was another old woman watching by the bed the parish apothecary's apprentice was standing by the fire making a toothpick out of a quill cold night mrs corney said this young gentleman as the matron entered 
very cold indeed sir replied the mistress in her most civil tones after dropping a curtsey as she spoke you should get better coals out of your contractors said the apothecary's deputy breaking a lump on the top of the fire with the rusty poker these are not at all the sort of thing for a cold night they're the board's choosing sir returned the matron the least they could do would be to keep us pretty warm for our places are hard enough the conversation was here interrupted by a moan from the sick woman oh said the young mag turning his face towards the bed as if he had previously quite forgotten the patient it's all u p there mrs corney it is is it sir asked the matron if she lasts a couple of hours i shall be surprised said the apothecary's apprentice intent upon the toothpick's point it's a break-up of the system altogether is she dozing old lady the attendant stooped over the bed to ascertain and nodded in the affirmative then perhaps she'll go off in that way if you don't make a row said the young man put the light on the floor she won't see it there the attendant did as she was told shaking her head meanwhile to intimate that the woman would not die so easily having done so she resumed her seat by the side of the other nurse who had by this time returned the mistress with an expression of impatience wrapped herself in her shawl and sat at the foot of the bed the apothecary's apprentice having completed the manufacture of the toothpick planted himself in front of the fire and made good use of it for ten minutes or so when apparently growing rather dull he wished mrs corney joy of her job and took himself off on tiptoe when they had sat in silence for some time the two old women rose from the bed and crouching over the fire held out their withered hands to catch the heat the flame threw a ghastly light on their shriveled faces and made their ugliness appear terrible as in this position they began to converse in a low voice did she say any more annie dear while i was gone inquired the messenger not a word replied the other she plucked and tore at her arms for a little time but i held her hands and she soon dropped off she hasn't much strength in her so i easily kept her quiet i ain't so weak for an old woman although i am on parish allowance no no did she drink the hot wine the doctor said she was to have demanded the first i tried to get it down rejoined the other but her teeth were tight set and she clenched the mug so hard that it was as much as i could do to get it back again so i drank it and it did me much good looking cautiously round to ascertain that they were not overheard the two hags cowered nearer to the fire and chuckled heartily i mind the time said the first speaker when she would have done the same and made rare fun of it afterwards <laughs> ay that she would rejoined the other she had a merry heart a many many beautiful corpses she laid out as nice and neat as waxwork my old eyes have seen them i and those old hands touched them too for i have helped her scores of times stretching forth her trembling fingers as she spoke the old creature shook them exultingly before her face and fumbling in her pocket brought out an old time discolored tin snuff-box from which she shook a few grains into the outstretched palm of her companion and a few more into her own while they were thus employed the matron who had been impatiently watching until the dying woman should awaken from her stupor joined them by the fire and sharply asked how long she was to wait not long mistress replied the second woman looking up into her face we have none of us long to wait for death patience patience he'll be here soon enough for all of us hold your tongue you doting idiot said the matron sternly you martha tell me has she been in this way before often answered the first woman but it will never be again added the second one that is she'll never wake again but once and mine mistress that won't be for long long or short said the matron snappishly she won't find me here when she does wake take care both of you how you worry me again for nothing it's no part of my duty to see all the old women in the house die and i won't that's more mind that you impudent old harridans if you make a fool of me again i'll soon cure you i warrant you she was bounding away when a cry from the two women who had turned towards the bed caused her to look round the patient had raised herself upright and was stretching her arms towards them who's that she cried in a hollow voice hush hush said one of the women stooping over her lie down lie down i'll never lie down again said the woman struggling i will tell her come here nearer let me whisper in your ear she clutched the matron by the arm and forcing her into a chair by the bedside was about to speak when looking round she caught sight of the two old women bending forward in the attitude of eager listeners turn them away said the woman drowsily 
make haste make haste the two old crones chiming in together began pouring out many piteous lamentations that the poor dear was too far gone to know her best friends and were uttering sundry protestations that they would never leave her when the superior pushed them from the room closed the door and returned to the bedside on being excluded the old ladies changed their tone and cried through the keyhole that old sally was drunk which indeed was not unlikely since in addition to a moderate dose of opium prescribed by the apothecary she was laboring under the effects of a final taste of gin and water which had been privily administered in the openness of their hearts by the worthy old ladies themselves now listen to me said the dying woman aloud as if making a great effort to revive one latent spark of energy in this very room in this very bed i once nursed a pretty young creature that was brought into the house with her feet cut and bruised with walking and oil soiled with dust and blood she gave birth to a boy and died let me think what was the year again never mind about the year said the impatient auditor what about her i murmured the sick woman relapsing into her former drowsy state what about her what about i know she cried jumping fiercely up her face flushed and her eyes starting from her head i robbed her so i did she wasn't cold i tell you she wasn't cold when i stole it stole what for god's sake cried the matron with a gesture as if she would call for help it replied the woman laying her hand over the other's mouth the only thing she had she wanted clothes to keep her warm and food to eat she had kept it safe and had it in her bosom it was gold i tell you rich gold that might have saved her life gold echoed the matron bending eagerly over the woman as she fell back go on go on yes what of it who was the mother when was it she charged me to keep it safe replied the woman with a groan and trusted me as the only woman about her i stole it in my heart when she first showed it me hanging round her neck and the child's death perhaps was on me besides they would have treated him better if they had known it all known what asked the other speak boy grew so like his mother said the woman rambling on and not heeding the question but i could never forget it when i saw his face poor girl poor girl she was so young too such a gentle lamb wait there's more to tell i have not told you all have i no no replied the matron inclining her head to catch the words as they came more faintly from the dying woman be quick or it may be too late the mother said the woman making a more violent effort than before the mother when the pains of death first came upon her whispered in my ear that if her baby was born alive and thrived the day might come when it would not feel so much disgrace to hear his poor young mother named and oh kind heaven she said folding her thin hands together whether it be boy or girl raise up some friends for it in this troubled world and take pity upon a lonely desolate child abandoned to its mercy the boy's name demanded the matron they called him oliver replied the woman feebly the gold i stole was yes yes what cried the other she was bending eagerly over the woman to hear her reply, but drew back instinctively, as she once again rose, slowly and stiffly, into a sitting posture, then, clutching the coverlid with both hands, muttered some indistinct sounds in her throat, and fell lifeless on the bed. "'Stone dead,' said one of the old women, hurrying in as soon as the door was opened. "'And nothing to tell, after all,' rejoined the matron, walking carelessly away. The two crones, to all appearance, too busily occupied in the preparations for their dreadful duties to make any reply, were left alone hovering about the body. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 25, wherein this history reverts to Mr. Fagan and company. While these things were passing in the country workhouse, Mr. Fagan sat in the old den, the same from which Oliver had been removed by the girl, brooding over a dull, smoky fire. He held a pair of bellows upon his knee, with which he had apparently been endeavoring to rouse it into more cheerful action, but he had fallen into deep thought, and with his arms folded on them and his chin resting on his thumbs, fixed his eyes, abstractedly, on the rusty bars. At a table behind him sat the artful Dodger, Master Charlie Bates, and Mr. Chitling, all intent upon a game of whist, the artful taking dummy against Master Bates and Mr. Chitling. The countenance of the first-named gentleman, peculiarly intelligent at all times, acquired a great additional interest from his close observance of the game, and his attentive perusal of Mr. Chitling's hand, upon which, from time to time, as occasion served, he bestowed a variety of earnest glances, wisely regulating his own play by the result of his observations upon his neighbor's cards. It being a cold night, the Dodger wore his hat, as indeed was often his custom within doors. He also sustained a clay pipe between his teeth, which he only removed for a brief space, when he deemed it necessary to apply for refreshment to a quart pot upon the table, which stood ready filled with gin and water for the accommodation of the company. Master Bates was also attentive to the play, but, being of a more excitable nature than his accomplished friend, it was observable that he more frequently applied himself to the gin and water, and moreover indulged in many jests and irrelevant remarks all highly unbecoming a scientific rubber. Indeed, the artful, presuming upon their close attachment, more than once took occasion to reason gravely with his companion upon these improprieties, all of which remonstrances Master Bates received in extremely good part, merely requesting his friend to be blowed, or to insert his head in a sack, or replying with some other neatly turned witticism of a similar kind, the happy application of which excited considerable admiration in the mind of Mr. Chitling. It was remarkable that the latter gentleman and his partner invariably lost, and that the circumstance, so far from angering Master Bates, appeared to afford him the highest amusement, inasmuch as he laughed most uproariously at the end of every deal, and protested that he had never seen such a jolly game in all his born days. "'That's two doubles, in the rub,' said Mr. Chitling, with a very long face, as he drew half a crown from his waist pocket. "'I've never seen such a fellow as you, Jack. You win everything.' Even when we've good cards, Charlie and I can't make nothing of them. Either the master or the manner of this remark, which was made very ruefully, delighted Charlie Bates so much that his consequent shout of laughter roused the Jew from his reverie and induced him to inquire what was the matter. Matter Fagin! cried Charlie. I wish I'd watched the play. Tommy Chitlin hasn't won a point, and I went partners with him against the artful and dumb. Aye, aye, said the Jew with a grin which sufficiently demonstrated that he was at no loss to understand the reason. "'Try him again, Tom. Try him again.' "'No more of it for me, thank you, Fagin,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'I've had enough. That there Dodger's had such a run of luck that there's no standing against him.' "'Ha ha, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'You must get up very early in the morning to win against the Dodger.' "'Morning,' said Charlie Bates.' You must put your boots on overnight, and have a telescope at each eye, and an opera glass between your shoulders, if you want to come over him. Mr. Dawkins received these handsome compliments with much philosophy, and offered to cut any gentleman in company for the first picture card at a shilling at a time. Nobody accepting the challenge, and his pipe being by this time smoked out, he proceeded to amuse himself by sketching a ground plan of Newgate on the table, with the piece of chalk which had served him in lieu of counters whistling meantime with peculiar shrillness. "'How oh, precious a door you are, Tommy,' said the Dodger, stopping short when there had been a long silence, and addressing Mr. Chitling. "'What do you think he's thinking of, Fagin?' "'How should I know, my dear?' replied the Jew, looking round as he plied the bellows. "'About his losses, maybe. Or the little retirement in the country that he's just left, eh? Ha <laughs> ha! Is that it, my dear?' "'Not a bit of it,' replied the Dodger, stopping the subject of discourse as Mr. Chitling was about to reply. "'What do you say, Charlie?' "'I should say,' replied Master Bates, with a grin, "'that he was uncommon sweet upon Betsy. See how he's a-blushin'. Oh, my eye! There's a merry-go-rounder. Tommy Chitling's in love. Oh, Fagin! Fagin, what a spree!' 
thoroughly overpowered with the notion of mr chitling being the victim of the tender passion master bates threw himself back in his chair with such violence that he lost his balance and pitched over upon the floor where the accident abating nothing of his merriment he lay at full length until his laugh was over when he resumed his former position and began another laugh never mind him my dear said the jew winking at mr dawkins and giving master bates a reproving tap with the nozzle of the bellows betsy's a fine girl stick up to her tom stick up to her what i mean to say fagin replied mr chitling very red in the face is that that isn't anything to anybody here no more it is replied the jew charlie will talk don't mind him my dear don't mind him betsy's a fine girl do as she bids you tom and she will make you a fortune so i do do as she bids me replied mr chitling i shouldn't have been milled if it hadn't been for her advice but it turned out a good job for you didn't it fagin and what's six weeks of it it must come some time or another and why not in the winter time when you don't want to go out walking so much eh, fagin ah to be sure my dear replied the jew you wouldn't mind it again tom would you asked the dodger winking upon charlie and the jew if bet was all right i mean to say that i shouldn't replied tom angrily there now ah who'll say as much as that i should like to know eh fagin nobody my dear replied the jew not a soul tom i don't know one of em that would do it besides you not one of em my dear i might have got clear off if i'd split upon her mightn't i fagin angrily pursued the poor half-witted dupe a word from me would have done it wouldn't it fagin to be sure it would my dear replied the jew but i didn't blab did i fagin demanded tom pouring question upon question with great volubility no no to be sure replied the jew you were too stout-hearted for that a deal too stout my dear perhaps i was rejoined tom looking round and if i was what's to laugh at in that eh fagin the jew perceiving that mr chitling was considerably roused hastened to assure him that nobody was laughing and to prove the gravity of the company appealed to master bates the principal offender but unfortunately charlie in opening his mouth to reply that he was never more serious in his life was unable to prevent the escape of such a violent roar that the abused mr chitling without any preliminary ceremonies rushed across the room and aimed a blow at the offender who being skilful in evading pursuit ducked to avoid it and chose his time so well that it lighted on the chest of the merry old gentleman and caused him to stagger to the wall where he stood panting for breath while mr chitling looked on in intense dismay hark cried the dodger at this moment i heard the tinkler catching up the light he crept softly upstairs the bell was rung again with some impatience while the party were in darkness after a short pause the dodger reappeared and whispered fagin mysteriously what cried the jew alone the dodger nodded in the affirmative and shading the flame of the candle with his hand gave charlie bates a private intimation in dumb show that he had better not be funny just then having performed this friendly office he fixed his eyes on the jew's face and awaited his directions the old man bit his yellow fingers and meditated for some seconds his face working with agitation the while as if he dreaded something and feared to know the worst at length he raised his head where is he he asked the dodger pointed to the floor above and made a gesture as if to leave the room yes said the jew answering the mute inquiry bring him down hush quiet charlie gently tom scarce scarce this brief direction to charlie bates and his recent antagonist was softly and immediately obeyed there was no sound of their whereabout when the dodger descended the stairs bearing the light in his hand and followed by a man in a coarse smock frock who after casting a hurried glance round the room pulled off a large wrapper which had concealed the lower portion of his face and disclosed all haggard unwashed and unshorn the features of flash toby crackett how are you faggy said this worthy nodding to the jew put that shawl away in my caster dodger so that i may know where to find it when i cut that's a time of day you'll be a fine young cracksman afore the old fire now with these words he pulled up the smock frock and winding it round his middle drew a chair to the fire and placed his feet upon the hob see there faggy he said pointing disconsolately to his top boots not a drop of day and martin since you know when not a bubble of blacking by jove but don't look at me in that way man all in good time 
I can't talk about business till I've eaten drank, so produce the sustenance and let's have a quiet fill out for the first time these three days. The Jew motioned to the Dodger to place what eatables there were upon the table, and, seating himself opposite the housebreaker, waited his leisure. To judge from appearances, Toby was by no means in a hurry to open the conversation. At first, the Jew contented himself with patiently watching his countenance, as if to gain from its expression some clue to the intelligence he brought, but in vain. He looked tired and worn, but there was the same complacent repose upon his features that they always wore, and through dirt and beard and whisker there still shone, unimpaired, the self-satisfied smirk of Flash Toby Crackett. Then the Jew, in an agony of impatience, watched every morsel he put into his mouth, pacing up and down the room, meanwhile in irrepressible excitement. It was all of no use. Toby continued to eat with the utmost outward indifference until he could eat no more. Then, ordering the Dodger out, he closed the door, mixed a glass of spirits and water, and composed himself for talking. First and foremost, Faggy, said Toby. Yes, yes, interposed the Jew, drawing up his chair. Mr. Crackett stopped to take a draught of spirits and water, and to declare that the gin was excellent. Then, placing his feet against the low mantelpiece, so as to bring his boots to about the level of his eye, he quietly resumed. First and foremost, Faggy, said the housebreaker. How's Bill? What? screamed the Jew, starting from his seat. Why, you don't mean to say? began Toby, turning pale. Mean! cried the Jew, stamping furiously on the ground. Where are they? Sykes and the boy, where are they? Where have they been? Where are they hiding? Why have they not been here? The crack failed, said Toby faintly. I knew it, replied the Jew, tearing a newspaper from his pocket and pointing to it. What more? They fired and hit the boy. We cut over the fields at the back, with him between us, straight as a crow flies, through hedge and ditch. They gave chase. Damn, the whole country was awake, and the dogs upon us. The boy! Bill had him on his back, and scudded like the wind. We stopped to take him between us. His head hung down, and he was cold. They were close upon our heels, every man for himself, and each from the gallows. We parted company, and left the youngster lying in a ditch, alive or dead. That's all I know about him. The Jew stopped to hear no more, but uttering a loud yell and twining his hands in his hair, rushed from the room and from the house. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 26 in which a mysterious character appears upon the scene and many things inseparable from this history are done and performed The old man had gained the street corner before he began to recover the effect of Toby Crackett's intelligence He had relaxed nothing of his unusual speed but was still pressing onward in the same wild and disordered manner when the sudden dashing past of a carriage and a boisterous cry from the foot passengers who saw his danger drove him back upon the pavement. Avoiding as much as was possible all the main streets, and skulking only through the byways and alleys, he at length emerged on Snow Hill. Here he walked even faster than before, nor did he linger until he had again turned into a court, when, as if conscious that he was now in his proper element, he fell into his usual shuffling pace and seemed to breathe more freely. Near to the spot on which Snow Hill and Holborn Hill meet opens, upon the right hand as you come out of the city, a narrow and dismal alley leading to Saffron Hill. In its filthy shops are exposed for sale huge bunches of second-hand silk handkerchiefs of all sizes and patterns, for here reside the traders who purchase them from pickpockets. Hundreds of these handkerchiefs hang dangling from pegs outside the windows or flaunting from door-posts, and the shelves within are piled with them. Confined as the limits of Field Lane are, it has its barber, its coffee shop, its beer shop, and its fried fish warehouse. It is a commercial colony of itself, the emporium of petty larceny, visited at early morning and setting in of dusk by silent merchants who traffic in dark back parlors and who go as strangely as they come. Here the clothesman, the shoe vamper, and the rag merchant display their goods as signboards to the petty thief here stores of old iron and bones and heaps of mildewy fragments of woolen stuff and linen rust and rot in the grimy cellars it was into this place that the jew turned 
he was well known to the sallow denizens of the lane for such of them as were on the lookout to buy or sell nodded familiarly as he passed along he replied to their salutations in the same way but bestowed no closer recognition until he reached the further end of the alley when he stopped to address a salesman of small stature who had squeezed as much of his person into a child's chair as the chair would hold and was smoking a pipe at his warehouse door why the sight of you mr Pagan? what could the cop tell me said this respectable trader in acknowledgment of the jew's inquiry after his health the neighborhood was a little hot lively said fagin elevating his eyebrows and crossing his hands upon his shoulders well i've heard that complaint of it once or twice before replied the trader but it soon cools down again don't you find it so fagin nodded in the affirmative pointing in the direction of saffron hill he inquired whether any one was up yonder to-night at the cripples inquired the man the jew nodded let me see pursued the merchant reflecting yes there's some half dozen of em gone in that i knows i don't think your friend's there sykes is not i suppose inquired the jew with a disappointed countenance non is twentus as the lawyers say replied the little man shaking his head and looking amazingly sly have you got anything in my line to-night nothing to-night said the jew turning away are you going up to the cripples wagon cried the little man calling after him stop i don't mind if i have a drop there with you but as the jew looking back waved his hand to intimate that he preferred being alone and moreover as the little man could not very easily disengage himself from the chair the sign of the cripples was for a time bereft of the advantage of mr lively's presence by the time he had got upon his legs the jew had disappeared so mr lively after ineffectually standing on tiptoe in the hope of catching sight of him again forced himself into the little chair and exchanging a shake of the head with a lady in the opposite shop in which doubt and mistrust were plainly mingled resumed his pipe with a grave demeanor the three cripples or rather the cripples which was the sign by which the establishment was familiarly known to its patrons was the public house in which mr sykes and his dog have already figured merely making a sign to a man at the bar fagin walked straight upstairs and opening the door of a room and softly insinuating himself into the chamber looked anxiously about shading his eyes with his hand as if in search of some particular person the room was illuminated by two gas lights the glare of which was prevented by the barred shutters and closely drawn curtains of faded red from being visible outside the ceiling was blackened to prevent its color from being injured by the flaring of the lamps and the place was so full of dense tobacco smoke that at first it was scarcely possible to discern anything more by degrees however as some of it cleared away through the open door an assemblage of heads as confused as the noises that greeted the ear might be made out and as the eye grew more accustomed to the scene the spectator gradually became aware of the presence of a numerous company male and female crowded round a long table at the upper end of which sat a chairman with a hammer of office in his hand while a professional gentleman with a bluish nose and his face tied up for the benefit of a toothache presided at a jingling piano in a remote corner as fagin stepped softly in the professional gentleman running over the keys by way of prelude occasioned a general cry of order for a song which having subsided a young lady proceeded to entertain the company with a ballad in four verses between each of which the accompanist played the melody all through as loud as he could when this was over the chairman gave a sentiment after which the professional gentleman on the chairman's right and left volunteered a duet and sang it with great applause it was curious to observe some faces which stood out prominently from among the group there was the chairman himself the landlord of the house a coarse rough heavy built fellow who while the songs were proceeding rolled his eyes hither and thither and seeming to give himself up to joviality had an eye for everything that was done and an ear for everything that was said and sharp ones too near to him were the singers receiving with professional indifference the compliments of the company and applying themselves in turn to a dozen proffered glasses of spirits and water tendered by their more boisterous admirers whose countenances expressive of almost every vice in almost every grade irresistibly attracted the attention by their very repulsiveness cunning ferocity and drunkenness in all its stages were there in their strongest aspect and women some with the last lingering tinge of their early freshness almost fading as you looked 
others with every mark and stamp of their sex utterly beaten out and presenting but one loathsome blank of profligacy and crime some mere girls others but young women and none past the prime of life formed the darkest and saddest portion of this dreary picture fagin troubled by no grave emotions looked eagerly from face to face while these proceedings were in progress but apparently without meeting that of which he was in search succeeding at length in catching the eye of the man who occupied the chair he beckoned to him slightly and left the room as quietly as he had entered it what can i do for you mr fagin inquired the man as he followed him out to the landing won't you join us they'll be delighted every one of em the jew shook his head impatiently and said in a whisper is he here no replied the man and no news of barney inquired fagin none replied the landlord of the cripples for it was he he won't stir till it's all safe depend on it they're on the scent down there and that if he moved he'd blow upon the thing at once he's all right enough barney is else i should have heard of him i'll pound it that barney's managing properly let him alone for that will he be here to-night asked the jew laying the same emphasis on the pronoun as before monks do you mean inquired the landlord hesitating hush said the jew yes certain replied the man drawing a gold watch from his fob i expected him here before now if you'll wait ten minutes he'll be no no said the jew hastily as though however desirous he might be to see the person in question he was nevertheless relieved by his absence tell him i came here to see him and he must come to me to-night no say to-morrow as he is not here to-morrow will be time enough good said the man nothing more not a word now said the jew descending the stairs i say said the other looking over the rails and speaking in a hoarse whisper what a time this would be for a cell i've got phil barker here so drunk that a boy might take him ah but it's not phil barker's time said the jew looking up phil has something more to do before we can afford to part with him so go back to the company my dear and tell them to lead merry lives while they last <laughs> the landlord reciprocated the old man's laugh and returned to his guest the jew was no sooner alone than his countenance resumed its former expression of anxiety and thought after brief reflection he called a hack cabriolet and bade the man drive towards bethnal green he dismissed him within some quarter of a mile of mr sykes's residence and performed the short remainder of the distance on foot now muttered the jew as he knocked on the door if there is any deep play down here i shall have it out of you my girl cutting as you are she was in her room the woman said fagin crept softly upstairs and entered it without any previous ceremony the girl was alone lying with her head upon the table and her hair straggling over it she has been drinking thought the jew coolly or perhaps she is only miserable the old man turned to close the door as he made this reflection the noise thus occasioned roused the girl she eyed his crafty face narrowly as she inquired to his recital of toby crackett's story when it was concluded she sank into her former attitude but spoke not a word she pushed the candle impatiently away and once or twice she feverishly changed her position shuffled her feet upon the ground but this was all during the silence the jew looked restlessly about the room as if to assure himself that there were no appearances of sykes having covertly returned apparently satisfied with his inspection he coughed twice or thrice and made as many efforts to open a conversation but the girl heeded him no more than if he had been made of stone at length he made another attempt and rubbing his hands together said in his most conciliatory tone and where should you think bill was now my dear the girl moaned out some half intelligible reply that she could not tell and seemed from the smothered noise that escaped her to be crying and the boy too said the jew straining his eyes to catch a glimpse of her face poor little child left in a ditch nonce only think the child said the girl suddenly looking up is better where he is than among us and if no harm comes to bill from it i hope he lies dead in the ditch and that his young bones may rot there what cried the jew in amazement ay i do returned the girl meeting his gaze I should be glad to have him away from my eyes, and to know that the worst is over. I can't bear to have him about me. The sight of him turns me against myself from all of you. Pooh! said the Jew, scornfully. You're drunk! Am I? cried the girl bitterly. It's no fault of yours if I'm not. You'd never have me anything else if you had your will except now. The humour doesn't suit you, does it? No! rejoined the Jew, furiously. 
It does not. Change it, then, responded the girl with a laugh. Change it, exclaimed the Jew, exasperated beyond all bounds by his companion's unexpected obstinacy and the vexation of the night. I will change it. Listen to me, you drab. Listen to me, who with six words can strangle Sykes as surely as if I had his bull's throat between my fingers now if he comes back and leaves the boy behind him if he gets off free and dead or alive fails to restore him to me murder him yourself if you would have him escape jack ketch and do it the moment he sets foot in this room or mind me it will be too late what's all this cried the girl involuntarily what is it pursued fagin mad with rage when the boy is worth hundreds of pounds to me am i to lose what chance threw me in the way of getting safely through the whims of a drunken gang that i could whistle away the lives of and me bound too to a born devil that only wants the will and has the power to to panting for breath the old man stammered for a word and in that instant checked the torrent of his wrath and changed his whole demeanour a moment before his clenched hands had grasped the air his eyes had dilated and his face grown livid with passion but now he shrunk into a chair and cowering together trembled with the apprehension of having himself disclosed some hidden villainy after a short silence he ventured to look round at his companion he appeared somewhat reassured on beholding her in the same listless attitude from which he had first roused her nancy dear croaked the jew in his usual voice did you mind me dear don't worry me now fagin replied the girl raising her head languidly if bill has not done it this time he will another he's done many a good job for you and will do many more when he can if he can't he won't so no more about that regarding this boy my dear said the jew rubbing the palms of his hands nervously together this boy must take his chance with the rest interrupted nancy hastily and i say again i hope he's dead and out of harm's way and out of yours that is if bill comes to no harm and if toby got clear off bill's pretty sure to be safe for bill's with two or toby any time and about what i was saying my dear observed the jew keeping his glistening eye steadily upon her you must say it all over again if it's anything you want me to do rejoined nancy and if it is you'd better wait till tomorrow you put me up for a minute but i'm stupid again fagin put several other questions all with the same drift of ascertaining whether the girl had profited by his unguarded hints but she answered them so readily and was withal so utterly unmoved by his searching looks that his original impression of her being more than a trifle in liquor was confirmed nancy indeed was not exempt from a failing which was very common among the jews female pupils and in which in their tenderer years they were rather encouraged than checked her disordered appearance and a wholesale perfume of geneva which pervaded the apartment afforded strong confirmatory evidence of the justice of the jew's supposition and when after indulging in the temporary display of violence above described she subsided first into dullness and afterwards into a compound of feelings under the influence of which she shed tears one minute and in the next gave utterance to various exclamations of never say die and divers calculations as to what might be the amount of the odds so long as a lady or gentleman was happy mr fagin who had had considerable experience of such matters in his time saw with great satisfaction that she was very far gone indeed having eased his mind by this discovery and having accomplished his twofold object of imparting to the girl what he had that night heard and of ascertaining with his own eyes that sykes had not returned mr fagin again turned his face homeward leaving his young friend asleep with her head upon the table it was within an hour of midnight the weather being dark and piercing cold he had no great temptation to loiter the sharp wind that scoured the streets seemed to have cleared them of passengers as of dust and mud for few people were abroad and they were to all appearance hastening fast home it blew from the right quarter for the jew however and straight before it he went trembling and shivering as every fresh gust drove him rudely on his way he had reached the corner of his own street and was already fumbling in his pocket for the door key when a dark figure emerged from a projecting entrance which lay in deep shadow and crossing the road glided up to him unperceived fagin whispered a voice close to his ear ah said the jew turning quickly round is that yes interrupted the stranger i have been lingering here these two hours where the devil have you been on your business my dear 
replied the Jew, glancing uneasily at his companion, and slackening his pace as he spoke. "'On your business all night.' "'Oh, of course,' said the stranger, with a sneer. "'Well, and what's come of it?' "'Nothing good,' said the Jew. "'Nothing bad, I hope,' said the stranger, stopping short and turning a startled look on his companion. The Jew shook his head and was about to reply, when the stranger, interrupting him, motioned to the house, before which they had by this time arrived, remarking that he had better say what he had got to say under cover, for his blood was chilled with standing about so long, and the wind blew through him. Fagin looked as if he could have willingly excused himself from taking home a visitor at that unreasonable hour, and, indeed, muttered something about having no fire, but his companion, repeating his request in a peremptory manner, he unlocked the door and requested him to close it softly while he got a light. "'It's as dark as the grave,' said the man, groping forward a few steps. "'Make haste.' "'Shut the door,' whispered Fagin from the end of the passage. As he spoke, it closed with a loud noise. "'That wasn't my doing,' said the other man, feeling his way. "'The wind blew it too, or it shut of its own accord, one or the other. "'Look sharp with a light, or I'll knock my brains out against something in this confounded hole.' Fagin stealthily descended the kitchen stairs. After a short absence he returned with a lighted candle, and the intelligence that Toby Crockett was asleep in the back room below, and that the boys were in the front one. Beckoning the man to follow him, he led the way upstairs. "'We can say the few words we've got to say in here, my dear,' said the Jew, throwing open a door on the first floor. "'And as there are holes in the shutters, and we never show lights to our neighbors, we'll set the candle on the stairs. There!' With those words, the Jew, stooping down, placed the candle on an upper flight of stairs, exactly opposite to the room door. This done, he led the way into the apartment, which was destitute of all movables save a broken armchair and an old couch or sofa without covering, which stood behind the door. Upon this piece of furniture the stranger sat himself with the air of a weary man, and the Jew, drawing up the armchair opposite, they sat face to face. It was not quite dark. The door was partially open, and the candle outside threw a feeble reflection on the opposite wall. They conversed for some time in whispers. Though nothing of the conversation was distinguishable beyond a few disjointed words here and there, a listener might easily have perceived that Fagin appeared to be defending himself against some remarks of the stranger, and that the latter was in a state of considerable irritation. They might have been talking thus for a quarter of an hour or more when monks, by which name the Jew had designated the strange man several times in the course of their colloquy, said, raising his voice a little, I tell you again, it was badly planned. Why not have kept him here among the rest, and made a sneaking, sniveling pickpocket of him at once? Only hear him! exclaimed the Jew, shrugging his shoulders. Why? Do you mean to say you couldn't have done it if you had chosen? demanded Monks sternly. Haven't you done it with other boys scores of times? If you had had patience for a twelve month at most, couldn't you have got him convicted and sent safely out of the kingdom? Perhaps for life? Whose turn would that have served, my dear? inquired the Jew humbly. Mine, replied Monks. But not mine said the jew submissively he might have become of use to me when there are two parties to a bargain it is only reasonable that the interests of both should be consulted is it my good friend what then demanded monks i saw it was not easy to train him to the business replied the jew he was not like the other boys in the same circumstances curse him no muttered the man or he would have been a thief long ago i had no hold of him to make him worse pursued the jew anxiously watching the countenance of his companion his hand was not in i had nothing to frighten him with which we always must have in the beginning or we labor in vain what could i do send him out with dodger and charlie we had enough of that at first my dear i trembled for us all that was not my doing observed monks no no my dear renewed the jew and i don't quarrel with it now because if it had never happened you might never have clapped eyes on the boy to notice him and so led to the discovery that it was him you were looking for well i got him back for you by means of the girl and then she begins to favor him 
Throttle the girl, said Monks impatiently. Why, we can't afford to do that just now, my dear, replied the Jew, smiling. And besides, that sort of thing is not in our way. Or, one of these days, I might be glad to have it done. I know what these girls are, Monks. Well, as soon as the boy begins to harden, she'll care no more for him than for a block of wood. You want him made a thief if he's alive. I can make him one from this time, and if, if said the Jew, drawing nearer to the other. It's not likely, mind, but if the worst comes to worst, and he's dead... It's no fault of mine, if he is, interposed the other man with a look of terror, and clasping the Jew's arm with trembling hands. Mind that, Fagin. I had no hand in it. Anything but his death. I told you from the first, I won't shed blood. It's always found out and haunts a man besides. If they'd shot him dead, I was not the cause. Do you hear me? Fire this infernal den. What's that? What? cried the Jew, grasping the coward round the body with both arms as he sprung to his feet. Where? Yonder, replied the man, glaring at the opposite wall. The shadow. I saw the shadow of a woman, in a cloak and bonnet, pass along the wainscot like a breath. The Jew released his hold, and they rushed tumultuously from the room. The candle, wasted by the draught, was standing where it had been placed. It showed them only the empty staircase and their own white faces. They listened intently. A profound silence reigned throughout the house. "'It's your fancy,' said the Jew, taking up the light and turning to his companion. "'I'll swear I saw it,' replied Monks, trembling. "'It was bending forward when I saw it first, and when I spoke it darted away.' The Jew glanced contemptuously at the pale face of his associate, and telling him he could follow if he pleased, ascended the stairs. They looked into all the rooms. They were cold, bare, and empty. They descended into the passage, and thence into the cellars below. The green damp hung upon the low walls, the tracks of the snail and slug glistened in the light of the candle, but all was still as death. "'What do you think now?' said the Jew, when they had regained the passage. "'Besides ourselves, there's not a creature in the house.' except Toby and the boys, and they're safe enough. See here. As a proof of the fact, the Jew drew forth two keys from his pocket, and explained that when he first went downstairs he had locked them in, to prevent any intrusion on the conference. This accumulated testimony effectually staggered Mr. Monks. His protestations had gradually become less and less vehement as they proceeded in their search without making any discovery, and now he gave vent to several very grim laughs, and confessed it could only have been his excited imagination. He declined any renewal of the conversation, however, for that night, suddenly remembering that it was past one o'clock, and so the amiable couple parted. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Oliver Twist》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Seven Atones for the Unpoliteness of a Former Chapter, which Deserted a Lady Most Unceremoniously. As it would be by no means seemly in a humble author to keep so mighty a personage as a beetle waiting with his back to the fire and the skirts of his coat gathered up under his arms until such time as it might suit his pleasure to relieve him, and as it would still less become his station or his gallantry to involve in the same neglect a lady on whom the beetle had looked with an eye of tenderness and affection, and in whose ear he had whispered sweet words which— coming from such a quarter might well thrill the bosom of maid or matron of whatsoever degree the historian whose pen traces these words trusting that he knows his place and that he entertains a becoming reverence for those upon earth to whom high and important authority is delegated hastens to pay them that respect which their position demands and to treat them with all that duteous ceremony which their exalted rank and by consequence great virtues imperatively claim at his hands Towards this end, indeed, he had purposed to introduce in this place a dissertation touching the divine right of beetles, and elucidative of the position that a beetle can do no wrong, which could not fail to have been both pleasurable and profitable to the right-minded reader, 
but which he is unfortunately compelled by want of time and space to postpone to some more convenient and fitting opportunity on the arrival of which he will be prepared to show that a beetle properly constituted that is to say a parochial beetle attached to a parochial workhouse and attending in his official capacity the parochial church is in right and virtue of his office possessed of all the excellences and best qualities of humanity and that to none of these excellences can mere companies beetles or court of law beetles or even chapel of ease beetles save the last and they in a very lowly and inferior degree lay remotest sustainable claim mr bumble had recounted the teaspoons reweighed the sugar tongs made a closer inspection of the milk pot and ascertained to a nicety the exact condition of the furniture down to the very horsehair seats of the chairs and had repeated each process full half a dozen times before he began to think that it was the time for mrs corney to return thinking begets thinking as there were no sounds of mrs corney's approach it occurred to mr bumble that it would be an innocent and virtuous way of spending the time if he were further to allay his curiosity by a cursory glance at the interior of mrs corney's chest of drawers having listened at the keyhole to assure himself that nobody was approaching the chamber mr bumble beginning at the bottom proceeded to make himself acquainted with the contents of the three long drawers which being filled with various garments of good fashion and texture carefully preserved between two layers of old newspapers speckled with dry lavender seemed to yield him exceeding satisfaction arriving in course of time at the right-hand corner drawer in which was the key and beholding therein a small padlocked box which being shaken gave forth a pleasant sound as of the chinking of coin mr bumble returned with a stately walk to the fireplace and resuming his old attitude said with a grave and determined air i'll do it he followed up this remarkable declaration by shaking his head in a waggish manner for ten minutes as though he were remonstrating with himself for being such a pleasant dog and then he took a view of his legs in profile with much seeming pleasure and interest he was still placidly engaging in this latter survey when mrs corney hurrying into the room threw herself in a breathless state on a chair by the fireside and covering her eyes with one hand placed the other over her heart and gasped for breath mrs corney said mr bumble stooping over the matron what is this ma'am has anything happened ma'am pray answer me i'm on on mr bumble in his alarm could not immediately think of the word tenterhooks so he said broken bottles oh mr bumble cried the lady i have been so dreadfully put out put out ma'am exclaimed mr bumble who has dared to i know said mr bumble checking himself with native majesty this is them wicious paupers it's dreadful to think of said the lady shuddering then don't think of it ma'am rejoined mr bumble i can't help it whimpered the lady then take something ma'am said mr bumble soothingly a little of the wine not for the world replied mrs corney i couldn't oh the top shelf in the right hand corner oh uttering these words the good lady pointed distractedly to the cupboard and underwent a convulsion from internal spasms mr bumble rushed to the closet and snatching a pint green glass bottle from the shelf thus incoherently indicated filled a teacup with its contents and held it to the lady's lips i'm better now said mrs corney falling back after drinking half of it mr bumble raised his eyes piously to the ceiling in thankfulness and bringing them down again to the brim of the cup lifted it to his nose peppermint exclaimed mrs corney in a faint voice smiling gently on the beetle as she spoke try it there's a little something else in it mr bumble tasted the medicine with a doubtful look smacked his lips took another taste and put the cup down empty it's very comforting said mrs corney very much so indeed ma'am said the beetle as he spoke he drew a chair beside the matron and tenderly inquired what had happened to distress her nothing replied mrs corney i am a foolish excitable weak creature not weak ma'am retorted mr bumble drawing his chair a little closer are you a weak creature mrs corney we are all weak creatures said mrs corney laying down a general principle 
"'So we are,' said the beetle. Nothing was said on either side for a minute or two afterwards. By the expiration of that time, Mr. Bumble had illustrated the position by removing his left arm from the back of Mrs. Corney's chair, where it had previously rested, to Mrs. Corney's apron string, round which it gradually became entwined. "'We are all weak creatures,' said Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Corney sighed. <sighs> "'Don't sigh, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble. "'I can't help it.' <sighs> said Mrs. Corney, and she sighed again. "'This is a very comfortable room, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, looking round. "'Another room, and this, ma'am, would be a complete thing.' "'It would be too much for one,' murmured the lady. "'But not for two, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble, in soft accents. "'Eh, hey, Mrs. Corney.' Mrs. Corney drooped her head when the beetle said this. The beetle drooped his to get a view of Mrs. Corney's face. Mrs. Corney, with great propriety, turned her head away and released her hand to get at her pocket handkerchief, but insensibly replaced it in that of Mr. Bumble. "'The board allows you coals, don't they, Mrs. Corney?' inquired the beetle, affectionately pressing her hand. "'And candles,' replied Mrs. Corney, slightly returning the pressure. "'Coals, candles, and house rent-free.' said Mr. Bumble. "'Oh, Mrs. Corney, what an angel you are!' The lady was not proof against this burst of feeling. She sank into Mr. Bumble's arms, and that gentleman, in his agitation, imprinted a passionate kiss upon her chaste nose. "'Such parochial perfection!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, rapturously. "'You know that Mr. Slout is worse to-night, my fascinator.' "'Yes,' replied Mrs. Corney, bashfully. He can't live a week, the doctor says, pursued Mr. Bumble. He is the master of this establishment. His death will cause a vacancy. That vacancy must be filled up. Oh, Mrs. Corney, what a prospect this opens! What an opportunity for a jining of hearts and housekeepings! <laughs> Mrs. Corney sobbed. The little word, said Mr. Bumble, bending over the bashful beauty. The one little, little word. My blessed Corney. Yeah, yeah, yes, sighed out the matron. One more, pursued the beetle. Compose your darling feelings for only one more. When is it to come off? Mrs. Corney twice essayed to speech and twice failed. At length, summoning up courage, she threw her arms around Mr. Bumble's neck and said, It might be as soon as ever he pleased, and that he was. Uh irresistible duck matters being thus amicably and satisfactorily arranged the contract was solemnly ratified in another teacup full of the peppermint mixture which was rendered the more necessary by the flutter and agitation of the lady's spirits while it was being disposed of she acquainted mr bumble with the old woman's decease very good said that gentleman sipping his peppermint i'll call at sourberry's as i go home and tell him to send to-morrow morning was it that as frightened you, love? It wasn't anything particular, dear, said the lady evasively. It must have been something, love, urged Mr. Bumble. Won't you tell your own bee? Not now, rejoined the lady. One of these days, after we're married, dear. After we're married, exclaimed Mr. Bumble. It wasn't any impudence from any of them male paupers, as— No, no, love, interposed the lady hastily. If I thought it was, continued Mr. Bumble, if I thought any one of em had dared to lift his vulgar eyes to that lovely countenance— They wouldn't have dared to do it, love, responded the lady. They had better not, said Mr. Bumble, clenching his fist. Let me see— any man, parochial or extra-parochial, as would presume to do it, and I can tell him that he wouldn't do it a second time. Unembellished by any violence of gesticulation, this might have seemed no very high compliment to the lady's charms. But, as Mr. Bumble accompanied the threat with many warlike gestures, she was much touched with this proof of his devotion, and protested with great admiration that he was indeed a dove. 
the dove then turned up his coat collar and put on his cocked hat and having exchanged a long and affectionate embrace with his future partner once again braved the cold wind of the night merely pausing for a few minutes in the male pauper's ward to abuse them a little with the view of satisfying himself that he could fill the office of workhouse master with needful acerbity assured of his qualifications mr bumble left the building with a light heart and bright visions of his future promotion which served to occupy his mind until he reached the shop of the undertaker now mr and mrs sowerberry having gone out to tea and supper and noah claypole not being at any time disposed to take upon himself a greater amount of physical exertion than is necessary to a convenient performance of the two functions of eating and drinking the shop was not closed although it was past the usual hour of shutting up mr bumble tapped with his cane on the counter several times but attracting no attention and beholding a light shining through the glass window of the little parlor at the back of the shop he made bold to peep in and see what was going forward and when he saw what was going forward he was not a little surprised the cloth was laid for supper the table was covered with bread and butter plates and glasses a porter pot and a wine bottle at the upper end of the table mr noah claypole lolled negligently in an easy chair with his legs thrown over one of the arms an open clasp knife in one hand and a mass of buttered bread in the other close beside him stood charlotte opening oysters from a barrel which mr claypool condescended to swallow with remarkable avidity a more than ordinary redness in the region of the young gentleman's nose and a kind of fixed wink in his right eye denoted that he was in a slight degree intoxicated these symptoms were confirmed by the intense relish with which he took his oysters for which nothing but a strong appreciation of their cooling properties in cases of internal fever could have sufficiently accounted here's a delicious fat one noah dear said charlotte try em do only this one what a delicious thing is an oyster remarked mr claypole after he had swallowed it what a pity it is a number of em should ever make you feel uncomfortable isn't it charlotte it's quite a cruelty said charlotte so it is acquiesced mr claypole and you're fond of oysters not over much replied charlotte i'd like to see you eat em noah dear better than eating em myself more said noah reflectively how queer have another said charlotte here's one with such a beautiful delicate beard i can't manage any more said noah i'm very sorry come here charlotte and i'll kiss yer what said mr bumble bursting into the room say that again sir charlotte uttered a scream and hid her face in her apron mr claypole without making any further change in his position than suffering his legs to reach the ground gazed at the beetle in drunken terror say it again you wild audacious fellow said mr bumble how dare you mention such a thing sir and how dare you encourage him you insolent minx kiss her exclaimed mr bumble in strong indignation Fah! i didn't mean to do it said noah blubbering she's always a kissing to me whether i like it or not oh noah cried charlotte reproachfully you are you know you are she's always a doing of it mr bumble sir she checks me out of the chin please sir and makes all manner of love retorted noah silence cried mr bumble sternly take yourselves downstairs ma'am noah you shut up the shop say another word till your master comes home at your peril and when he does come home tell him that mr bumble said he was to send an old woman's shell after breakfast to-morrow morning do you hear sir kissing cried mr bumble holding up his hands the sin and wickedness of the lower orders in this parochial district is frightful if parliament don't take their abominable courses under consideration this country's ruined and the character of the peasantry gone for ever with these words the beetle strode with a lofty and gloomy air from the undertaker's premises and now that we have accompanied him so far on his road home and have made all necessary preparations for the old woman's funeral let us set on foot a few inquiries after young oliver twist and ascertain whether he be still lying in the ditch where toby crackett left him End of chapter 27